61 quality entries, I'll say that. Matthew, Matthew Henman has uh, tweeted in at IMSA Radio, says, uh, uh, is President Dunan able to do anything with that strategic alliance, IMSA and ACO, to try and get Peugeot, Toyota, maybe even Ferrari, to come and race here? and at the other blue riband races, possibly even more in the future. How, how would that work, John, and is it possible? Well, it's a great question, and as uh, most uh, in, in the sport know, we had the opportunity last July to announce uh, a convergence and, and a, uh, uh, an agreement around the two platforms written to two different sets of technical regulations, uh, a way to allow them to coexist. And that was based on um, all the cars needing to come to the wind shear wind tunnel if they mm -hmm. want to run an IMSA. Uh, all the cars needing to go to the Sauber tunnel if they want to run in, uh, in, in WAC or the ACO competitions uh, like Le Mans. Uh, we worked hard with a two-wheel drive working group and a four-wheel drive working group because the cars uh, make lap time differently and, and function differently. So we had to work on the activation speed of the four-wheel drive. We had to uh, work on a, a decoupling of the uh, front differential under braking or coast on those four-wheel drive cars. So, you know, um, we're, we're, we're confident, um, you know, Terry Bouvet, who leads the technical team in the ACO, and uh, Simon Hodgson and Matt Kurdock, who lead the team here, are confident that based on that discussion with team between the ACO IMSA as well as the FIA, you know, Richard Meal and, and his technical team on the Endurance Commission, we're confident we can get them to run together. But uh, well, until they're on track together, you, you just never know. Uh, we've got the pit stops from the leaders. We'll just keep an eye on that, as you might expect. Alexander Rossi's come in uh, from the first position. Tristan Nunes in, Elio Castro Neves in for Whelan and Mayashak. Staying out, Richard Westbrook for JDC, Miller in the five, Mustang Sampling and the Ally Cadillac of Mike Rockenfeller. Uh, I do see something in the regulations that talks about previous performance though, John. So coming, going to Winchia or going to, uh, going to Sauber, if you're gonna go to here or, or Europe from the other champ, is that absolutely necessary? Or would you be prepared to look at, at performance data that's been gained? if the cars have already been running in the in the other championship? I think to have a proper transparent process uh, that is checking all the boxes in those, you know, convergence uh, categories is critical. Um, observe performance is certainly an approach that we take at IMSA to set the balance of performance. And the same goes for Terry and his team on the ACO and the WEC side. So uh, I think it's important that we uh, stay true with an, uh, a, a process that's full of integrity mm -hmm. for all the manufacturers to know that when they've made the investment to run in uh, GTP here or hypercar in, in Europe, that uh, all the boxes have been checked, they'll have a fair fight, uh, even though the two platforms have been written uh, to a different set of regulations. You, you, you've said the three letters, GTP. Yes, sir. Now, there'll be a lot of people who are very happy to see that back. It's been talked about, it's been rumoured. I know Marshall Pruitt over at, uh, at Racer was campaigning very heavily. We were talking about it even with Pierre Fion a while ago. Could GTP have been LMH before they decided it was LMH because they wanted the streetcar feel to, thing. Why, to things? Why was it the right time to bring it back? And, and does that give a, a distinctively different feel effectively to the two same regulations that you would get in in ACO competition. Well, it's ironic the the purpose of GTP back in 1981, uh, guys like uh, Roger Bailey and, and Mark Graffoff and, and John Bishop had this vision that manufacturers could take a chassis, um, brand it um, and look and styling um, and, and decide on a platform that, that made cost-effective sense to run for overall wins. And as we uh, came into DPI, uh, Mr. France had that same vision again. Let's allow them to brand. I mean, you look at that Cadillac there, uh, they did a tremendous amount with lighting and wheels and some of the branding on the, on the, the dorsal fin. Um, obviously, I had the opportunity in my previous life to be part of uh, 
uh, DPI project at Mazda that really took it to the extreme so that it looked the part, it looked the brand. Now with the, the way the LMDH rules have been written, there's even more styling mm. capabilities and the side pods and the tail. And, yeah, that's and really so important. In the end, uh, this is a uh, grand touring prototype for us to explain to the fans in a simple manner, uh, running for overall wins with a very stylized uh, prototype race car. Um, we think it is 100% uh, the right time to do it, to talk to a new audience and be able to explain how amazing endurance sports car racing is in a simple manner. And that audience is here in the States, serviced by uh, NB, serviced by IMSA Radio, I'm going to say that straight away, of course I am, and a Sirius XM202 for all of uh, our races again this year, really important, particularly with the manufacturers that you have here, who pretty much all have uh, Sirius XM in their cars, in their new cars, but serviced by NBC with the new platform uh, of Peacock and USA Network, and the international side of things becoming as important, possibly even more important than any uh, ever before with 2023 and the new manufacturers from Europe on the horizon. Yeah, uh, so you know, you guys have done an amazing job for us uh, communicating uh, to the world uh, and a huge audience. NBC here, of course, the USA, New USA Network and, and certainly now on Peacock, uh, if you want to watch Flag to Flag, um, you know, I think the fact that manufacturers can build a single car and know that they can compete here in the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship or go to Le Mans or run the World Endurance Championship with the same exact car, uh, maybe change the number plates and, and you're, you're in a, a situation uh, to run globally. The same now with our GT3 platform and the choice we made for GTD Pro and GTD. It's, it's, it's feeling like uh, we're all playing with the same toys in uh, now a global, a global sandbox. Uh, and uh, that commitment to a new GT3, which almost is so different from Stefan Rattel's view of, of GT3, that it, it could almost be called something different coming uh, ultimately for everybody in, in 2024. And Ford making the commitment to that this week. The Blue Oval is back and it will be battling the new cars for, that are already there from BMW. Laura Wontrop Klausner telling us there's of course going to be a, a Corvette to, to get the Pony Car Wars up and running again as well. Brilliant news. Yeah, I think um, while some um, manufacturers, uh, a, a strong number of them, now half a dozen have committed uh, to what is, is GTP for us, um, the top category. Um, there are still some manufacturers that whether it's because of their corporate strategy and, and product lineup or, or their powertrain uh, cycle plan, aren't able to do the top category. Um, not that they don't want to, but it's just not in their, in their corporate plan. Um, they still wish, based on feedback we've received, to have a, a pro GT category. Pro drivers, uh, if you will, with a, a, a platinum or gold lineup uh, yeah. and rating. So um, we felt like this was the right time a year ago to do this, and the market has spoken uh, with <laughs> 35 enough. GT cars, uh, 13 of them in the top category, 22 in, in GTD. If there was one thing that you could wave a magic wand at tonight and, and make happen tomorrow, John, uh, and I'm not talking about saving, saving the world and world peace and world hunger, although, you know, God, we could all do with a bit of good news on that front at the moment. But in, in, in the sphere that you can reasonably say that you control, what, what, would, what would be your priority? What would, what would you like to achieve next? Well, you, you, you walked the, the pre-grid today and you saw thousands of fans back. And uh, I think we have a very passionate and loyal audience. All your listeners that are with us now and, and around the world, uh, as a racing community of uh, specifically endurance, uh, endurance sports car racing, we have an opportunity to tell more people about it. So I think um, we have an awareness issue in some cases around the world about what we do. There's a lot of passionate yep. fans, but we can grow this audience and explain to the rest of the world from inside our sport 
uh, to the outside how amazing this is. And I think if I could wave a magic wand, I'd have the awareness of our sport be greater. And then once we hook them, uh, and get them to an event or get them to tune into a broadcast um, that we educate them in, in a simple manner in, in what, frankly, is decently complicated when you think about it. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I don't buy that people have got a short attention span. I think, you know, they binge watch things for hours on end. And uh, if, you, if you give them something that's compelling, and, and this has been compelling already in, the, in this first 12 hours. I, I think people begin to understand it and they're prepared to make the commitment on time. Uh, linear platform, network TV, always going to be important. Yeah. But streaming and the international feed that goes around the world, for the most part, it's, it's not blocked. I understand the reasoning behind some of the places, particularly here in the US, uh, and one or two other places that have network television. but. What can you tell the international streaming audience who are watching at the moment as well as, as listening about the commitment going forward to, to that uninterrupted feed that they're watching at the moment? Yeah, I think when, when uh, NBC Track Pass launched in uh, the end of 19, um, IMSA uh, versus any other motorsports platform that was available on that had the highest take rate. And I think that speaks to the sophistication of our audience, the way they take in their content. Uh, so we're super proud of that. To your point, linear you know, television is still going to exist, but our fans uh, and our audience like to take in our content um, in a streaming format. Therefore, you get the, uh, you get the flag to flag coverage on Peacock now. And let's be honest, nobody's going to give 12 or 24 hours on a, on a linear platform. Stay with us for a second. We'll go back to green here, and we'll go down to Andrew in a wee moment or two. Let's just see the first couple of corners, because you know there's going to be action, and there certainly is. Richard Westbrook <laughs> for JDC Miller Motorsport holding on to the lead at the moment, but the classes are mixed up just a little bit. Side-by-side -side action with the 0-1 trying to come through. That is Sebastian Baudet for Cadillac Racing. And right in there, the Ally Cadillac as well. That's Mike Rockenfeller. Rocky showing that he's still got the pace as they carve through some of the other cars around them. But what a restart from Richard Westbrook. We've often talked about how Richard drives with his pink fluffy slippers on when he needs to conserve fuel. But he's got lead boots on at the moment. He's pulled away by two seconds from the Ally Cadillac in second place. In fact, the 0 1's gone through into. That position, Elio Castro Neves was right up there as well. Here comes Castro Neves on the yellow line, pulls up high in the speedway turn, side by side with the 0-1 <laughs> of Sebastian Porte. This is magnificent stuff, big drafting, and Elio Castro Neves again proving he is the king of cold tyres. That could be so important overnight, and he's back up another position, Jeremy Shaw. Elio? Still got it, still got it. Sebastian Bourdain, too. I mean, he's pretty darn good on cold tires, let's face it. Wow. Dalio Castro Neves, wow, that was absolutely magnificent to watch. Uh, he had the speed on the back straight, took full advantage of it, but he braked super deep into the uh, Le Mans chicane there. That was a tremendous pass. Uh, Andrew Marriott down in the pit lane. We've kept you waiting for a little while, apologies. Yeah, I'm down at United with Phil Hanson. Uh, Phil, are you going to go back in the car in a minute? Quite a lot of laps behind. Um, well, about 10, so we need 10 safety cars that all fall. Yeah, there. Like, perfectly. we expect to see United right at the front. Of course, you've, you've done that in the WEC and so on. Um, what's been the main problem that's held the car up? Uh, a combination of things. Um, yeah, Jim, Jim struggling a little bit at, in the night, especially, um, and then a bit of contact and uh, some damage. A few penalties here and there. That's kind of the main thing. Um, and I don't think we're that far off. I think at the end of the weekend, when we go to look at all the times and, and lap times and sit averages, you'll see that United is where it should be. Um, just everything didn't come together. Phil, I remember filming you when you were training. I've never seen a guy push himself so hard. Are you still mega fit? Yeah, yeah, I'm not struggling just yet. 
Excellent. Phil's got a lovely smile on his face. He'll be doing the WEC again this coming year, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to that. Excellent. Phil Hansen there. Thanks, Andrew. Well, John, we're coming round to half distance. Brilliant race so far. I know how difficult it's been for anybody who does business in any form of commerce and racing let's be honest it has to be a business it has to make sense particularly at this level uh, you are the head of the team i know you'll tell me it's a, a team effort and of course it is congratulations for the last two years for everybody at imsa across the road at one day tourner whether they've been working from home it cannot have been easy for any part of the team, whether it's logistics, technical, Tyler Norling, who helps us out with our gear, the guys doing the BOP, or just the everyday running of the com company, you've done a cracking job, and it culminates in something like this. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful testament. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate your kind words, John, and it is a team effort. I, I actually run out of ways to thank the staff. Um, they have given so much to keep the business running. Um, they have uh, uh, worked around the clock uh, to do it right. Uh, they've come with come up come, come up with creative ideas to uh, do things a, a, a smidge differently. Um, so grateful that all of the manufacturers, 18 in total, have stayed with us uh, throughout this challenging time. Uh, brands like WeatherTech and Michelin have hung in there with us, and. Uh, you know, the satisfaction or the payoff, uh, frankly, happened um, on the grid walk yesterday for me, and I know lots of our staff high-fiving um, that we're able to do what we do and have such an amazing field and uh, such an amazing race so far. You're very good. He said yesterday, because of course we are in, into uh, tomorrow. And we're into the second half of the 60th running of the Rolex 24 hours at Daytona. And 30 of those years, Rolex have been involved. That's the kind of partnerships that we're building here at IMSA. John Doonan, the president, has been with us. You don't have to go anywhere, John, but thank you very much indeed for joining us. It's always a pleasure. RS2, IMSA Radio, Sirius XM 202 in the USA and Canada, around the world at imsaradio.com and in sound and vision on the live video tab there and at IMSA TV, IMSA dot. TV as well. So many places that you can watch. No reason not to get your fix of top quality endurance racing. Into the second half, and that second half of action starts right now. Thanks again to John Toonan for joining us. Keep warm, John. <laughs> it's chilly out there. So we had pit stops in all of that action, and we also had, a, I did notice in all of that, they were fairly routine, Jeremy, obviously a couple of driver changes that we'll pick up, but it looked to me as though the windward uh, Mercedes AMG was taking uh, the opportunity in there to do a brake pad and brake disc big rotor change uh, when they were in last time around. Spot on half distance, it couldn't have been any better for them. They've taken that opportunity. Yeah, perfect timing for them. That's exactly when you uh, ideally would like to to be able to change uh, the brakes on the cars and just back to we talked about earlier on I just got a, a note there from Bobby Golazinski who's actually watching from Finland by the way or listening to us in Finland because he can't actually see the pictures there unfortunately yeah there but, is a TV uh, deal in place yeah, there, which, yeah. Is a, which is a show for him but uh, he's he's listening in and he, he made the point about the, uh, the, the, the brake systems on the LMP3 cars because they're not designed for long distance races so they do not have dry brake uh, systems on those cars where you can just pull the brakes off and the fluid doesn't go everywhere. Uh, that they are all that all that sort of the dry brake systems they cost a lot of money and uh, the the LMP3 is a kind of cost capped car they're trying to keep it to a budget. So again, but on those GTD cars uh, that is not the case. They do have dry brake systems on those cars so they can complete those brake changes pretty darn quickly. It's good, Andrew. He's got one of the stars of the race. Uh, again for us. Let's have an update from Ben Keating. Yeah, Ben's only got the moment because you can get in the car. Ben, we're, we're, we're still staggered by the lap times you were doing. It was unbelievable. Uh, and uh, they jumped uh, paint these uh, cracks, uh, didn't they? Uh, you and me both, Andrew. It was so much fun. I can't believe they let a 50-year-old car dealer come out here and play with the big guys out there in the top class. It was the most fun I've ever had behind the wheel of a race car. So much fun. Uh, and uh, 
I'm pretty excited. I'm getting ready to get back in the 52 car. I got an hour and a half left of drive time, so that'll probably be three stints to finish it off. But we just got first place points to the 12 hour mark. So we're making headway on the Michelin North American Endurance Cup at the same time. So I'm hoping we're in the front in the next 12 hour mark. Okay, well, everybody will want to do this drive to the cars. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah, Ben, ben has got to get his helmet on, so, uh, yeah. And he is uh, his car, as they say, have taken top points. That's the number 52, P.R. Matheson Motorsport. Just had a change of the lead there at the end of that interview. Uh, and Richard Westbrook has gone back to first position. He's only got an overtake in Elio Castro Neves, the number five, back ahead of the number 60. Just happened during that interview, right at the end of that interview, going down through turn one and turn two. So the number five car was leading. Elio got, was, uh, Elio, Elio got the lead, uh, was scored at the lead at the end of the last lap, and then uh, Richard Westbrook has just taken it back. Yeah, okay, fine, just taken it back again. Yeah, that's yeah. the point. Yeah, because uh, West the number five car was leading. Uh, Elio took it. They, they crossed the line 0 0.006 seconds apart, and as you say, Castroneves is back in front again. So that's our 30. Uh, first and second lead changes in this race. Uh, and it will go back on the line as Richard will cross uh, first this time around. He's pulled out a decent little gap there. Meantime, in fourth position, Philippe Albuquerque is trying to close down on Sebastian Bourdier, but he's got Marcus Eriksson pushing him along, and Mike Conway's right behind him as well. Here they come to the line, Westbrook goes through, confirmed as the leader by half a second. That's a huge gap uh, in the, <laughs> in the uh, big scheme of things. 60, Elio Castro Neves then relegated to second on that lap. But the, after the restart, of course, it's all closed back up again. Yeah. And it's all very tight. They're all... Well, it, Richard is the one who's got the most laps under his Michelin tyres. He's probably only got four or five laps still to go in that JDC. Uh, Miller Motorsports Cadillac, the Mustang sampling machine. Mike Rottenfeller is uh, next, would be next to come in. He's in third at the moment. Then Sebastian Bourdais. So Elio Castro Neves actually pretty well off he's only on his 10th lap of a potential 23 24 lap uh, just a quick note about a couple of penalties the 47 motorsport was refueling whilst on the jacks that'll be a drive through there that's the number seven 47 motorsport car and i did see another one as well but it's just dropped off my screen uh, it was uh, that was another refueling on jack stands there it is car bound by Paragon, lamborghini Huracan. Car number 39, Sandy Mitchell took that car out, but he was being very fueled without the wheels on the ground. And the 64 car, it's the uh, TGM Porsche, isn't it? Uh, that car is going to have a very long call into the pit lane because uh, they ran the red light on the exit of the pits. That's uh, effectively ignoring uh, signals from the marshals from the flag marshals that'll be stopping 60 and Owen Trinkler will have to serve that penalty within three laps the um, LMP2 we just had a change of leadership there we've now got an IndyCar battle going on there as well because <laughs> Reedus VK has taken the lead uh, and it's Pat Pato Award Patricio Award is moving into second place so all of a sudden Mikkel Jensen having been leading that class in the PR1 Matheson motorsports car into which Ben Keating will insert himself fairly shortly he's now back into third position Louis Delatraz is in fourth Lu Luca Giotto to, so two European open wheel specialists up in the top five there and all running very very closely together not far behind them also is the uh, number 60 oh no the 68 car is next up in line that's ready rast in the sister g-drive car but he's about 10 miles back i've got guido van der Garde down here about to get in the car i think uh, bj's done a fantastic, fantastic job there no, really, really good. We're pleased with him, uh, what he's doing so far. Obviously, he's new for us uh, this year in the team. Yeah, last year, he had a couple of uh, left as well on this track, but he couldn't do it because he had a crash in the beginning. But uh, very happy with really what he's doing so far. Oh, 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 I wonder what it is they put in the water that produces so 
many great the the racing, racing drivers, drivers from Holland. I don't know, it's at uh, the moment it's crazy. Yeah? We had Verstappen last year obviously winning the world title, Formula One, and yeah, we have Venus who came uh, in Indy, and yeah, obviously of course here in IMSA, and uh, yeah, at the moment uh, there's a lot of good uh, racing drivers from Holland, and uh, we are pleased with that. Guido, obviously in this big race here, but I've seen you in the past racing uh, historic cars at Goodwood. Might you do that again? Yeah, maybe, but first, Let's see this, how this race continues, but uh, in the next couple of years I will for sure come back to uh, Goodwood. It's a nice event, so hopefully we can do uh, a good run there. Fabulous to drive for Fritz, of course. Yeah, yeah for sure. Let's see. Uh, let's see what happens with the uh, Jumbo supermarket car then, uh, Guido van der Garde. And a little bit of a career in Formula 1, of course. Thanks, Andrew. In GTD, John, the McLaren is back up front. Car number 70 for Inception Racing. Oli Milroy has taken nice. that car into the lead again in the GTD class. Uh, ahead of Richard Leitz in the right motorsports car number 16. That's the Porsche in second place. Andy Lally has appeared into third position in car number 44. That's the Magnus Racing entry. Andy Lally has uh, completed more starts than any other driver in the MCW Tech Sports Car Championship. He's competed in every single uh, uh, full season point scoring round in the GTD category since its inception in 2014. And that for Andy Lally is a total of uh, 87 starts. So he's got more starts than anybody else in, in this championship. But uh, he's also a two-time uh, Rolex, uh, he's a five-time class winner in the uh, Rolex series here. But for Andy Lally, uh, He's gone 50 races without a win. Watkins Glen in 2017 was the last win for Andy Lally, and that is a, a streak that he wants to break. And uh, he's got that car. John Potter had a tremendous last stint in that Magnus racing car, and Andy Lally is taking the wheel of it now. Andy was so, which he's, he's just thrilled with this uh, Aston Martin. The team has done a really good job. It's competitive. It's it's comfortable to drive and uh, he's showing that right now so it's uh, mclaren porsche aston martin the top three accurate in fourth place mark miller now for gradient racing having taken over from kevin simpson recently who did a great last stint the youngster in that number 66 car then stephen mcleer in the mercedes so that is five different manufacturers in the top five in gtd and they're covered by six seconds Jeremy Shaw and John Hindhoff in the Haggerty Global broadcast booth overlooking the beautiful green grass. Great American race mode into that in the Daytona logo. Into the second half of the race, Richard Westbrook by 3.3 seconds over Castro Nevis now. Sebastian Borte up into third ahead of Mike Rockenfeller in fourth position. And truly is a cracking race we're watching here. Philippe Albuquerque for Cunningham and Alta Acura in fifth position. Sixth for Mike Conway as Mikkel Jensen comes into the pits for the number 52. Wins PR1 Matheson Motorsport, Ben Keating's car. He'll drop out of one of the top positions in LMP2. The top seven, the whole field after the restart, still within a dozen or so seconds. Yeah. And, and Westy in that leading car. Uh, he had that back and forth battle with Castro and Evers. He's pulled about five seconds over him and he's just set that car's best lap of the race for Richard Westbrook last time around, a 134.432. At IMSA Radio, if you'd uh, like to get in touch with us, the overnight Night Owls session coming up on the NBC services, which means we'll be defaulting to. Rooftop Ray, Ray Wenzel Jr. He's got 157 layers of clothing on on the roof here. He's actually worked the Winter Olympics for NBC, so he's got all the right equipment and he's got it all here. It's just two degrees above freezing in the air, six degrees on the track at the moment. We're starting to chill down as we come into the 
midnight hour, one of the staging points in our Porsche keys to the race. And Sebastian Bourdais, he can go quickly too. 30, 1 minute 34.035 in car number 01. That's that car's best lap of this race. So we've got, what, three cars, I think, have set a lap at a, a 134.0, not very many, in this race. Yeah, did, I, I, I know we talked about the, the lap time coming, the lap record coming down. Yeah. Um, it, it, it stands at the moment to the number seven Cadillac at 34 flat. Uh, when was that set, Jeremy? Uh, Do we know? Yeah, it was on lap 231. All right, so by, uh, by uh, Kevin Magnussen. Right, ah, it was K Mark, was yeah. it? Surpr surprises me not at oh. all in that respect now that yeah, you've said that. Van der Zander, I think, had it before that. I mean, they've been, it's been traded several times during this race. So Bourdais in that uh, third place car, then the 0-1 car for Cadillac Racing for Chip Ganassi. Uh, a couple of laps ago, he managed to squeak past Mike Rockenfeller in the number 48 Ally Cadillac. So that was a change of positions. A little bit further back also, the number 31 car with the Mike Conway aboard. Now he just managed to squeak past Marcus Ericsson as well. So a change there as we see Richard Westbrook, the race leader, peeling off into the pit lane, 372 laps. And that is at the end of his 25th lap, so spot on. Inclu Mike Rockenfeller will be in next time around, I reckon, Jeremy. Including the cautions. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. That gave him the extra lap or so. Fairly standard. New tyres, or at least a change of tyres. Teams try to get some scrubbing on those tyres at uh, various stages during the week. Let's have a quick word from Andrew before he takes his leave for 48 Ally Cadillac in as well for Mike Rockefeller who stays in that car. Andrew. Yeah, John, uh, I'm just about to sign off and uh, go and have a, a few hours of shut eye, but uh, what a fantastic race. I don't really want to go to bed, you know. It's just such a great race. But I'm sure Joe Bradley's going to do a super job now, and uh, I'm sure he's going to interview all the big stars as usual. He does, he does like a bit of a star. He does. Thank you, Andrew, for your sterling work. Uh, just spare a thought for our pit lane reporters. Uh, they are in fire suits, but that makes it difficult to get layers of clothing on over the top because uh, clearly they've got to be safe down there. Then also for our flaggers on the starter stand, always two of them uh, on there. It's, uh, Tony and... Uh, Dennis John by Jonathan this year and they've actually had to cut their shift a little bit shorter they were concerning concerned about the cold there and also let's not forget everybody out doing the flags uh, around the flag points around the track So, Jeremy, your thoughts as uh, we head towards two o'clock in the morning into the second half of the race? Yeah, uh, magnificent, just tremendous fun. We've had uh, you know, rather too many cautions for sure, but then, you know, we kind of expected that coming in here. We knew with a field this competitive and with conditions this difficult, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's dry out there, but it is seriously cold, and, and that makes it very, very difficult. The cars are sliding around a lot, particularly after making a pit stop or you know, any way they lose the temperature in the tyres, it's difficult to build it back up again. So we knew there were going to be incidents, but it's been tremendously exciting. And we're only just halfway through. Let's take a look at the class leaders. Just before anyone else pits, Sebastian Bordier will be the next to pit from the leading group. So it's Elio Castro Neves for the moment, eight tenths of a second, but traffic giveth, traffic taketh away in GTD Pro. WeatherTech, Maro Engel with Alexander Imperatori right on his tail at the moment, coming out of the Western Horseshoe. That's the GTD Pro battle. And in fact, uh, Risi Competizione and James Collado is not that far away either. And he's right on the tail of the KCMG flash. And he's like new fastest lap of the race, 33-9 from Seb Bordes. He tries to take the lead before he comes in at the end of his stint. How about the Ferrari down towards the Le Mans chicane on the back straight, newly named. Dives to the inside, there's traffic ahead of him. It's one of the 
GTD to the uh, WeatherTech GTD AMG. Plenty of action right the way through. Ollie Milroy for inception leads by just two seconds from Wright Motorsports Porsche with Richard Leeds in the other GTD category. LMP3, Riley Motorsports, Kai van Berlo in the 74 Ranch 74 car. Renis VK for Racing Team Netherlands by just over, just on two seconds from Patricio Ward for Dragon Speed. And five seconds further back, Louis Delatraz. RS2, IMSA Radio. Jeremy Shaw and John Heindorf. Been a brilliant opening half of the race. As we continue live in sound and vision with Bruce Jones and first, Johnny Palmer. Morning, everybody. Um, fantastic action so far today. And we, as Jeremy Shaw has just mentioned, are only just halfway through. This is IMSA Radio RS2, part of the Radio Show Limited network of channels. And if you like your GT racing, well, that's been almost a standout so far within GT Pro. Three cars absolutely locked together and one at Bruce Jones going backwards into the bus stop chicane. That's quite a welcome to the race for you and I. Yeah, the Chetelar Racing, the number 47 Ferrari in backwards. It looks like it's just kissed with the rear wing, the tyre walls, and should be able to drive away from there. But don't forget, Johnny, that was a car that had a spin early in the race. Roberto Lecourt going around getting uh, clattered. He's spent a lot of time behind the wall for rebuilds. Hopefully this uh, little moment won't lead to another one, but they'll obviously have to check the rear wing when that comes in. But some places at uh, Daytona, Johnny, you can slide and get away with it. I think he probably has. So Sebastian Bourdais having just set the fastest lap of the race at just gone two o'clock in the morning. That was an in-lap, so that uh, rather goes to explain that the car was getting very, very light on fuel and has uh, blown into the pit lane now for its latest pit stop. Pit stop number 23, and he's off and running again, but that has dropped him back from second position to fifth. It is Elio Castroneves that leads the race by six seconds for Acura in the number 60 uh, Ally machine. And then, uh, as I say, six seconds further back, Portuguese driver Philippe Albuquerque in the 10. And in third position, Mike Conway in the first of the Cadillacs that are all stacking up behind the two leading Acuras. At times, I've thought the Cadillac has had the advantage in terms of chassis and others. It, you know, you have another caution and all of a sudden the accuracy pop up. It is so difficult to predict where we're going to be in just over 11 hours and 30 minutes time. Yes, only seven DPIs, but they are providing a really good race. And it is flip-flopping depending on what sort of fuel strategy each of those are on, Bruce. Yes, a quick glance at the timing screen shows that the lead car has got 21 pit stops under its belt. The car in second place, that's Felipe Albuquerque, who's just seven and a half seconds down on Castro Nevis is leading in that uh, number 60 uh, Meyer Shank Racing entry, uh, but only 19 for Mike Conway in the number 30, 31 car from uh, the Wheeling Engineering uh, Cadillac. So they've done something differently, but the thing that's really struck me, in right from the start of the race, once they got him right, the first court, Ted Giovannis then started picking off the other cars in the GT class. It's yin, yin and yang, yes right, Kamui Kobe actually was absolutely fantastic in traffic, but it's just how they negotiate the traffic. 61 cars started this race, we've still got uh, way more than 50 completing, I think we've only lost three cars thus far, so it's traffic, 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 it's how they manage it, and cold tyres, how they manage yeah. those. Everyone's had an experience, this isn't the sort of experience they're accustomed to at Daytona, but the one and only time I've been here, it wasn't a great deal warmer than this, but it was a whole lot wetter, three years ago, 2019. So you don't only have sunshine in Florida is uh, a message that has to go across to the drivers. They're getting it now. And on the, up on the high banks, on the speedway corners, um, you've got the camber, which is helping you around. But for me, the, the, the infield has always been the trouble spot, whether it's been raining or whether uh, it is in the, in the drier period. And the high line around the two horseshoes can be really tricky indeed. It, it's a question of whether you go there on an outlap with stone cold tyres. And I mean, within the last 45 minutes, we've had a couple of DPI cars off the road and very nearly into the wall at the Western Horseshoe. Um, one not, in fact, fresh from the pits at the time. Uh, the 31 car, which I think had Tristan Nunez at the wheel at the time, and it went backwards very close to tagging the tyre wall. Incredibly busy on the infield. 
but not least for the 10 from Wayne Taylor Racing and Konica Minolka. Minolta, the Acura that is being driven by Philipp Albuquerque, sharing with Ricky Taylor, uh, Alex Rossi and Will Stevens. But Albuquerque put in for a lot of the night stints, and this is, can, can often be when he shines. Now, well, let's just, uh, looking down the order, what's changed since I, since I went for a little snooze, watched the op opening out of the race, but um, quite a few cars um, have had the problems. One has been in the pits for a very long time, is the number 59, 59 McLaren. Paul Holson listed as the last driver, that's the Crucial Motorsports McLaren. That spent a lot of time down behind the pit wall. Have we got any news of that, Johnny? Uh, yeah, yeah, let's go straight to, uh, we've got a shift change all over uh, the RSL team at the two o'clock junction. So Bruce Jones, Johnny Palmer in the Haggerty uh, commentary box and in the pit lane for the overnight stint. It's good morning to Joe Brown. Well, well, it wasn't, wasn't a good, good sight when I came down, down the pits, boys, the 59, 59 Crucial Motorsport McLaren was being pushed behind the wall. I'm, I'm going to snuggle in tight, mainly for warmth. Um, <laughs> what's the problem? I mean, you guys have had a, what's called a car in the building, dear tour, haven't you? Absolutely. I, I think uh, at the moment we've got a little bit of a problem with the gearbox. Uh, the guys are trying to fix it at the moment. We're just trying to make sure the car's working more in preparation for Sebring than anything else. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been quite a character building evening, I think, for everyone involved. But, it's not really a reflection on the effort and how much everything's put in from the team. It's, it's our first shot here at, at Daytona with this lineup, and, and I think the, the boys should hold their heads high, and they've, they've done a really good job. It never is. It, ne it never is. And, and I suppose the spirit of endurance racing is the achievement is completing the race and taking the checkered flag. And I, I take it that's what you guys are aiming for. Uh, we've certainly given it a red hot crack, but I think it's at the point now where we, we need to just fix this problem and, and maybe put it away for the night, but the, the, uh, the guys have worked tirelessly for the last two weeks to, to try and deliver a result, so, you know, it's, it's harsh racing sometimes. And I, I take it the gearbox, it was, you know, something you can't factor for, is it? It's not like a, these days with paddle shift, the driver can't misuse the gearbox. No, it's, uh, it's an electronic issue at the moment. It's the, the e-shift unit isn't communicating, basically. Um, so the guys are pulling for a gear and nothing's happening. So we're sort of stuck in gear and we need to try and figure out the problem. And it's the middle of the night. Couldn't be any worse. Bad news for the 59, don't it, boys? But hey, this is endurance racing. And so many teams through the years, Joe, you'll know this, have come back from uh, adversity from a long way back. Disconsolate. Uh, sort of tone to the voice there um, but sometimes you have to go through these difficult races and uh, there's another one just around the corner well in a couple of months time with the Sebring 12 hours which will be round two of the 2022 IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship we're getting some word as well about the number uh, 66 which is the gradient racing Acura and thank you to uh, Declan Brennan for the, for the information on this and the last stop the air jack hose inside the car blew out so therefore the 66 graded racing car could not change tires and they'll use a manual jack uh, with that um, then later on so uh, anyway the nearly another half an hour has been done and the 97 weather tech racing car heading down the back straight and into the bus stop chicane with the green roof line very evident indeed the Le Mans chicane heading in and out of that for yet another time and the race leader the number 60 Elia Castroneves car is coming down into pit lane so I'm sure this is on schedule and all of a flurry the ally crew jump into action 24 laps have been completed in this car so that is spot on schedule and it will be certainly a, a different set of Michelin tyres. They don't got to be stickered, so it's very slightly scrubbed maybe in one of the earlier sessions. Remember, qualifying did not take place during race 
week. That was done at the Raw, so they've had four free practice sessions, effectively. Well, four is a number because the top of four cars are in the pits. Fairly pick wow. out. Albuquerque has come in in the num number 10 as well. That's the uh, Konica Milta. Minolta Acura, Acura, Mike Conway, the number 31 car from Whelan Engineering Racing, and also Marcus Ericsson, 0-2. Uh, from Cadillac Racing. So busy, busy time in the pits. Good time that we've got Joe Bradley down there so quickly. Maybe he's got out of the snuggle and the huggle down at Crucial Motorsports. So plenty for him to look at. But of course. So the, yeah, the 60s back on the move. And um, just going to get to Joe again quickly because I, I mentioned, Joe, that the news we were getting about the 66 gradient racing car with its difficulties in the last stop. What more do you have? Yeah, I did. my immediate concern was just how badly worn will the tyres be. So I spoke to the engineer on the 66 gradient Acura and they're not concerned at all, Johnny. So having to keep those tyres that were well used on the car, I would imagine the cooler track temperatures, freezing track temperatures, it's going to assist in that issue, and it really is an issue with regards to stretching those tyres out in the stint. They have got the quick jack ready, which is going back to old school stuff. Mechanical jack with a big lever, they're going to lift the car with that next time. And a lot of these teams will have practised that for contingency reasons. You can't always rely on the, uh, the newer spec kit. Oh, 60 car very, very wide and it almost into the tyre wall. Now again, this is cold tyres, Bruce. Car fresh from the pits. It's Ollie Jarvis who is still leading by 5.4 seconds. Albuquerque surely, surely is going to slip through in a moment or two. Um, but the 60 car going straight on, on the left-hander, so this is after the Western Horseshoe, you turn left almost at the same sort of angle as you've just turned right to get yourself into speedway, turn one, and it just understeers straight towards the tyres. Well, he was actually struggling through the first part of the, 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 the lap on his outlap, but that is an extraordinary moment because he looks so yeah, the faster cars have come through, he was just being gentle and cautious on those cold tyres, and it simply didn't turn in. It was Understeer City. He stopped just short of the barriers, but it was a really, really unusual incident. Or did he stop short of the, the tyre walls there? Certainly a lot of um, steam coming out down there, but it is absolutely spot on freezing. I thought he was being clever and cautious mm. through turns one, two, three, four, five, etc. But he's back going again. But this race has been chock full of these sort of little incidents. But for a driver to Ollie Jarvis's, uh, level that is extremely unusual these cars the prototypes relying remember on aerodynamic grip but jarvis just couldn't get up to any sort of speed so the invisible uh, hand of the and again he's off into turn into turn one so tires just slightly warmer uh, half a lap later but again the ability to turn in from high speed and it's much faster coming off the banking into turn one to arrest the speed and then get the required downforce better through the Western Horseshoe, but to be honest, it's going to be another test when he gets to the end of the infield section and tries to get up onto the high banking once more. We simply cannot stress how unusual it is for a prototype to be compete out competing in these sort of temperatures. Yep. It's a whisker over freezing. You think about the heats they drive in in a normal race through the IMSA series in the height of summer at Le Mans in, in the middle of June. It's so, so super unusual. And whatever the breaking point is and the turning point for the corner, it's not where Ollie's trying to look for it at the moment. He's, he's got to ratchet that in his brain, get his mind ticking around. How much further back do I have to go? How much? But he's had two warnings. Is it three strikes now? I don't know. <laughs> Round here, it can be quite forgiving if you have a moment at relatively slow speed on the infield, but we've already seen earlier on in the race, if there's a clash, or a misunderstanding on the high banks, that can often see the race over because there is something on the outside of the, of the speedway sections of this that you do not want to pick a fight with, i.e. the concrete wall or safer barrier. They were two different moments. Jarvis understeering in the first instance when he was trying to turn left at turn six and then coming off the banking into turn one, the rear stepped out and he had to try and correct that. Uh, amazing car control, actually, to have not had two bigger incidents. It's surprising for Ollie Jarvis and a man of his pedigree to even be in those moments, but that is the situation we're in this year, folks, at the Daytona 24 Hours, the Rolex to kick off the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship.
Right, Oli Jarvis, with that flurry of pit stops and those incidents, is down in seventh place. His lap time last time around, 1 minute 41.8. But before the pit stops on really low fuel levels, we saw Sebastian Bordet cracking in some fantastic laps. You know, one, 134s, almost 133s. 133.941, actually, just before the pit stops. So let's see what Oli Jarvis can do on a lap that doesn't include scaring himself not once but twice. Let's see what a lap pace they can come down to. But it is about taking your time, getting the heat. Well, what little heat you can manage to get into the tyres the Daytona International Speedway in the middle of the night. And just before the, the crews were coming off for our change over at 2 o'clock Florida time, they were just constantly commenting about how it was cold before, but it's much colder now. It really does seem the last couple of hours, the temperature just dipped down another few degrees, and I think that's really making absolutely all the difference at the moment. And you have to feel for those that maybe haven't experienced this weather condition so far this, this year, this race. So uh, Jarvis, thrown in, he's well used to uh, having to pick up from nowhere, um, as in a new driver into the car, and you've got to find the race pace just like that. But you need a, a couple of laps to work out just how much grip is out there. And I'm sure if he'd known it was so, not exactly slippery, but low temp into turn six, he may not have approached at such a speed, but you don't get that advantage. There's some advice that can be given to you by the team and by the outgoing driver. Uh, but uh, again, that has to be delivered very, very quick, yeah, quickly. And I, I, I've caught uh, Mike Rockefeller offering an awful lot of advice to Jimmy Johnson on the current track conditions many, many hours ago. You've got to try and get that across as quickly as possible because the infield section is where you desperately need it. And that's the first bit you find on an outlet. You know, over, over the years, over the decades, sadly, in my case, looking at some drivers, they are just immensely good at going out on cold tyres. But I just want to say again, reiterate, reiterate again, of course, as he says, murdering the English language. But it's about just these aren't conditions they're accustomed to. But also you get out of this stint, what little stint you light, uh, sorry, heat you'd have had in the earlier stints. You're trying to find your market, your points in the dark. This is real muscle memory stuff, but you don't have that muscle memory because you've not driven the cars in the dark in these low, low temperatures at Daytona. Plus the fact there is traffic absolutely everywhere. And the outstanding thing for me through the, the broadcast so far has been simply whenever there is an opportunity to get an onboard camera and you get a prototype approaching not one, not two, but three or four or five GT class cars, how they pick their way through. It is like the ultimate video game is enthralling and I just find hours go flying by but it's about the caution the pace the top drivers have to have knitted in with the caution required to, to achieve their their performance without just one little incident we've seen here as you said in the last half hour 40 minutes we've had two of the prototypes off the track and then we've had Oli Jarvis with his two moments so conditions are very difficult right I said let's see his lap pace he's come down by four seconds now by another one and a half seconds, one minute, 35.9. He's in the ballpark now, he's got the yeah. tyres. But that took him, what, three laps? It's a lot of miles. And it's important to keep your head because everyone has to go through that horror period just out of the, uh, out of the pits. And um, a number of drivers uh, know this situation, whereas others, as I say, are learning as they go. Um, let's not neglect what's going on in the other prototype classes because Pato Award in the number 81 LMP2 car leads that class and uh, the 81 car with a 3.4 second advantage. That's the Dragon Speed USA entry. Award, Devlin Di Francesco, Eric, Eric Lux and Colton Herta. Uh, but uh, Award has been a star earlier on in the week in various uh, of the free practice sessions and he's fending off Louis Delatraz in the number eight uh, Tower Motorsport LMP2 car. Then there's a decent gap for those two of 15 seconds back to Guido van der Gaarder in the racing team Nederland, bright yellow Jumbo car. There's been a bit of a shuffle just about half an hour ago, just watching the timings before we sort of dig tag took over from Jeremy uh, Shaw and John Heindhoff, Hackney Global Broadcast Centre. The top four cars in the P2 class were covered by, I think it was uh, 10 seconds now, it's gone out to just under 20 seconds. But we've also got in the mix behind Pato Award and Louis Delatrice, we've got Guido van der Garde, who said, Luca Giotto is just another three seconds uh, behind uh, van der Garde. It's super competitive, but how the pendulum can swing. In the early stages of the race, the Dragon Speed car was the one in P2 that was having the problem, but the 81 car now leading the way in class, Pato Award, 
actually <laughs> being caught very slightly by Louis Delatraz, but again, traffic. Every single lap will have a traffic incident, but uh, the car that stands out in the night is the car from Elton Julian Stable, not just because it's day glow orange and yellow, but because it's being dri driven very well. But for Dragon Speed, their tail is up on home ground in the States. So that 81 car is heading out of turns one and two through the orchard chicane around the back of the pits and race leader having to negotiate a slightly wayward Aston Martin there coming out of the Le Mans chicane. It's Bruce Jones and Johnny Palmer in the Haggerty commentary box and looking after things in the pit lane. Joe Bradley has found Wayne Taylor. Yeah, it's time for my half distance Wayne Taylor summary. Wayne, it's got the usual, it's got the usual cat and mouse look about it, but I somehow think there's a hidden intensity about this year. I'm sorry about Ryan get all that. It has a, a standard look of a cat, the usual Daytona cat and mouse. But there's, there's an intensity out there. Yeah, it's amazing. If you think about it, after 12 and a half hours, you've still got seven DPIs all on the same lap. And, you know, there's been a couple of guys that made mistakes, there's been some mistakes in the mid lane, there's been drive through penalties, but everybody's still on the same lap. It, it is really, really incredible. So how, what's the tactic? Just keep doing what you're doing? That's all we can do. We just keep doing what we're doing, and uh, we've had a couple of uh, issues, but, you know, once we back on track and we get everything, we all seem to run together. It's amazing. When this morning I was there in the press conference when you were there with the other Grand Marshals, it was quite a hallowed stage. It must have been quite a proud moment to have been up there with the likes of Mario Andretti, Jack Roush, Bobby Rahal. Yeah, it was very humbling, you know. Um, to, to just literally stand there and look around and see Mario, talk to him, Herbie Haywood, Bobby, Jack. It was, uh, it was, it was really something special. If I said to you, what was, if you can, pick a highlight of your career? I was there when I, I saw you, I saw you win the first inaugural Petit Le Mans, for instance. For me, you know, that, that was quite a highlight to see Wayne Taylor do that and be there. What's your highlight? Can you pick one? It was like choosing your favourite kid, is it? My highlights have been... Uh... The biggest highlight really was in 2017. Uh, we ran Daytona with Jeff Gordon and both my sons and won the 24 hour. And that is without doubt the best event that I can remember. That's a good one win. Thanks for talking to us, man. Thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah, a real insight. I mean, particularly gracious of Wayne to so right in the. Uh, real um, thick of the race and thick of the action. Uh, speaking of which, the 48 car has just spun, but really grateful for Wayne to take that moment to, re to reflect back to so much history of, well, I mean, the very first Petit Le Mans was in the late 90s, so 20, nearly 25 years ago, um, a real stalwart of sports car racing. Now, I think there's been some sort of failure on the rear right, or is it the wheel that is working its way loose of the 48 car, which is the Ally Cadillac. Now, who's in that, Bruce? Jimmy Johnson at the moment. Right? That yeah. right rear wheel is, uh, it might be the trick of the light. No, absolutely, it can't be. The bottom is splaying out. Was the contact, so it was a, a big save there by Jimmy Johnson, but he's got distance to go back to the pit, so he's down in sixth place. Was sixth place. Ollie Jarvis will be going past because uh, Jimmy Johnson, the NASCAR superstar, uh, limping his way back round. Is that a quick fix? But I'm afraid, Joe, head off down to Ally, Ally Cadillac Racing because 48 is coming in. Joe's ready to receive it. It's going to be a little while yet, and there's a decision to be made here by Jimmy Johnson about how fast he wants to go. He is down on the apron, so beneath the double yellow line, but there are sparks now pouring out the rear right of this car. The fireworks display that happened late last night is almost being repeated here. And for Jimmy Johnson, he's quite a long way into this stint, 15 laps in. That's what makes me think it's more of a suspension failure or an upright that's gone rather than the tyre that's working loose. If 
this was an outlap, I could understand that the wheel hadn't been attacked properly. But you do not expect this nearly 25 minutes into a stint. Oh, he spun it. He spun and spin at the uh, Le Mans chicane and comes to a hole now. There are going to be GT cars starting to fly through here. Jimmy Johnson sitting right in the middle of the track. The tyre's gone as well. And the Michelin rubber no longer existing on that rear right corner. A plume of tyre smoke as well. But Jimmy Johnson, who stalled the car in the spin, had to restart. The headlights extinguished briefly and then came back into action. I am amazed both through the avoidance action and also well, Jimmy Johnson's reaction to get the car up and running again, that he wasn't collected there. That could have been disastrous. He should now be able to get back to the pit lane from where he is. OK. So the well, 48... Damn, I just wonder whether there's some contact action that caused that spin, because there was another car on which I hadn't spotted first time around. Maybe a GT car? A GT car was at turn two, and uh, the cars both went onto the grass on the right-hand side of the track. And the garage, you should say, is just through the gate and then a straight line straight in there. It's already in the garage and up on the jacks, boys. Thanks, Joe. And the thing that really got me was uh, spinning between the first and second parts of the Dunlop chicane. So the cars, luckily for him, the next two cars were some distance away. They were coming effectively out of... Uh, the first bank corner, turn nine, and he wasn't caught because the car was sideways across the track. As you said, lights were out. That doesn't help for a car coming in. But Jimmy Johnson got that fired up and got back round again. Yeah, so uh, a, a real moment there which will grab the headlines. Jimmy Johnson is back in the pit lane, but uh, it could have been a whole lot worse. It's, sorry, got into the uh, behind the wall and in the garage, as Joe described. But contact, I think, has led to that uh, suspension failure. Part of the wheel buckled as well. Now, we need to try and identify which GT car it clashed with. It's always tricky coming around turn one. If you're then side by side with a GT car that clearly needs some road space as well. And if you just misjudge whether the car, your car is quite past the GT machine, they're, they're, I mean, it's a mangled mess is uh, the rear right wheel and uh, very much evident is the contact that was made. The GT car uh, that it clashed with, I don't think it's come into the pit. Joe, you're right with this car. Yes, Johnny, and uh, that um, wheel does show signs of contact. I'm not sure whether that's cause or effect. I'm going to say cause because the way the side of that wheel has been ground away from, as you, as you described, Johnny, Car going on the hijacks, that's the, uh, the hydraulic jacks that lift the car about three, three or four feet above the ground that enables the team to get underneath. No doubt that uh, there's probably going to be extensive damage to the under tray. In fact, I can see little trays, it's not sure what effect that is. Um, can we cut the ash sheet? Can we use any uh, information as to what happened out there? No, no, okay. Yeah, they know as much as we do, Jimmy. Johnson in the car and steers in the car. I think he does. Yeah, he does. So Jimmy Johnson at the moment about three or four foot in the air while the team go to work. Thanks very much, Joe. And uh, OK, let's play the detective game. I sense from a very quick look at the replay that it was a blue GT car. So I'll give you a choice. Can't be the 23 Aston Martin from Heart of Racing team. That was eliminated. It could be the number 16 Wright Motorsport Porsche. It could be the other Heart of Racing Aston Martin. That's car 27. I suppose the Chetana Racing Ferrari, number 47, or possibly even the Gradient Racing Acura. But you know what? Probably none of them. It was under cover of darkness and uh, with headlights, cars spinning around. It could have been the Acura, it could have been some of the others. But uh, maybe if we get treated to a further replay, uh, we will be able to pick it up. But certainly we know the car was uh, given the hit. That was the uh, 48, uh, the Ali Cadillac Racing. That's the car in the pits with all the damage that Joe was just describing. Somewhere on my uh, massive timing screens, I should be able to work out the latest uh, pit or the latest uh, lap times rather for said cars. But um, I might be able to uh, do that whilst uh, Bruce is next talking to do some detective work. I'm also very interested to know which GT car had to go right across the grass at the Le Mans chicane in avoidance of the stationary Jimmy Johnson Ally car. 
somebody else threaded their way through where that car was parked and the curbing because the, the, the racing line was actually available but you needed to be so many more meters further back in order to judge that and work out yes i can still turn in at the usual point Sebastian Bourdais leading by a little over six seconds. And when I say a little, I mean three thousandths of a second over six seconds. And that gap is opening up, or at least did last time around, because Richard Westbrook didn't quite catch the traffic and lost a couple of seconds. Mike Conway is in third position in the wheel and engineering Cadillac. So it is Bourdais leading in his uh, caddy as well. Cadillac Racing 0-1 car, but there are going to be many laps lost here by the number 48 Ally Cadillac uh, as a result of this contact. And they're trying to work out how deep that uh, that damage goes. It's the driving wheels, remember, so if it's pushed a, uh, a half shaft into the gearbox or similar, uh, that could take quite a while to solve. Mike Conway really pushing on, a 135.4 and almost four wheel drifting it through turn one there. Again, someone who's pretty deep into their stint, so that's not down to cold tyres, it's just down to the ambient temperature, both in the air, but also down at track level, Bruce. Yeah, and I think it's also a driver who's really got, it, got his mojo, he's found the stint pace, the pace that you can achieve on the tyres and he, he's also, I tell you who's lapping faster, Sebastian Bourdais, not yeah. leading the race by six seconds, nearly eight seconds now, he's pulling away from Richard Westbrook Richard was super quick when he took over but right now Sebastian's on fantastic form he was great before his pit stop but he's lapping below one minute 35 in the night and if you're just clicking in to listen or to watch let's just point it out again, it's only a whisker over freezing at Daytona, no I haven't gone mad it's the weather that's gone mad, and it's the drivers who are trying to sort it out. And uh, everybody has to try and get the heat into their tyres. Don't go too hard too soon, or you'll be spinning. And as Johnny pointed out, the first part of the lap from uh, turn two, where they join the circuit after the pits, uh, through till turn seven, you're twisting, you're turning. If you've got no heat in the tyres, you do what we call an Ollie Jarvis, because he had two moments trying to find some heat. One going between turn six and turn seven, simply understeered off the track a short while ago. And then, more scarily for him, when he reached turn one at full racing pace and didn't quite turn in, saved the moment. That was a warning. Quite a collection of fans now, even at this early point in the morning, just gone 2.30 a.m. Uh, there's a collection of fans outside the Ally uh, garage, keeping an eye on the repair work. And another car that has come to a halt out on the racetrack is the T3 Motorsport North America Lamborghini, car number 71, with the lights, headlights flashing on and off. It's Misha Goikberg, and Goikberg is not on the racetrack, he's not on the racing line, so I wonder how long race control will leave this before they decide to push the, the big yellow button. It's not in an immediate danger of being collected. Three wide through speedway turn one, and that was a DPI car going high and wide. One of the caddies um, dealing with an LMP3 car next to its left. It's the 0-1, in fact, of Sebastian Bourdais. So talking about the race leader, uh, but going uh, up very close to the safer barrier with an LMP3 car to his immediate left and a GT car way down towards the apron. It's opportunities like that in the middle of the night to appreciate the skills and also just the years of experience that Sebastian Bordet has. Not hesitant at all in traffic, has built in a little bit of a cushion, a little bit of gap in case anything happens. He sees a couple of cars, right, I can identify it's on the exit of the Dunlop chicane, now called that for the first time, uh, where Misha Goikberg has gone off. He's gone through, it, call it a four-part corner. He's gone straight on at turn three. He's in the escape road. Lights are flashing, but going absolutely nowhere. Not in a place of peril. He's a good, um, oh, he's now finally moving. He, he was 59 yards away from the exit of the corner. He's now 60, but he's only gone a yard, and he's stopped. The lights are still flashing. Double yellows, not waved, though, at the moment, and most of the drivers have had an opportunity to see him, but they'll just see two tail lights. At least the lights are on, unlike when Jimmy Johnson spun in the track there, but the, the track workers are closeted against the cold, many, many layers of clothing for them. But the heat will be in the cockpit of that T3 Lamborghini, and quite what the problem is, clearly, Johnny, no drive whatsoever from Mitchell Goikberg. Yeah, and is it uh, a problem that's rooted in, in an electrical uh, issue, perhaps, rather than 
the uh, rather than an engine difficulty I'm puzzled by the fact that these lights are being turned on and off there is a rescue unit now that has arrived because we're going to go caution so the caution is out around the racetrack for yet another time and uh, we have nearly reached 13 hours here on RS2 IMSA radio Another caution, this will, if anything, help the Allied crew because they're going to be losing less time, still trying as frantically as possible with the car up on the hijacks, the incompressible jack stands to try and get the repair work done. But the, the underframe of the car is now the focus. So clearly that side to side contact that was done at turn two has done significant damage, not only to the wheel, but also to the innards, the drive train of car at number 48. Plenty of work going on on that 48, but it's that dreadful thing, Johnny, where you've got to be logical, you've got to work out how deep the problem is, you can't go for a quick fix. Um, and so the crew really, really just going through the process. But uh, is Jimmy Johnson still on board? He was certainly when Joe Bradley was down there last, still in the cockpit. Yes, he is still sitting there. Is Joe still around down there? Because it'd be quite good if he's not for him to scurry back. He's not in the pit lane. The car isn't in the pit lane. He's behind. He's in the paddock. Nick Johnson coming into pit road in the... Uh, 54 car that is from third position of LMP3 and uh, the Swede for core autosport choosing to make a stop remember everybody uh, during this caution period will cycle through as well so uh, Joe Bradley is back in the pit lane this Lamborghini by the way is now about to be stretched towards where Joe is but We'll get back to him now for some news. Yeah, I'm at Pit Inn awaiting the arrival of uh, a flurry of pit stops with this track now gone full course caution. We're just waiting for the pit lane to warm. And meanwhile, I can just see across the inside, just behind the pit car, uh, the pit perches, let's say, and the number 48 car still on the hijacks. Jimmy Johnson remains in the car. But they got a lot of work done very quickly on that I car. And, uh, I can't see it being that much longer and, and as you said Johnny this full course caution benefiting the 48 car massively because they're losing less track time as the clock ticks away while that repair job goes on the cars are going around the track at a lot less pace and so they're losing less space between them and the other runners they can still come back and get back into this no question a chance to gain laps back during uh, these caution but uh, later on, uh, the uh, opportunity to gain one or a couple of laps uh, with each of the cautions there. The 71 car has been uh, towed to the area of the infield, which is just to the immediate left of the Le Mans chicane. There is a gap in the fence there. That doesn't necessarily mean that the car is out of the race. If they can restart it and get back onto the racetrack, they should be able to continue, but uh, what you can't do here at Daytona is have the car towed via the internal roads back to the pit lane and rejoin in that fashion. You must enter the pit lane uh, on the racetrack, unlike some of the other 24-hour races that we cover here on the Radio Show Limited network of channels where outside assistance is permitted. This is effectively like Le Mans rules racing, uh, where you'll need to use the car under its own steam to get back to the sanctuary of the pit lane. Yeah, as tempting as it may be, that with the network of uh, infield roads and whenever you get an aerial shot of the Daytona Speedway, you look around at just how many interior roads and routes there are and the many, many versions of the circuit that have been over, over the years changed and tweaked for all sorts of purposes. But right now, drivers going around at greatly reduced pace, as Joe pointed out. So what does that mean? Tire temperature drops. What happens when they go racing again? They need to get the heat back in. But I think that mower has gone to all of the drivers across the field and what a packed field it is. And in fact, the uh, Lamborghini now being uh, towed in. Sorry, correct that. It's uh, stationary, it's just looking at the safety car around the track. We've got a prototype going very slowly behind... Johnny, what do you make of this one? Very, very slowly, trying to work out which car we're riding on board. Is this... Oh, that's presumably our race leader. It's presumably zero it's the one. Zero 01. Sebastian Bordet, got it now. The other's on uh, Wave Past. Yeah. 
So they wait by happening, and uh, any of the cars caught between the safety car and their class leader will be allowed by to effectively reset the field. That just makes sure that uh, even though the overall leader may be in awkward position if you're in some of the GT classes, uh, there's not this huge gap which is uh, enforced and it's interesting actually over the last couple of years that some other championships are involving this part of the safety car procedure in their regulations namely the world endurance championship and the european le mans series as well so they uh, are allowed to be waved by and this will um, start or in a moment or two once the the, the field is in the correct order uh, the pit stops will begin for those that want to take it. In fact, they're going to start now, and that is one, two, three, four, five DPIs all peeling off, possibly more. It's just that uh, the, the five-car train stretches out of my frame, but uh, Joe Bradley is, as you would expect, expertly positioned at pit in, and you're going to be greeted by probably oh. the whole DPI field. Oh, oh I'm really, really happy. happy. You've got to be really uh, uh, right on your toes here, boys. boys. Uh, the, the, the zero one has gone straight into and behind the paddock and into its garage, whereas the 31, the wheel and engineering Cadillac, that's come in for what I would describe as a regular pit stop. And uh, as you described, Johnny, a flurry of pit stops all the way down the pit road. You've got to be really, really aware of your Presses the 31 wheel spins off the number 10 just getting out ahead of it. That's the Connick the Manola car ahead of wheeling engineering. I'm off to the 01 garage and to find out what is going on there. Yeah, because we did not expect uh, for Sebastian Bourdais the fact that he would have to drive, and it, it, it almost caused a collision on pit road because as Bourdais was trying to find the gap in the fence to go behind the wall, caused all sorts of confusion behind for Oli Jarvis, for Philippe Albuquerque, and uh, Richard Westbrook as well, needing to take, avoiding it. They were trying to get to their pits. Uh, and just as Sebastian Bourdais was driving into his garage, the Zero One crew were ready to receive them. And that is puzzling for me because the car was going pretty well before the caution came out. Right, still a caution period. Is this the moment? Well, Joe will find out. Uh, Joe, let's go down to Joe. Are they doing the standard brake change? I have just arrived at the Zero One Cadillac Racing Pit and Sebastian Bourdais stays on board. Um, it, there's certainly some brake work going on on the front end. On the rear end, it's more towards. There's a lot of work going on on the on the centre of the gear, uh, the uh, where the suspension attaches to the gearbox. We've got a brake change going on on the front axle. Uh, nothing going on regarding brakes on the rear axle. So they, they are using this caution to get that uh, brake change done in the environment of the garage front brakes and an alternator belt and a battery change. Thank you for that. Uh, so information from the team, alternator belt, which is of course the alternator is right on the, the in the suspension components attached to the side of the gearbox, and it's belt driven off the drive shaft. Um, a very compact engineering on these cars, and that's what's happening. So pretty routine, pretty routine stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Is that a yes? <laughs> you can't talk to me. Don't be afraid. There's only a few million people listening. <laughs> Thanks for that. So, so nothing, nothing, nothing to be worried, worried about in the all one Cadillac racing uh, carriage. It's RS2 IMSA Radio for the 2022 running of the Rolex 24 at Daytona. Johnny Palmer and Bruce Jones looking after the overnight stint. We're on till, well, at least initially, till 6 o'clock this morning. And, uh, well, we certainly picked a good time in the race because there's an awful lot happening. Very pleased to hear from Joe Brady recently that the Zero One's uh, trip behind the wall is all part of the schedule and they're doing some routine maintenance on the number Zero One car that was expected. And the uh, Zero Two, presumably, will need about the, the same sort of work as well. That's currently being run by Marcus Ericsson. Let's get to Joe Bradley for uh, some more then on the, on the Zero One. Uh, they will have planned out when they needed to do this work, roughly speaking, but it needed to fit it in with the cautions, Joe. Well, well you, you see, see it's, it's all about where the position of their paddock garage is. And it's just inside the entry gate to, the, to, to, to go behind the pit wall. 
if you are in a garage that's the other side of the paddock garages, then it's not really of any advantage to be bringing that car all the way in, driving pretty much all the way around the paddock. For the 0-1 position, the garage for the 0-1 Cadillac racing garage is just inside the entrance. So for them, it makes the utmost sense. It's literally 20 meters, if, you know, 40 yards inside the paddock. So for them, it's uh, they're not going to lose any time by wheeling up behind the wall. Whereas other teams, they lose a massive amount of time doing that. Yeah, and these things always needing to be considered either before the event or uh, sometimes on the fly when uh, you encounter them. But uh, garage position is crucial to sometimes how your race can pan out. By the way, uh, Sebastian Bourdais just sits patiently in the 01 car for this work to be completed. They may have done a driver change, actually, but the driver is still at the wheel, at least, and the engine cover about to go on now. All seems to be relatively relaxed. The GT teams are also choosing this moment to do their brake change, where we're only just beyond the halfway point, Joe. And even though uh, the temperatures this year are much lower than we would have expected, you still can't think that you'll be able to get through this race without doing the brake change. So many hard stops around this place, Joe. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. You're, you're, you're still going to wear those brake pads, pads and those brake discs or brake rotors as on this side of the Atlantic. And uh, right now I'm watching the number 12, the Vassar Sullivan Lexus, having a front axle brake change, just squeezing that caliber back to get the new pads in. Uh, brand new brake rotors, brake discs going on to the left-hand side of the car. And if I step round the back of the car, same job going on on the right. So um, this team obviously not having the the the, uh, the advantage of being able to take the car to the garage, but hey, it's, uh, these guys are used to working in this uh, sort of uh, harsh environment of the pit apron. So plenty of cars heading in and out of the pits and some as uh, Joe's mentioning their standard GT uh, stops but others going to take a, a little while longer to be completed. Jules Gounon currently leads the GT Daytona Pro class, the, the new segment of GT Daytonas for 2022. Remember they're all the same spec of car uh, but differ with their driver lineup. So Pro uh, represented by the 97 car for Jules Gounon which is the car that he shares with Cooper McNeil, Daniel Junkadea and Mara Engel. So that's the second of the two WeatherTech racing uh, cars, or the first of the two if you prefer. It's the uh, Mercedes, so 6.2 litre uh, V8, normally aspirated. And the other car in their field is a flat six Porsche. And then in second position, the 62 James Collado driven Risi Competizione Ferrari, who has been, been there or thereabouts, led for a good segment of the race yesterday, running in second ahead of Matt Campbell, Ben Barnacote, Andrea Caldarelli with a personal best lap time just before the caution, and Alexandre uh, Imperatore for KCMG running in sixth place. But they're covered by a whisker, they're behind, yeah. the, behind the, the pace car, but we've got of those top six cars, the top five of them, five different manufacturers, and uh, we heard. Uh, from IMSA earlier, just talking about the cover. We've got 18 manufacturers in this race, and I think it's sometimes when you stand back from a race and look at the numbers and then crunch the numbers and then look at the cars and the teams and the mix, I think the Daytona 24 hours is at one of its sweetest points. You think back to the great, great races, but not so long ago we had the top seven cars in the DPI cars, all of them, on the same lap after the halfway point. Wayne Taylor, who's been here, seen it, done it, um, you know, was in full admiration. But uh, one of the teams that's been going very well has been Mayor Shank Racing, but problems for Ollie Jarvis. He's moved up to third place, but if Joe could find out... Joe. Yeah, it's always uh, at this point of the race, Mike, that I like to get the team principles kind of uh, view on things. Uh, we just passed half distance. This full course caution seems to be a, a bit of an advantage for everyone to do brick and rotor changes and, and the like. It's a good time. Um, the low one looks like it has a little more problem than just brakes right now. But, you know, all of us are ch have challenges. I've noticed every team out here has got something that has gone wrong. We've had to recover from. So right now, Autonation uh, Sirius XM car is really, really good. It's just just trying to make the least amount of uh, mistakes on these really, really cold conditions. These, these tires, these cars have zero grip for a lap and a half. And it's it's really tricky. Okay. 
and that's the information coming from the uh, the tyre engineers. Lots of speculation going into this race regarding how cold it is right now, and it's about a lap and a half, is it, before the drivers can get some sort of control? So, uh, it, I mean, it's something like that. You're trying to get some engagement to the asphalt, and there's just nothing on the out lap. So it's a balance. It's a delicate balance. It caught us out a little bit this run, so. We just uh, we do everything we can to give them scrub tires, not sticker tires at night like this, and uh, try to get to the sunshine comes out here. So uh, we look forward to it. Mike, it's got the standard Daytona cannon mouse feel. I've just put this to Wayne Taylor as well, but however, I can't help but feel there's an intensity about this year. Well, I mean, if you look at it, that there for the longest time, uh, all seven cars are on the lead lap, and they're all the same speed, more or less. There's some stronger in other places than others, but it's true competition. You just you just can't blink. If you blink, you're gone. And you must be quite a gambler to try something completely different than just hanging in there. <laughs> well, I mean, we're always, we're always trying to improve our position, but right now we're just trying to get to two or three hours to go, really race. Thanks, Mike. Mike Shank from Meyer Shank Racing with Kurt Agajanian and the 60 car is back in the rhythm again now. It's in the queue behind the safety car, um, so the caution period is still out whilst they, well, they've reset the field now, but the cars that have come down pit road, first of all the prototypes, then all of the GT cars, and an awful lot of the GT teams electing this moment to do brake changes and a little bit more extensive uh, maintenance as well. So this could uh, develop a very different order, at least coming out of the caution as we're going to go green now. And this is a very good restart indeed for Philly Bauerkirk, who was not caught now and he'll go right round the outside of Witcher and Westbrook to tie and take the race lead. Tyres are cold again, remember, because we've been going at a much reduced pace. A stonking fight as well for fourth position between Mike Conway and Kevin Magnussen in the 31 and the 02, respectively. Albuquerque did not take the race lead despite his best efforts to the outside line. Very nearly made it, but there was no grip on the outside of that first left hand of Bruce Jones. No grip whatsoever, and he actually went slightly off the circuit, had to back off and that gave opportunity for Westbrook to maintain the lead. But going through the first few corners of the lap, it was like the opening lap of the race. We've got five DPIs fighting away. Of course, we've got the 0-1 in the pit. Sebastian Bordet still on board. Jimmy Johnson also in the pits in the Ally Racing Cadillac. That's fallen to 12th place, still being maintained. But these five crews know, of course, that, hold on, the 0-1 would have done all the changes it needs to do, theoretically, for the rest of the race. They're going to have to consider that. But right now, they're not considering anything apart from racing in its absence. Absolutely fantastic. Nolly Jarvis and Mike Conway side by side on the banking. This is Daytona and it's very fine. It's in the night, but just said again, it's super cold. How much grip have they got after that caution period? Not a lot, Johnny, is the answer. Smashing the curbs as well, and the tyres are still building to race condition and race temperature, so you have to be respectful, even though they're fairly flat curves, they're very abrasive here at the Le Mans chicane. It's a good run again for the Konica Minolta Acura, driven by Philly Bauerkirk. He's right in the slipstream of Richard Westbrook. Westbrook is bolted to the double yellow line as they come off the banking and sweep into turn one, and Albuquerque's brake uh, discs glowing red hot, front and rear, couldn't get the car stopped sufficiently and turned in, and it ended I think he's now on the back foot to Kevin Magnussen, who is up to third position. Yeah, Kevin Magnussen was mighty on that restart lap and uh, really got his opportunity. But for the second time running, Albuquerque attacked into turn one and had his right hand wheels off the circuit, praying for a bit of grip as he tried to turn double left effectively. This keeps buying a little bit of an advantage for Richard Westbrook. But look, the top four cars, they were covered by 0.8 of a second on the start line. It's half that as they go through turn three, doubling back to the right. And uh, at the moment, it's Westbrook just eking out an advantage to Tiny advantage over Albuquerque, but Magnuson, he's the one with his tail up. He's pushing so hard in the 0-2, knowing that for Cadillac Racing, the sister car is in the garage at the moment. Sebastian Bourdais still on board. The car now five laps down. Nothing between the second and third place cars of Albuquerque and Magnuson as the Chip Ganassi racing car for Cadillac, the 0-2, closing in on that Acura that runs in second position. So it's Cadillac, Acura, Cadillac, Cadillac, Acura, the top five. Sebastian Bourdais, remember, is still in the pit lane receiving quite a lot of extensive work so there is a danger here that Bourdais will go a good few laps well he's already five laps down 
as Chip Ganassi worked very hard on the 0-1. Meanwhile, the 0-2 still very much on the lead lap up into third position. It's been a good restart for Kevin Magnussen. Albuquerque isn't close enough to Richard Westbrook, who has slowly built the tyre temperature back up. The tyres don't get anywhere near as cold as they would be for an outlap leaving the pits, but there's definitely a blend away from their peak performance, and Westbrook had to weather that storm, but he's back in the groove now. Now, an interesting little analysis, to my mind, is the fact that uh, going round the banking, crossing the start-finish line, the Acura is gaining on the Cadillac. In other words, the number 10 car, Philippe Abicot, every lap catches Richard Westbrook, but he can't get it turned into turn one. He loses everything he gains, and Kevin Magnussen, who's fallen back in third place, closes in again. They're still covered by one second, the top three cars. Let's just remind you, the order is Richard Westbrook leading for JDC Miller Motorsports, the number five Cadillac, then Philippe Albuquerque attacking so hard in Wayne Taylor Racing's uh, Acura, and then Kevin Magnussen uh, for the 0-2 Cadillac Racing Team right on his tail, but not that far back. Oh, just three quarters of a second down in fourth place is Mike Conway in the mix very much as well in car number 31, uh, which is uh, the Wheeling Engineering Racing Cadillac. And uh, watching it all from, oh, huge distance back, one and a half seconds, Ollie Jarvis in fifth place in the number 60 entry, the Marshak Racing Acura as well. So it's a real scrap after that yellow flag period. It's also a, a rare moment, we haven't had this for a good few hours, where the top five all become on the same pit stop strategy and uh, Richard Westbrook actually spanned the previous caution with his 21 lap stint uh, when Albuquerque and uh, Ericsson, Conway and Castro Neves all came in together. So this is very much hitting the reset button with 13 and a quarter hours completed, Bruce. And of course what we get, you get this purity of racing and we have a change in the lead, the number five has uh, done, no, it's different defended his position there. I thought Albuquerque had got him down into turn three, had a P3 car. What I was about to say was pure, pure racing out on the circuit. No traffic apart from that P3 car in front of them. But let's find out what's happening with the 0-1 uh, Cadillac racing car. Joe Bradley, because that's fallen to 11th place, still in the pit lane. Yeah, and Sebastian, has, uh, garage, Sebastian right? Board here has now climbed out of the 0-1 Cadillac racing car it's not as straightforward as we thought the alternator and the alternator belt causing a battery to fail uh, still work going on on the rear end i think they've uncovered something else uh, information sort of uh, we don't want to poke our nose in because we get it be getting in the way so i'm going to let that sort of manifest and the information will come ex exactly being the technical geek that i am i'm dying to know exactly what it is they've got a spare gearbox lined up on a trolley behind the car which is never a good sign um, so it may be that this 0-1 is going to continue dropping and just along a couple of garages uh, further along the number 48 Ally car is still on its hijacks. Remember that's the car that Jimmy Johnson uh, brought in after damage caused with hitting a GT car and J Jimmy s sits in the car still, he's still about three or four foot from the air while the team continue working. I'll have a pop along next door and find out exactly what the problem is with the number 48. And purely from the aspect of housekeeping, I'll tell you that the 0-1 is now represented in 11th position on the timing screen. Jimmy Johnson two places further back in 13th with Rene Rast sitting between them. But Rene will be on the up because in his LMP2 car, the 68 G-Drive racing by APR car, it is uh, working its way certainly through those two DPIs and running in 6th position in LMP2, behind the class leader, who is now Louis Delatra. So he got ahead of Pato Award during that pit stop cycle. It's still Guida van der Garde for Racing Team Nederland, third position in P2. Okay, just had a change of position. My eyes don't deceive me. We might have had a change of position in GT Pro because it was being led by the white WeatherTech uh, Racing Mercedes. Jules Gugnon had James Collado right behind him and I think James has taken the, the Ferrari pass number 62 Rizzi Competizioni that's been uh, going supremely well through the course of the race a little down on pace in the raw but picked it up very quickly in the race and now tucked in behind them it's a three-way battle Andrea Cordarelli he's uh, really in the mix as well in that uh, green Lamborghini from uh, TR3 racing it's a three-way battle who's coming up fourth in line Ben Barnico just three tenths of a second down he's been flying all race meeting didn't get to show his pace in the wet through practice but he's a driver I've watched the last few seasons in Europe in the GT World Challenge he's been absolutely mighty and in that number 14 Lexus uh, from Vassa Sullivan he's been super impressive in this race so much as echoing what's happening in the DPI battle top four cars very very close in GTD Pro
Andy Lally leading GT Daytona in the Magnus Racing Aston Martin from uh, Michael Grenier in the 57 uh, Winwood Racing Mercedes. So Grenier took over from uh, Russell Ward in the last stint, was it? Uh, anyway, the silver-rated driver, Canadian, now at the wheel of the 57 car with uh, Stephen McAleer in the 32, which is in third place, the Gilbert uh, Court of Motorsports Mercedes that he shares with Scott Andrews, James Davison and Mike Skeen. Busy again on the infield because the DPI pack are starting to find the tail-enders in the GT field once again. Remember, effectively now a five-car class as far as the DPIs that are on the lead lap. They're all on lap 405 with those other two dropping down the order and well into the LMP2 part of the race. Let's get straight back to Joe Bradley with more news from the pits. Uh, I'm in the number 48 Ally Cadillac pit and this is the car with Jimmy Johnson still in the car, repair still going on and of course a little bit more damage than was first suspected and we saw that car get a, a massive hit on the right rear corner and what looked like just a damaged wheel maybe and a little bit of scuff on the suspension of course that energy's got to go somewhere and it seems that it's traveled and they've been repairing looms and all sorts of stuff on the back of this car the good news is there's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel the rear diffuser under tray is going back on and the car is when that when that goes back on the, the car looks like it's perhaps going to be dropped down and some wheels attached to it and wheeled back out so we're not far off but they've lost a lot of time with uh, more damage than was uh, first suspected yeah thank you joe um they're all having to put a brave face on things there and uh, difficult portion this is the last thing you want to be doing at uh, exactly three in the, in the morning but uh, that's what Daytona can often spring up and you have to be on your uh, on your toes ready to react to these problems so now a what 10 lap lead for the five DPIs that remain in the lead pack and they are all on the lead lap this is only moments after Wayne Taylor race uh, Wayne Taylor himself had said isn't it incredible to have seven DPIs uh, all on the lead lap I suppose that might have always been put the kibosh on the situation and it's going to be a trying test for the 01 and the 48 to come back from this but we still have a stonking fight at the head of the order in the DPI class this is uh, RS2 IMSA radio part of the radio show limited network of channels and another clock hour is reached 3 a.m. in Florida for the Rolex 24 for 2022 round one of the IMSA WeatherTech sports car championship Busy on the main straight and into the tri-oval again for the second-placed Acura of Philippe Albuquerque. It is a wall of brake lights greeting him. One car as well, way out wide and possibly facing the wrong way into Turn 1, Bruce. That's the last thing from Philippe's position that he wanted to see. Yeah, if you see red lights, the car's facing the right way, but they were white lights. So certainly whatever went off at Turn 1 was quite some distance uh, from the corner trying to take sort of the NASCAR route around the outside, the high, high line that goes the whole way around the, the circuit. But again, picking it off, there must be half a dozen GT cars, and it's negotiating those, because certainly the previous time around, Philip Albuquerque just set that car's best lap of the race as he tries to close in. But Richard Westbrook, nearly a second clear. Ooh, what luxury. Since the restart, it's been half of that. But uh, Westbrook's got one GT car between him and the chasing Philip Albuquerque, who's got even less than that, because right, he's got none at all between him and Kevin Magnussen, who likewise has got Mike Conway right under his tail. One and a half seconds cover the top four cars, and just three seconds further back, Oliver Jarvis coming across the same traffic. He may make, make a better line through it, but first and second, Richard Westbrook, no cars now between him and Philip Albuquerque, and the Acura closing in, definitely an advantage at that point on the circuit as he catches the race leader going into that Le Mans chicane. And of course, at Le Mans, the first chicane in 2022 onwards will be in a reciprocal arrangement, the Daytona chicane. Got to get used to it, even before the start-finish line, it's nose to tail between first and second. This is a move going around the outside, always off at the outside. Philippe Albuquerque, can he make it stick into turn one? We've seen two moments where he just simply hasn't got it done. He's got his nose in front now, but they're turning right into turn one, Johnny. Who's it going to be? 
Well, this is the best chance that he's had so far. And look on the, even further on the high side. Well, Kevin Magnussen is slotting into second position, I think. Yes, ahead of Richard Westbrook. So uh, Magnussen was trying to read that situation as best he could. And Westbrook thought, well, I've got one car that I need to deal with. I'm not sure I can wrestle two back. And in fact, Westbrook loses two spots from the tri-oval. He was down to second across the line by nine thousandths of a second and then went on to lose second position as well to K-Mag who is late on the brakes into the Western Horseshoe now because Magnussen not only uh, up to second place he's not happy with that yet and wants to take the race lead away from Philly Babacook I have to say the uh, the number Zero two car looks to be really in the sweet spot from Chip Ganassi Racing. It really does, and I do so feel for Richard Westbrook there. He nails his colours. I'm holding the inside line. If you're coming past, you're going on the outside, and unfortunately, the two GT class cars just didn't behave the way he wanted to. He had no option but to hit the brakes a little harder. That allowed Albuquerque to complete the move, but of course, Magnus also on the outside line swept by. So all those laps. But let's see how does uh, Westbrook react. But right now, it's Albuquerque going away with Magnussen right on his tail. Just need a wider shot to see actually how far back has Richard Westbrook dropped. But I think the simple answer will be maybe a second in arrears. But certainly the pace at the moment of Albuquerque and Westbrook is mighty. Albuquerque, the Portuguese ace, spent lap after lap trying to find a way past Westbrook. And when it broke, the lead advantage it just went very quickly and it wasn't Westbrook's fault at all you've got to guess he guessed one side it didn't work his way but uh, it is yin and yang and we'll see what happens over the following few laps but it's a fantastic battle in the cold cold night at Daytona International Speedway but right now it's Philippe Albuquerque on the top of the pile but only just just shows though how much Albuquerque and Kevin Magnuson were being held up by Richard Westbrook you can have pure pace on the racetrack but uh, you need the, to be, uh, have the gap uh, made, whichever way that is done, either by traffic or just good driving to get your competitor off the ideal racing line. But already, Albuquerque, having set a 135.6, that is uh, significantly quicker, two seconds worth, than Richard Westbrook. And Kevin Magnussen could be even quicker than the Portuguese in this phase of the race because uh, the... Zero two car looking for a way by. Virtually every corner looks mighty coming out of turn six and up onto speedway turn one. And it's good on the brakes into the Le Mans chicane as well as the gap really condenses as they turn left and right and over the curbs. Little microcosm at this point. Last lap, Philippe Albuquerque, one minute 35.632. He was the fastest driver on that lap. Who was second fastest? It's a driver in 11th place, a driver in a P2 class car, Rene Rath. That's a fantastic lap in P2 from the, the German ace. He's running, what, sixth in the P2 class. That's the car's fastest lap of the race, but that is a, a brilliant lap. Must have had no traffic in front of him. He's got quite a distance to catch up with Ben Keating, who's the next car in the order. But just these little moments, when you get a, a different colour on your timing screen, it stands out. And we were eulogising about the pace of the first two drivers, Albuquerque and Magnussen, and the fact a little bit further down the order in a car that shouldn't be as quick. Rennie Rass did it just as well as they did. And that was uh, car number 68 for G-Drive Racing by APR, one of the two Oricas they've got in the race. So well done to Rene. Yeah, and he's now clear of uh, the stray DPI that is still behind the wall. Two of them, remember, the 0-1 of Sebastian Bourdais, the 48 of Jimmy Johnson. Jimmy into the garage because of damage after he clashed with the GT car coming out of turns one and two. And both of those cars still an unidentified GT car, but we think it may have been the number 16 Wright Motorsports Porsche ending up on the central grass of the Western Horseshoe. And Jimmy Johnson having to limp home with uh, damage to that rear right corner. And Sebastian Bourdais, a drive belt which has uh, caused an issue, an alternator belt, uh, which is proving very troublesome to change and that 0-1 car yet to emerge which appeared at the stop initially as uh, to be routine maintenance but it's proven to be much more tricky to solve than that since. The 10 car, Philippe Albuquerque, well to the high side of a couple of cars so again three abreast as one of the GT machines peels off out of Speedway Turn 4 and heads for Pit Road for a green flag pit stop. 134.259 was Albuquerque's last completed lap. That was lap 409, and that is the number 10 car's best lap of the race so far.
Interesting, isn't it? How hard are they prepared to push at the moment? They've got a few laps under them since uh, the yellows were withdrawn. We went back green. Fantastic racing. But Albuquerque and Magnussen, yeah, they've got a second over Richard Westbrook. Mike Conway, another second, 1.2 seconds down. And Oliver Jarvis is just not quite matching them in the Maya Shank racing uh, number 60 Acura at the moment. But uh, you know how the teams talk about get to midnight, get to morning get to noon, see where we can go in the last two hours. But I tell you what, getting to morning here tomorrow, today, of course today already, um, will be just that moment where a little bit of sunshine will come up, maybe, or maybe it'd be grey, but just a bit of temperature yeah. is what everybody craves, not just for keeping people comfortable in the pit lane and those who are being so hardy. Fantastic crowd here uh, this weekend for the 60th running of this fabulous event, but it is hyper cold at Daytona. And you just have to feel for those who only pack one little T-shirt to put under their under their race uniform. Side by side, heading down to the uh, chicane, and that was Magnussen with some contact, taking the lead. Where on earth did he come from? And Richard Westbrook is going to pick up the pieces as well with the move to the outside of the 10 car and the five then of Richard Westbrook. Uh, a, because Albuquerque was off the racing line, had to go to the outside to get by Albuquerque, and that move is still not done yet, as now it is because as they thread their way through GT traffic, the 0-2 to the race lead, Kevin Magnussen from so far back, Mike Conway's getting stuck in as well in fourth position. So Conway now pursuing Richard Westbrook and Philippe Albuquerque down to second. So Albuquerque, yeah, lo lo just hold on to that second place, but it was a dive bomb from Ke Kevin Magnussen into uh, the Le Mans chicane, and <laughs> certainly, suddenly Mike Conway was sitting at a second, two, two seconds off the pack. He's right in the mix, but you have to look some distance up the track, because not only did Magnussen take the lead, but the sort of coming off the power, trying to regain the line there for, for Philippe Albuquerque and trying to resist Richard Westbrook means you've got the leader, Kevin Magnussen, a second and a half, and then three cars, no to tell, Albuquerque, Westbrook, Conway, so it was all changed. So Kevin Magnussen looking like he was happy to settle to be in the draft of Philly Albuquerque, and then at the last possible moment, it's not often you, keep, you uh, uh, prevent uh, Albuquerque from knowing exactly what's going on around uh, into the Le Mans chicane, but he was caught not exactly napping, but thinking that Magnussen would just follow through in the Le Mans chicane. Uh, yes, there was some contact, and it'll be interesting to see whether there's anything said about that from a race control perspective, maybe just a, a warning if anything else, but Magnussen, after side-to-side -side contact, is now in the lead of the race, and we said it, Bruce, his car looked quicker in the draft behind Albuquerque. Certainly did, and just before we dive down to Joe, Joe Bradley in the pit lane, just want to explain, Magnussen did not dive down the inside to the left of Albuquerque into the chicane. He went the high side around the upside, and then the first part of the chicane he got through, the second part effectively turned two out of four. Side by side, what's the contact? Maybe Joe will get to see that, but Joe, what's your news for the pits? Well, I know there's a lot of action going out on track. Uh, it's at this time of the race, as you can, boys can probably gather. I'm talking to team principals, and this time I've tracked down Elton Julian, who's the team principal at Dragon Speed Car 81, currently second in LMP2. Elton, it's the standard sort of Daytona cat and mouse at this stage, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, we're all together. Uh, the boys are going awfully fast. Not necessary, but they're having fun and the cars are good. So I think the track's quite good as well. So I think everybody that's out there must be having a really good time. And there's nothing you can really do to influence, uh, you know, there's nothing you can do differently, I should say, that will affect where you are. I mean, you've just got to stick with it. Yeah, I mean, pushing on, for sure. Uh, the pace is high. People, I mean, people are saving fuel, we're saving fuel. Everybody's trying to do their own their own plan, but uh, it's fun to watch, it's super competitive. It's fabulous. Um, what, uh, there's a lot of speculation going into this race about this time of the race, i.e. The, uh, the freezing cold conditions and the cold tires, and we've already seen some green, uh, green flag start out of cautions. Any problems to report? It's difficult. It's, it's it's incredibly difficult. I think what you're watching is a lot of really skilled people make it look pretty easy because it's not. And um, just touching the white lines on the pit exit, uh, every driver is reported. It's, it's absolute like level 10 difficult. But they're so good. The cars are good. The people are good. The tire is good. And I think it's like end of the second lap you're in. It's not that bad, really. 
give, give us give us an idea. I mean, Elton, I, I'm old enough to remember you as a pretty pretty damn good driver. Um, so try and give us a bit of perspective. I mean, just how slippery is it for those two laps? Well, it's funny because I was watching on on the monitor earlier. Also the DPIs, but you watch them go into three the first time out of the box, and it's like watching a car in the rain. You know, they, they intend to get to a place, they don't end up there, and they can just get wash, 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 and it's a calculated wash, but it's like the rain. And, yeah, difficult. All character building, eh? I remember you bit me head off a little more you when I said uh, character building. I'm going to say that every time I meet you. I hate that line. I know you do. <laughs> Thanks for joining me, man. Elton Julian, he doesn't use it that often in fairness, Joe. Apart from every, virtually every interview, it seems, but uh, it's very apt phrase because a race meeting like this, in the main part for most teams, doesn't quite go to plan because you haven't won a Rolex. There will be five teams that do that later today. And at the moment, well, the Cadillac Racing Chip Ganassi run 02 looks to be the strongest car because after an audacious manoeuvre into the Le Mans chicane from Kevin Magnussen on a side you don't often see an overtake, as Bruce quite rightly points out, to the right-hand side of Philippe Albuquerque, came from a long, long way back and decided that the move was on. Caught, uh, well, it shocked Albuquerque off onto the grass briefly, and that's what then uh, meant that Richard Westbrook very nearly snatched second place as well. Albuquerque did well to recover and maintain second. I don't want to paint an even more dramatic scenario, but I'm going to anyhow. Albuquerque actually, when he realised what was happening, had a choice. He could have turned in and we could have lost the top three cars, because uh, right in behind, of course, we had... Uh, you know, Richard Westbrook was yep. there, there as well. We could have locked, because had there been real contact, I think it was clean side on side. So hopefully no damage to either of the cars. But uh, it was a super, super unusual move from Kevin Magnussen. But, you know, throughout his career, he's been nothing if not a pure racer. You know, just a true... A lot of people, I work quite a lot with John Watson, he describes the difference between racers and drivers. Mm -hmm. and Kevin Magnussen has always been a racer. That means give him half a chance, he's going to go for it. And you know where he got that from? Could it have been his father, Jan, who was fantastic? <laughs> and of course, I saw Jan in, Jan in his early years competing in the in the British Formula 3 Championship. And 30 years ago, the driver, the, he was a driver then, he's not now. Elton Julian, who we've just talked to, boss of Dragon Speed, was one of the names in British Formula. 30 years in British Formula 3. That's how long it goes with Elton. He was a teenager back then. But what I love, and again with Wayne Taylor, the depth of racing experience, been there, seen it, done it, now the other side of the pit wall when you have drivers who turn into team chiefs, team owners in, in Elton's case and, and Wayne's taste, I, I love, you cannot buy that experience. It's mm. something they really bring to the mix and you can hear the passion in their voices still. And it's, it'll be a sad day when that ever, ever ebbs away. And so here he is, he's been sitting on the, on the pit wall on the gantry, trying not to be told it's character building for a good sort of nearly 14 hours now. Joe pops up to remind him it is character building, but it's great to have these characters. And great that you can have so much experience behind the wheel of a racing car and then turn your focus within your career to a team management level, but also know what the, the drivers that you have chosen to be in your car to, to, be, to choose to employ, you know um, to be what it's like to be in their racing boots and how difficult this is. Uh, and as, as Elton eloquently put it, these guys look, make it look so, so easy uh, when they are the cream of the crop. These are the best racing drivers on the planet right now. Uh, so it's Bruce Jones and Johnny Palmer in the Haggerty commentary box on RS2 IMSA radio. Let's get straight back to Joe Bradley in the pit lane. I, I just wanted to add a bit of depth to that story. The, the, uh, the comment I made earlier Julian about it character building. There was one year at Le Mans a few years ago when the Dragon Speed team were having a complete fest and uh, I said to him, um, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's character building moments like this. And he looked at me and I thought, you guys know what I used to do for a living. And he struck fear in me, the look he gave me. And he went, anyone who's been in motor racing for 10 minutes has already got enough character that doesn't need any more building. And so from then on, every time I see him, I'll use that term and it really, really annoys him. It winds him up. Uh, yeah, Joe Bradley used to be a police officer, ladies and gentlemen, a cop. He told me he was a bare-knuckle boxer. Oh, well, the story is a good one. He, I think he wants to be, taking on Elton Julian virtually every interview. Um, yeah, so that's uh, set to continue to rumble. Possibly not uh, any more of this race, but uh, in future, where the Tech Sports Car Championship rounds, Elton will be at Le Mans, I'm sure, as well. 
out of uh, speedway or out of turn six and up onto speedway turn one will go a big clump of cars and that involved James Collada not too long ago. He's just streaking away now in the 62 Risi Competizione Ferrari. 1.1 seconds ahead of former class leader Jules Gounon in the WeatherTech Mercedes, number 97. Andrea Calderelli, who has uh, also worked his way up the order to third now. He was fifth, I remember, when we first took over at two o'clock local. So Calderelli, then Ben Barnico, then Matty Campbell, and Imperatore is still there in the number two KCMG Porsche. So again, just worth pointing out, uh, that's five makes of cars, five manufacturers in the top five positions in GTD Pro. It's Mercedes, it's Ferrari with James Collado, Mercedes with Zuguña, Lamborghini, Andrea Caldarelli, Ben Barnico in the Lexus, Matt Campbell and Alexandra Imperatore. Very good. Uh, six seconds apart, but they're in the Porsches, so all to play for. But uh, Caldarelli, yeah, no, he worked that restart very, very well, gained two positions positions pretty quickly. He's trying his best to keep up with uh, Collado and Gunon, but he's two and a bit seconds down, but he does have to keep looking because Ben Barnico just a second and a half in a row. So fabulous mix of cars. You said when we came on it, Johnny, it being through the night, the GT battle was the one that was really mm. always exciting. But look at the front of the race now, it's the P1s. So Collado rounding the Western Horseshoe now, headlights ablaze and uh, a decent margin as he peers into his mirrors back to the second place GT Daytona Pro car. Andy Lally is still leading GT Daytona in the 44 Magnus Racing Aston Martin with 57 running in second, which is the Windward Mercedes and Steve McAleer, car 32 in third for Gilbert Courtoff Motorsports. That's another Mercedes AMG. Just getting to a phase now under green, Joe Bradley, for some stops for the LMP2s. The first car in is the number 81. Well, well, actually, the, the number 29, the Racing Team Netherlands car, has already been in. Took on tyres and fuel. I've got the Dragon Speed 81 just been speaking to Elton Julian. This car's just taking on fuel and saving tyres. Also, the number 10, Car number 10, the Connacht car has also been in. I've just seen that car drive out, so that um, I don't know what happened in that one, but it was a pretty quick stop, so I suspect it already had took on fuel, but um, I'll check that out. But the number 10 in from that lead pack, and that car has been in. Out of sequence with the cars around it, I've noted. Thanks very much, Joe. It's when you look up and down the timing screens, checking the pit stops, and you look at the names of some of the drivers, you go, that guy was racing Formula Renault a year ago, and I'm thinking of Timon van der Helm, young Dutch racer, super young Dutch racer, the G-Drive racing number 69, Orica, he's on board that, but it's, Johnny, we have to keep pinching ourselves, saying motor racing has changed. A lot of drivers, most drivers, seem to start their careers in single-seaters, stay there, and either their career would fizzle out. But now, we've got somewhere their single-seater career hasn't worked, let's say this is 10 years ago, they start moving over to... GTs and prototype racing, now they almost head there directly, and Timon mm. van der Helm, teenager, shifting across almost immediately and making a very, very good fist of it. So uh, and you don't get G-Drive racing, racing, signing someone who's uh, not got the speed. He's obviously shown it in testing. And I think we're living in a time of monumental change in motor racing. And if you're a sports car fan, it's fantastic news. It's got busier now from the DPI class for the pit road because Kevin Magnussen, 0-2, Mike Conway in the 31, Whelan Cadillac and Richard Westbrook in the number five, JDC Miller Motorsports Cadillac DPI all in. But Jarvis happy to carry on for at least one more lap. So that's 22 laps so far on the stint. Yes, there were three laps of yellow at the start of his nearly 40 minute stint. But uh, I just wonder whether the 60 car just being slightly too brave for Meyer Shank Racing with Kerb Agajani, and they will know how much fuel is on board that car. Expecting Jarvis in next time around, though, surely at the end of lap 419. He has a 34 second lead, but that is about to be quashed with Kevin Magnussen expected to go back to the top. There was a driver change for Wheeling Engineering, I'm noticing, as Mike Conway got out and Pippa Dirani steps on board. Well, the good news is that Oli Jarvis made it back round because when you're calculating how much fuel you've got left, you don't deal in fractions of a lap. A full lap is required, and he's made it uh, back in. Luckily for him, for the DPIs, of course, their, their pit uh, garage is, uh, or pit area is uh, very close to pit in, so he had only a short run in. But the 60 car, the Meyer Shank Racing Acura, sitting 
screen being cleaned. In fact, the cars at this point in the race look remarkably clean. You know, we haven't had a lot of dirt on the track. <laughs> Too cold for dirt and certainly uh, no rain. Yes, you get the mess coming off off the, off the brake discs, you, the rotors, you get all the black blackening, but you don't have the smattering of insects and other things you normally get in, a, in an endurance race, which is quite important when you've got a race of which, what, 13 and a bit hours are in the darkness when clean screen is something that's uh, really required for accurate cornering. Yeah, and uh, every other pit stop there or they're about to tear off may be removed so that uh, the cleaning of the screen isn't necessary. You just take all the gunk off in one fell swoop. A big squirm and slide for Jarvis there as he rejoins. That was not even made it back to the racetrack yet. He's on the narrow uh, slither of asphalt, which is the pit lane exit road. Concrete wall immediately to his right. And those white lines that Elton Julian was saying are like ice as well just like driving in the rain for two laps likely for ollie jarvis remember that to magnuson albuquerque durani have already done one of those two so it's still going to be delicate stuff for philip albuquerque who's happy to stay on board for another stint people durani tucked in behind though in fourth position in the wheel and car chasing down the conica minolta acura so, in fact, any time you look at the, uh, the pit exit lane here at Daytona, it's super narrow. And it's the problem is for all the drivers, it's not it's narrow, it's twisting. It's always turning to the left, not in a constant radius. It gets them to the circuit, but patience is required. Ollie Jarvis certainly would be applying that principle this time around. He nearly got bitten not once, but twice with two slight off-track moments. Last time he went out on full cold, cold tyres on this track that is still around the freezing mark. These cars are not made to drive in these conditions. These tyres weren't brought for conditions as cold as this. The drivers have to adapt and they are doing so, but they just have to remember. Red mist, not a good thing to have. Round at the outside of a Mercedes, quite possibly the class leader in the GT, or rather the second place car in the GT segment, yes, for Jules Gounon, that does look like the WeatherTech car with the green uh, door mirrors and the green rear wing end plates as well. That's how side on you tell the difference between a GT Daytona Pro car and a standard GT Daytona machine with the, the panels and the door mirrors being different colours. Very helpful in the daylight, at least. It's more difficult to pick out those segments, though, with this level of ambient light, Bruce. One thing that I uh, just want to pick up on when you go down to the GTD, not the GTD Pro, of course, we've got the two sorts of GTD, but GTD, the driver who's been in every full-blooded round since 2014 of, of the series, Andy Lally, leading the series. But, I, you know, I particularly like the Magnus Racing twist because uh, they, if you follow the teams on Twitter, Lost them are so so entertaining. They seem to come into their old maybe, own. Maybe the cold weather's helping them. But for Andy Lally, he's sharing with John Potter, Spencer, Papelli, and uh, Johnny Adam. And I'm sure if you look at their team feed, I think the fifth one is Monty Python, who's part of that crew. They are so <laughs> funny. I, every year they make me make me smile. Do take a look. But I think we need to open our ears because Joe Bradley has further news. Well, I've got to, got to take a, an opportunity to get a word with Mike Conway for the first time this weekend. But he's getting his layers on having just stepped out of the 31 wheel and engineering Cadillac and uh, he's rather damp overalls I would imagine you're getting pretty cold pretty quickly in this weather Michael um, it's got the look of a 10 lap sprint out there yeah no it's um, a good battle there between uh, the four of us and uh, it's hard to get by the accurates because they got very good exit speed and mid speed top speed is very similar with us but so we seem quicker in the infield but to you know to really get past them is very hard so uh, you've got to kind of be lucky with traffic but um, yeah car's decent I think we just got to look after it from here the next few hours and um, make sure we're good once we get to the next part of the day and how are you finding the restarts with the drop off in tyre pressure yeah tricky it's tricky uh, it's just kind of how much risk you want to take but it was okay yeah hang in there thanks Mike off for a snooze and a nap no doubt a snooze and a nap, eh? Uh, the uh, luxury position to be in once you've done a good segment of the overnight race, and that's the beauty, I suppose, of having, uh, well, the most of the DPI teams electing to enter with four drivers, so your overnight period uh, of off time is increased. The brave guys, though, at Whelan, so this is the car we're actually talking about, just the three for Tristan Nunez, Pipa Durrani has just taken over, and Mike Conway. Three abreast on the run into the tri-oval. 
GT cars absolutely side by side, thundering their way down into turn number one. Now, speaking of the, the five DPIs that are well placed, by the way, the 48 cars back in the race now for Jimmy Johnson. So the only one we're missing is 0-1, and Joe Bradley's managed to catch up with Sebastian Bourdais. Yeah, Seb, the, uh, the all one came in, and it looked like a routine opportunity under yellow to change brakes, alternate belt, but there was more than that. No, yeah, the, uh, the car stopped uh, charging the battery, uh, apparently like 30, 30 minutes prior to the stop. And, uh, you know, as usual, you think, oh, well, the battery took a, you know, stop or the belt fell off the alternator or the alternator is broken or something. But it, uh, it's a little bit more of a headache than that. It's, uh, it's something in the harness and uh, it's going to take a long time to fix. OK, we, I'm we looking at even have the part, so we're the guys are just trying to improvise something. OK, Seb, I'll let you go to bed, mate. Uh, that is really bad luck. Out of contention. Uh, all of these DPIs are in contention have been for what? 13, 14 hours, and it's just sad, but it's that time of the 24-hour race when anything can manifest, isn't it? And like Sebastian Baudet just explained there, it wasn't just an alternator belt, it was something much more sinister than that. I say that because I hate wiring looms. Absolutely hate them. And they don't even have the right parts to be able to replace uh, what's gone wrong. So to be able to fabricate something uh, just to get that car to the finish is uh, a really difficult position for those guys. Mightily experienced team, of course, and used to having to think outside the box in repairing um, not exactly standard parts, but things that can go wrong. James Gallardo from the lead of GT Daytona Pro is in. This should indicate quite a wave, therefore, of pit stops for the GT Daytona Pro class and quite possibly GT Daytona standard as well. So set to get very, very busy. We've had routine stops from the uh, prototypes, 21, 22 laps here and there. A GT car, well, certainly a GT Daytona car, should be able to make an hour. They're not quite on that yet, though, because it's uh, been a lot less than an hour since our previous caution, Bruce. OK, but just take, take a look at the uh, top five runners in the DPI class, of course, the five that are still in contention. They don't have a similar number of uh, pit stops. 31 and uh, 5, that's uh, in reversal, it's uh, Wheeling Engineering and uh, JDC Miller. They've done 22 stops, 24 pit stops for Maya Shank Racing, car number 60, Oliver Jarvis at the wheel, 25 for Philippe Albuquerque, who's running second in the well, Wayne Taylor racing car, the Konica Minolta Acura, but get this, 30 pit stops from the 0-2 crew, the Cadillac racing crew, Kevin Magnussen, all those extra stops, and yet he's still in the lead of the race, 3.6 seconds, 3 .6 seconds to the good over Albuquerque, Pipo Durrani, who moved up into that third place, 1.6 seconds down so they're not all going about it the same way it was how they work the caution periods as well but uh, we always like it as commentators when you have people on the same sequence as everyone else but uh, not on this quite the same sequence in uh, the prototype class but down in GTD Pro just to point it out the first car to blink coming to make a pit stop was uh, the one that had taken the lead of the class in GTD Pro James Collado in now the car's been taken out the 62 Ritzy Competizione Ferrari Davide Rigon has taken over so a good stint for Collado to take the lead but it's now Andrea Caldarelli from Ben Barnico to lead the race why has Jules Gugnon been overtaken no he's just reported to the pits so the 97 WeatherTech Racing Mercedes into the pits have been in contention will still be in contention but it's come to pit stop time as expected, also in from second position in the GT Daytona class is Mikel Grenier in the Windward uh, car, so 57 in as well. The Mercedes AMG, quite possibly a driver change too. Three, four, five, six GT cars all entering pit road together. The WeatherTech cars already back on the move. And as Jules Nuke Gunan came off the main banking out of turn four and swooped towards the pit lane entry road it really unsettled the GT car to his right and there was a, almost a, a dramatic swerve because the sister car, or rather the car alongside which I didn't manage to, to identify was a little bit off put by the late movement from Jules Gounon it was a an outside of the box uh, use of a, a little hook there I noticed to the nose of the 57 car just to 
Maybe take some debris out of the top of the nose there. Was it a hook? For, at a glance, I thought it was an air hose with a, a, a pipe on the end and probably a little... A little um, that would make more sense, yeah. ...trigger, just to squirt it out. With a hook, you'd have to be pretty accurate. You'd be the sort of person that would do very well at a fun fair, hook the duck or whatever. You'd need a camera on the end of it as well, probably. In the dark? Is, well, yeah, it's unlikely. With the so. cold hands. Yeah. But, yeah, the, uh, the, the, the air hose particularly if it's nice and narrow and therefore I'm very highly pressurised, can uh, just make sure that there's no nasty bits of debris trapped in those very large inlets on the top of a Mercedes AMG nose. Now, one thing that Joe, Joe can explain, but when you work the pit lane here in the night, you have pools of light in front of each of the, on the apron and by each of the cars, but areas of the car are in the dark. And, and so the crew, when they check, when we look with the TV cameras and elements, it looks quite bright, but down there it is still remarkably dark. You have patches of shadow, and many a mystery can go unchecked and unnoticed during the pit stop. It was an air hose, in fact, that was uh, being shone down through the, through the gaps in the top of the hood to blast anything away, but the driver's looking underneath. The, the, sorry, the driver, the mechanic is looking underneath, trying to blow something out. Well, maybe Joe can find out, Windward Racing, what exactly were they trying to blow away, and was it successful? Maybe a slightly worrying uh, spike in the engine temperature that they just wanted to um, eradicate and uh, solve whilst the car was on pit road. But it's uh, unconventional use of um, the air hose there that can be normally used to, to blow things like gravel out of uh, the suspension parts of a race car. Very little gravel round here, actually. Uh, you're either in the wall or on the grass of the infield. The number two car, which is the KCMG Porsche, brought in by Alexander Imperatori. Uh, I think it's still him behind the wheel, waiting for those cars to trigger the timing loop at the end of the pit lane to confirm whether there have been driver changes for the 63 and the number two. They're going to rejoin together. Actually, this is the WeatherTech car tucked in behind. And the Porsche also from KCMG, the WeatherTech Porsche, it's number 79, and the number two car, both really struggling, like it's wet, as Elton Julian was saying, on the cold tyres. But good momentum gathered for car number two out of the international horseshoe. And they are about to be stampeded by at least one DPI, possibly a couple. It was Pipa Durrani arriving high speed, and there's a spin for the second of those Porsches. The 79 cars, as said, it was really, sorry, 70, yeah, nine car that was really struggling for the first couple of corners on the infield, and it has rotated into the Western Horseshoe Brews. Alessio Picariello, he, he was mm. the more cautious of the two, having more of a twitch, and coming out of turn three, he got a big twitch. There was a bit of a message being given to him, but again, you don't, your racing driver brain cannot tell you just how cold it is. You can't believe it's as cold as this, but in fact, under braking, he, he left the track, found an access road, which is rather good, to slow him down, and then reversed across the grass, just missed the tail of the KCMG Porsche, and importantly for him, just missed, as he went across the track and to the far side, the tire wall. A half dozen cars came past, but on the small moment, things can turn. Luckily, it was just the Porsche that turned, and the Belgian racer gets going again. He's, he's been a star the last few years in a Porsche, yeah. so it's not driver inexperience, except it is. It's driver inexperience of conditions as cold as this. It might sound like we're banging the same drum, but it is freakishly cold. And having seen the weather reports from uh, the northeastern states, you don't certainly want to be out and driving your car in Massachusetts at the moment. It's horrendous. It's a massive storm, huge snowdrop, two feet and of more of snow. Here it's not snowing, but it's hardly any warmer. In fact, it could be the same temperature, but it is so super cold. And I think really that line from Elton Junin, it's like for the first two laps, you're driving on a wet track. It looks dry, but it feels wet. It's so super slippery. The other thing to bear in mind is that, uh, yes, Alessio Picariello is mightily experienced behind the wheel of a GT3 Porsche. Never done Daytona before, though, so it's race inexperience, quite possibly. He needed to allow the space. There's a tear-off that is making uh, a break for freedom as well on the 79 car as he spun, to give you an idea of the change of airflow as Picariello lost the car. He was trying to make space for Pipo Durrani, who was wanting to thread his way through those rejoining Porsche GT3 cars 
was. He was then on the outside line coming through the left-hand kink on the infield. And out there, even though it's just a lane or two off the main uh, uh, layer of, of main tyre tire wear on the racing line, that's all it took. Very little grip, very little temperature, and the car sweeps around, possibly emphasised by the fact that this is a rear-engine Porsche. Yeah, I, I really think so, and it's sort of cha minor change of direction that any other conditions wouldn't have been a problem, wouldn't have been an issue, and he was a driver fully within his scope, but these conditions are very, very different indeed, but uh, I'm sure he'll, he'll pick that one up, but for Alessio, that car already, the 79 WeatherTech Racing Porsche, off the, pe not the pace of the other, just off the track position of the others, it's had its problems so far in this race, but luckily for WeatherTech Racing, the 97 car, very much in the mix, Jules Gugnon listed at the moment as one, two, three, fourth in class, that'll become third, because Ben Barnicote's just come into the pits in the number 14, Lex us and now back out again but he will drop down the order but uh, it, it is rotating but it's a fantastic battle in GTD Pro. Kevin Magnussen leading by 6.4 seconds and then there's this huge gap of over three minutes back to Pipa Durrani in the third place position. I'm not entirely sure how that has manifested itself. They obviously got caught on the wrong side of something but Albuquerque came in 11 laps ago, Magnussen 10, and Pipa Durrani, Loic Duval, Oli Jarvis, all a, a long way back now. Maybe that's just a sequence of the, or a result of the pit stops being slightly off cycle. We'll give that time to settle down. It was a 137.2 last time around for Pipa Durrani, so very respectable pace. Even better for Loic Duval behind him, seven seconds further back down the road. Right. We were talking about everybody going through the cycle of the GTD Pro class, and it's the turn of Matt Campbell, who'd been at the sort of tail end of that top six, the two porters at the back here, and uh, uh, likewise the KCMG car with uh, Alexander Imperatori at the time. But now the Faf car into the pits and out again, and uh, that is car number nine. Matt Campbell brought it in, and I think Matt stayed on board. We'll see when he uh, crosses the line, triggers the point to have driver ID, but uh, certainly that uh, car in its inimitable colour scheme looking good. So uh, Joe Bradley be heading back down to pit road just as the GT Pro cars have all gone through their cycle. But uh, let's see how that order cycles around. But I certainly fancy Jules Gugnon's car to be back at the front of GTD Pro and also that 62 Ferrari with Davidier Rigon. Let's see which of those hits the front when the order is rejoined. The FAF car out on the exit of turn two from pit exit rejoins the race. I'm going to give you those gaps again in DPI because the timing screen was misleading me purely because we had cars, some of them rejoining from their latest pit stops and uh, just the, the way that some timing screens are scripted, it means that uh, it throws the, the segments out briefly. So the gap from Kevin Magnussen in the 02 Cadillac Racing Chip Ganassi car to Philippe Albuquerque in the Konica Minolta Acura from Wayne Taylor Racing is nine seconds. Slow Porsche at the Western Horseshoe, that's again rejoining after a pit stop for the number nine car, which is a GT Daytona Pro machine. That's Matt Campbell that brought it in. And Mathieu Jaminet has just taken it over, but he has had yeah. the one where the, the, the team chief stamps a message on back of both of their gloves. Slow outlap. Yes. <laughs> with a Lexus right behind, which is the... No, is that the there's a 14 car, so not a race for position. Ben Barnico well, is on the lead lap, though, so it is a it, race for position. It is a race for position, but you know what? Ben barnico has been out for a lap longer or two laps longer. He's got heat in his tyres. Around the outside he goes, and Mathieu Jaminet, every fibre of his body is going, I'm a racer, but I have to remember, what was I told? Cautious on my first two laps out of the pit, so into the... The more chicane they go and out, and already there's a second and more advantage gained by the Barnicot driven Vassar Sullivan, number 14 uh, Lexus, flying around the banking. Jaminet, who has been just a major star for Porsche for about six years now, having to be cautious, dropped two seconds back. He will get it up to pace, but right now he's doing what he was told. This is RS2 IMSA Radio, part of the Radio Show Limited network of channels. It's the 2022 Rolex 24 of Daytona. Another race hour completed. There are 10 hours to go. Here are the gaps in the DPI class. 10.2 seconds separate Kevin Magnussen in the Cadillac Racing 02 
from Philippe Auerkirk in the number 10, Konica Minolta, Acura. Then it's a further seven seconds back to Pipo Durrani, who drives the 31 Whelan Engineering Racing Cadillac in third. Loic Duval, six seconds back. Car five for JDC Miller Motorsports. That's a Mustang sampling caddy. And in fifth place is Ollie Jarvis, car 60 for Meyershack Racing with Kurt Agajanian, a further six seconds back. They're all on the lead lap. And when you combine those splits, just 30 seconds between K-Mac and Ollie Jarvis, they've got five laps on the LMP2 field, which is left, led by Patricio O'Ward for Dragon Speed, car 81 from Guido van der Garde for Racing Team Nederland. Bruce Jones. And Guido van der Garde, who is the faster of the pair? It's three and a half seconds between them, but uh, certainly the Flying Dutchman who, I tell you what, it doesn't matter what he rate races, look at him on the first lap of a race. He loves to overtake. Uh, so he's certainly got his tail up for Racing Team Nederland and uh, in fact, it was Guido who was being uh, asked earlier about the form and the rise and rise of Dutch drivers. I mean, last year was phenomenal for drivers from the Netherlands, obviously with uh, Max Verstappen taking the World Championship, but Renus VK doing a brilliant job stateside and so many others and uh, looking down the order just in all sorts of classes. And I tell you what, if anybody has never been to Zandvoort, fancy a trip over to Europe, come over. It's right on the seaside, a bit like Daytona. In fact, even closer, you can feel the sand blowing off the dunes on the North Sea coast onto the edge of the circuit, which is actually built into the sand dunes. It's party town as well, a great place to go racing. And it's fantastic that circuit has been plucked back up, brought to Formula One level again. And it is just one of those circuits in itself, not the most brilliant circuit in the world, but for the atmosphere and the entertainment, You've got to put it on that list. Come and do a European tour. I think the yin and yang, you've got that, and then just go not a million miles away to up into the Ardennes Forest and spa Frankenstein. I think that's a pretty good pairing. You can get in touch, remember, at IMSA Radio on Twitter, and uh, at Wicker Bill has done exactly that. Um, tweeting a pic picture of the state of Indianapolis right now. It says, Indianapolis uh, Motor Speedway says hi. Stop complaining about the weather, is the suggestion to you and I, Bruce. Uh, be thankful you're running at a different oval because it is probably three or four inches of snow at Indy right now. Well, you know, it's, probably, it's probably because I'm involved, because the one and only time I went to Laguna Seca, there was snow on the mountains in the background, and, and the, the regular circuit commentator there has said, I've never seen that before. I thought, <laughs> oh, well, but I'm enjoying my visit all the same. Thank you very much. Yeah, there's uh, something to be said maybe about uh, English people bringing the weather with them, but uh, it is even colder uh, in the States and in Florida in the Sunshine State uh, than in England currently, uh, with this temperature not set to improve for a good few hours yet. But uh, the sun is shining on Ali Racing because the 48 car is on the move. This is the car that's had a hideous amount of time uh, lost in the pits, but Jimmy Johnson still in the race. This is the one that we thought was the first of the fallers, effectively taken out there was a clash going on the exit of turn two uh, jimmy was clashed with the gt class car they went over the grass uh, across the infield but then it was that slow slow lap limping in that uh, right rear corner johnny was at a an angle of about 10 degrees away from true the tire started peeling back and um, the crew has done a solid solid job but 10 hours to go it's still going but just let's go back a short while to the half distance point in this 24-hour race. The top seven cars, all seven cars in the top class in DPI were on the same lap. It was phenomenal. And then in the next hour, two cars cracked. One was the 48 car that's now back with Jimmy Johnson at the wheel. And the other was the 01 car. And that's down in the, its team garage in 40th position. They're trying to perfect a change. But if you just had a little nap, I'll tell you what the problem was wiring problem at first they thought the car wasn't getting power wasn't getting uh, electrical charge they changed the alternator but the wiring loom which is uh, as anyone knows with any form of a uh, car with lots of electronics on it it's hideous trying to identify what is wrong it's not a quick fix but uh, fingers crossed for the crew from zero one cadillac racing 45 minutes pretty much for the 48 car uh, during its uh very long pit stop and uh, that was from uh, 2.25 to uh, 3.25 rather through till just beyond uh, 10 past 3 so 2.25 just beyond 10 past 3 to be exact and uh, the car has done one more stint since then 20 odd laps for Jimmy Johnson and he stays on board to return to the racetrack 
as I say, many, many uh, laps down. 409 completed for car 48, 20th position. The race leaders in DPI are now onto lap 434. But it's one of those moments when that first stint after a long stop is there going to be another problem that hasn't been identified? But clearly it's, it's run cleanly. So for the 48 crew, all they can do is keep going. That's the crew for Ali Cadillac Racing. It's uh, Mike Rockefeller, Jimmy Johnson, who's at the wheel, Kamui Kobayashi, who was the absolute star in the opening laps of the race, yeah. and uh, Jose Maria Lopez. And uh, of course, for Jose Maria, it's his first experience here. But uh, all those years in the World Endurance Championship with Toyota, um, you know, this is uh, obviously one he's been dying to take part in for years, and uh, now he's got his chance. But unfortunately for him, the gun has been a little bit spiked for the 48 crew. Nearly 14 seconds now for Kevin Magnussen leading the race. Lap time round here is a minute and 35, or actually for the second and third place cars slightly longer than that into the low 138 as they catch gt traffic in the most awkward of areas but it is still 30 seconds separating the top five cars so that's a third of a lap quite phenomenal statistic when you consider we've been racing for over 14 hours now as one of the g-drive lmp2 cars had to uh, slice its way through a couple of gt cars speedway turn one to the left of one to the right of another survives it well, what you always look for, particularly on the, the bank part of the circuit here, is for the prototypes or the faster cars to take the upper line. And unfortunately, trying to go the lower line inside one of the GT cars then led to him trying through the first bank turn to go high to get around the second. And there wasn't a big gap between them, but uh, sharp intake of breath. I don't know if that was uh, Team and Van der Helm. It was certainly one of the G-Drive racing oracles. Was it 69? Or was it 68? But uh, certainly whoever was at the wheel was uh, right on their toes. But Team van der Helm, fourth in class, if it was him, in the number 69 Orica. Running not quite fully on the pace. He had a little little try at Formula 3 last year, but this is still new territory. He did one Michelin and more cup race, I seem to recall, last year. But uh, this is a whole new experience. I mean, racing... Uh, uh, Anybody who comes to Daytona for the first time be hard enough if, if it was in a class of car they were well accustomed to. So Tiemann learning as he goes, he's in fourth place, so that's a good place to be in class. Down the inside of a GT Daytona Lamborghini goes the recovering United Autosports LMP2 car. And a moment or two ago, the 16 Wright Motorsports Porsche had quite a moment as it was being pursued by... Mercedes, possibly the WeatherTech car. So that, they were nose to tail into the Western Horseshoe. And the Wright Motorsports car did indeed lose a place. It was the 57 Mikel Grenier Windward Mercedes, in fact. So not the WeatherTech machine, but GT Daytona standard class rather than pro. And 57 is through and into the lead, Bruce. Into the lead of the class. So clearly the, the, the mechanic with the air hose did a fab job. We saw the replay of, of that a short while ago. And again, it's the sort of ingenuity of pit stops. Little things can just sort problems, or, or in some cases, just prevent them from becoming problems. There's a little bit of something on telemetry it tells you the temperature's too high, too tight high at Daytona. The temperatures are staying uh, rock low at about uh, freezing degrees, but obviously under the engine cover, under the hood, under the bonnet, call it what you will, the temperatures do rise. But uh, for Windward Racing, yeah, what's the advantage in class uh, over Jan Halen? 2.9 seconds, and that was the change of position. 57, Windward Racing was seized ahead of number 16, Wright Motorsport Porsche. Third in the GTD class, Spencer Pompelli, but he's a little bit further back, the 44 Magnus Racing Aston Martin. Again, we've got this fast fabulous mixture of manufacturers and that is uh, set to continue all the way to the finish you would think uh, the beauty of GT racing and particularly in the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship GT Daytona whether it be pro or whether it be the standard class that we've had for years and years and years the balance of performance is even for round one pretty much bang on to have so many different manufacturers all with a shout of taking the win and even more to get a podium out of this the five car squirrels past uh, Jan Halen is now down to second place the five car being driven by Loic Duval for Mustang sampling in their JDC Miller Motorsports prepared car and Duval seven seconds adrift from Pippa Durrani Jarvis last time around wasn't quicker but I think for the for the main part Jarvis is catching the Frenchman um, but it's taking a fairly long time to get within touch and the fifth place DPI car possibly wanting a caution just to 
close up those gaps because it's now over 30 seconds away from the race leader, Kevin Magnussen. The 10 car of Philippe Albuquerque just has to wait to allow a Porsche to go through the Le Mans chicane before picking it off on the exit. Yeah, patience, very much a virtue, but uh, the person who doesn't have patience is the driver leading the race, and that's uh, Kevin Magnussen. 17 and a bit seconds clear last time round. Wait for Philippe Albuquerque in second place in the number 10, Kino Konica Minolta Acura, uh, to go through to see if that advantage has stretched further. I sense it will because, uh, yes, it's gone to 19.4 seconds. The traffic stacked up in front of the Portuguese driver, but Kevin Magnussen rocking the track at the moment. 437 laps on the board, as has Philippe Albuquerque, as has Durrani, uh, now in uh, fourth and fifth places, Lloyd Duval and Oliver Jarvis. Jarvis, yeah, he did it, you're right, Johnny. He gained a quarter of a second on Lloyd Duval, but as we've seen, every lap traffic can be an issue. Now, if you're fans of uh, the Dragon Speed USA crew, it's still their advantage in the P2 class. Patrizio Ward, 15 and a bit seconds to the good over Rui Pinto de Andrade, who's in the number eight entry in the P2 class, which is Tower Motorsport. There's been really at the sharp end of the field as well. But for Dragon Speed and Tower Motorsport, things are looking very handy for them. But Guido van der Garde, you know what? I said he was gaining, but he's just gone into the pits. But he had been in second place in class. That's why awards advantages so much. But uh, Racing Team Nederland, they'll be back out with their Jumbo-sponsored car, yellow and black, and a very well-known on the, the European side of the Atlantic, but big fans of racing stateside, and I believe that's something they're going to be doing a lot more of, and in fact, uh, looking to do more and more IMSA races, if I understand. The Dragon Speed now look to be peeling off to come into pit lane. Yeah, here comes O'Ward right on cue. That was an eight, a 19 lap stint, probably 20 when it ticks over the start finish line. Did 21 on the stint previously, but that did involve two laps of yellow flag, so looking like a 19 and sometimes 20 lap stint that is possible in the LMP2 field. It will be a driver change as well, so Pato Award to step out. And it remains all the wheels are spinning with that car up on the jacks quite, quite a lot, uh, as the advice then is... Uh, I'm not sure whether that was a sticking open, open throttle, maybe, because I didn't think there was a driver still on... Well, still in a position to be pressing the accelerator. I didn't either. It's not the case of don't lean on that when you're climbing out of the car, but uh, yeah. I, I thought he was, he was fully out of the car. But anyway, Thankfully, there is a driver fully in now and being strapped in by the driver who's just uh, got out, so uh, looks under control. But I think well spotted. In certain championships, that's not a good thing to be having. Yeah. We'll wait and see for Dragon Speed. Well, thankfully, the... Uh, the uh, member of personnel that was on wheel gun duty was able to jump clear in time because it's very easy to get a broken wrist uh, if uh, the, all of a sudden the wheel starts spinning out of your hands and yeah, you either get a rapidly rotating wheel gun that's already been attached um, or you can jump clear and avoid disaster and thankfully it was the latter there but the uh, car is back on the move once more and uh, otherwise it was a relatively seamless stop they did lose time we're trying to shut that throttle off, though. The 81 car slithering its way down that narrow strip of tarmac to get back into the race. GT cars thundering through the other side of that relatively low concrete wall. And the 48 car as well uh, up the inside, which is a recovering Jimmy Johnson. So we should be able to get a word with uh, Patricio O'Ward very shortly. 81 car taken over not by award because Joe's just told me he is uh, a couple of feet away from him. It's Colton Herter who now flashes up on my timing screen as the replacement driver. That's uh, a very uncomplimentary uh, way of phrasing it, but you know what I mean. He's uh, by no means a replacement. Uh, he will go just as quick as Pato Award, be assured of that. Now it's suddenly pit stop time, number 10. One of the DP class cars is in. Philippe Albuquerque, that's number 10, which is the Konica Minolta Acura. And number five, Loic Duval. Gosh, those stints have really flown past. He's the JDC Miller Motorsports Cadillac in from second. So, well, into the pits. Kevin Magnussen still leads by over half a minute now for Molly Jarvis. So the number 60 mile shank racing Acura moves up into that second place, but it is pit stop time. Expect Pipo Durana to come back round through into third place into the 31, in the 31 Whelan engineering uh, Cadillac. But it's all about Kevin Magnussen at the moment in the 0-2 Cadillac racing entry. It's been peerless, but he's put it at the front. That is the point with Kevin. 
Now, it'll be fascinating to me to see how long Ollie Jarvis can go into this stint because uh, he did the longest of the chunk previously, 23 laps, but that was helped along by some caution. And now, as mentioned, let's get to Joe, see if he can catch up with the Dragon Speed crew. So, Paddle, it's your first experience of driving in the middle of the night, racing in the middle of the night. What's your thoughts? Oh, it's good, man. Um, you know, I, I've done my, my fair share of mistakes, to be fairly honest with you. Um, it's just, you know, many different rules that that have been kind of caught off guard in a way. But, uh, you know, I, I, I gave the car to Colton in, in first. Not sure if we had a pit lane infraction uh, this, you know, when we came in. But, uh, yeah, it's just, you know, there's a lot going on and uh, there's still a long way to this race. Yeah, you, you, you claimed a little pit stop infraction there, but in fairness to you, you experience all of this. You're not normally getting out of the car in an IndyCar pit stop. So in fairness to you, it's a learning experience. Yeah, we've been having an issue with getting the car into neutral, coming into the box. And, um, you know, first I, they, they tell me, I ah, leave the engine running, so I leave it running. But then they say, ah, you should have killed the engine. So there's. There's just a lot of miscommunication there. It's either we, we kill the engine or you want me to leave it running. It's one or the other. So I, I've learned my lesson now. I just, I, I have to kill the engine because the transmission won't go into neutral when I come into the box. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get it sorted for the next time. Pardo, if you could give our listeners an idea of the differences with this LMP2 car and your uh, everyday office of an Indy car. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an endurance race, right? There's driver changes, there's seat changes. Um, this car is set up for, for the preference of all four of us. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's just... It's definitely way different to, to what IndyCar is like. It's 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 endurance racing, right? So uh, you can take it a bit more chill in in certain areas, um, but it's certainly you know we're we're certainly up against the best. So so that that's interesting what you say. Um, four four drivers equally as good as each other, and is there an element of compromise from each and every one of you so that you get like a medium? Yeah, I mean uh, honestly, we've just given the engineer. Uh, a little bit of our feedback of, of what's going on. But in general, we've all been fairly happy with it. Uh, we all kind of got to a point where it's like, you know what, this is drivable, this is manageable for everybody, and uh, that's what we ended up with. You gonna try and get some sleep now? Uh, yeah, I need some. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Pato. Well, Pato has been at Daytona previously, remember, although uh, rarely in the top class, uh, but has been a class winner. In PC division in 2017. They won the championship actually in 17 as well, but started the year as they meant to go on to for Performance Tech Motorsports with a class victory. But but he's a driver who's been gathering experience. He's had his run in Formula One at the end of last year, getting experience there. And, and I just, I know you're the same, Johnny. It's all about drivers getting as much experience in their career from all angles. And yeah. I, I honestly think, yes, we heard Pato there explaining that he's got to get his head around the rules. Okay, rules can be different, but the driving experience, I really think the more you drive brings more from all angles and makes makes a better end product. And it's not like Pato's got uh, loads of years on the clock. He was born in 1999. I still struggle with drivers who were born in the 21st century. I need to move with the times, because uh, <laughs> certainly some have been born quite deep in the 21st century, but still an old head on young shoulders, but gaining experience and uh, has really done a fantastic job on the North American scene, but in fact, the global scene. And, um, here and now he's having a really good run there for, for dragon speed but yeah it's the rules that often trick drivers and, and you know how many times in the commentary box over the years Johnny, have we put our head in our hands when someone's done a really good job and they get done for speeding in the pit lane you know they've had a monstrous stint they've shaved tenths of a second off every lap they've caught the car ahead they've overtaken it and then they've just thrown 30 seconds out the window how long it takes to come in stop and go penalty and back out and it just makes you almost weep and we're the commentators not the team managers how they feel i don't know but it's about nailing those rules so communication like with anything is absolutely key in motorsport four o'clock in the morning at the daytona 24 hours it's the 2022 edition the 60th running of the rolex 24 and kevin magnuson on lap 442 leads the way Simon Pagano, Simon Pagano is about to cross the line and give you a true gap of those two cars from the Cadillac Racing 02 and the Meyer Shack Racing with Kerb Agajanian in a moment. 
But again, because of pit stops, those gaps can't be relied upon hugely. We're expecting stint lengths uh, as similar as we had uh, in the previous segment, which was all green. Uh, Jarvis actually has uh, Oli Jarvis's car come in. Yes, he has because he's got out of that car as well and handed over. So the third place car now in the hands of Simon Pashina, who drops to sixth place. But Jarvis's stint was another 22 laps where he managed an average of 136.4. That wasn't quite the best. Kevin Magnussen, in his average lap pace, was a 135.7. The only driver of the five that were out at the time to break that 136 margin. Right, I've got a task for Joe Bradley. Joe, you need to work your way down to the TR3 racing pit because not so long ago we were talking about Andrew Cordarelli being in the hunt in the GTD Pro class. He got up to third place in that class, but it's been a long time in the pits. The number 63, the pale green Lamborghini, definitely one of the front runners. We were just enjoying the fact we had five different manufacturers in the top five positions in GTD Pro. But uh, for the, the 63 crew from TR3 Racing, it is a little bit of a problem. Joe, do you have any news on the 63 Lamborghini? No pit garage is here, Bruce. You're thinking of Le Mans. Um, if Sorry, it's been I'm in the pits for a while, yeah. it's not on the air remit, it's uh, back in the paddock. So I'll, uh, I'll catch a bus. I'll go down. <laughs> Join the queue. Join the queue. There's plenty of shuttle buses around here, uh, even at four o'clock in the morning, Joe. Yeah, there is. I'm gonna, I'll head down to their, uh, their pit box and see if there are any um, personnel there. Usually when they have um, a bit of an issue like that, then you find an empty pit box, a bit like the Mary Celeste. Right, I'll check it out, Bruce. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, just a slip of the tongue there. I know full well that you have the pit lane where you just got the pit apron and the, the crews jump over the walls from under their awnings to uh, service the cars and the pit garage is in the paddock behind. And uh, obviously a lap of the circuit is three, three and a half miles or so, but uh, I think Joe covers that every sort of a couple of minutes in the pit lane, particularly when we very helpfully say, do you mind nipping off? Uh, to the paddock to find out what's going on in the pit garages, but uh, just to point it out, uh, the TR3 Racing Lamborghini has clearly got a problem. It was right on the pace, right in the hut, but in GTD Pro, it is Jules Gounod, as I suspected, would, would has, gone, has gone back into the lead in the class. The WeatherTech Racing 97 Mercedes, number 14, is in second place. It's the Lexus from uh, Vassar. That's the Sullivan, and uh, that is Ben Barnico to the wheel. The Matteo Jaminet, just half a second down on him in the number nine Porsche that's uh, been in the hunt all along. The FAF racing, the FAF motorsport Porsche, the one with the red and black plaid front end of the car and the silver haunches. Yeah, very recognisable, even in the night time, actually, uh, under the floodlights of the Tri Oval. And it heads out of turn four, speedway turn four, and uh, through that segment there to whip across the line and put another lap in the books. That's 418 for Barnacote and Jaminet. Dennis Olsen's a further seven seconds adrift. And then Davide Regon in the 62 Ferrari that he's sharing with James Collado at Risi Competizione. Uh, Alessandro Pierre Guidi and Daniel Serra in that lineup as well. Mightily strong, basically combining the two duos from the FIA World Endurance Championship in one car as the FAF car got through there so uh, Jaminet on the exit of the International Horseshoe jumps ahead of Ben Barnico to snatch second position may only be a, a brief spell in front of the Lexus no it's going to stay there though through the second of the horseshoes and now up onto the high banks so Ben Barnico Still within touch of Mathieu Jaminet, but that Porsche looks very strong indeed. Off the slower speed stuff of the infield and back onto the speedway. Now, I like to try and be a nice guy in life, but uh, we won't make, we won't wait until Joe's gone to TR3 Racing. Let him go back to the pit lane and then say, oh, by the way, could you check on 59 Comfort, uh, sorry, Crucial Motorsports, uh, McLaren? That's been in the garage area for a very long time. So, Joe, if you could actually just. Uh, clarify when you get there if that one is one that's been parked the the crucial motorsport the orangey yellow mclaren that went very well early on but uh, hasn't been going since yeah so the uh, actually joe can get us an update on that straight away this is a good response time joe um you remember when we um when we when i first came into my stint that was the mclaren that was having gearbox issues and the uh, team boss was telling us that the decision was about to be made as to whether they could rectify that problem. 
Colby a detective, that might be the case, guys. They might not have been able to get uh, that fixed in the crucial McLaren, crucial motorsport McLaren, I should say. Um, may be a retirement, but I'll confirm that so that you can uh, slash across the marker of doom across that number. Yeah, the process we never enjoy doing, but uh, it has to be done. Um, and uh, there are going to be cars as we work our way through the 2022 edition of the Rolex 24 that unfortunately drift away and will not make the finish as few as possible, ideally, with the 60-odd uh, starters that we had. I always feel that motor racing, from whatever angle you approach it, is about evolution. And I've decided I'm going to have a new scheme. I'm going to bring two colours of marker pens, Ooh. think it's out, and then definitely out. It'll be yeah. it'll be a sort of fading from uh, you know green to red or whatever. I know it sh shouldn't a, be seen together, but hey ho. A marker pencil of doom, and then a marker pen. No, you've got to be committed. All right, okay. Go go with the concept. But I do feel for crucial motorsports, and it is very easy when you're following the heat of the battle. Someone disappears, they fall off the, your timing screen. That's got 40 runners. Of course, we had 61 cars, and um, you sort of forget about them. We're not mean as, as people in, individually, we, but um, you know it is quite tricky to keep on top. That's why we make Joe cover huge, huge distances. Luckily, he's like he's like a gazelle. Even at seven minutes past four in the morning, there was a car stricken on the uh, inside there uh, for the it's turn four. So between turn three and turn four, a car either stopped or going very, very slowly and everybody else uh, was able to sweep by because it was off the racing line. I just wonder whether I could see some yellow lights coming out of turn four, but we're staying green. Race control going to give that car ample time to maybe inch its way back to the, pad to the uh, pit lane. Yeah, wait for replay. It's that moment where you just... Your brain goes, did I or did I not see something that's uh, untoward, out of shape, lights where they shouldn't be? We'll uh, wait to pick it up. What we can tell you is Pipo Durrani is leading the race 31 leading the way, which is the Wheel and Engineering Cadillac by uh, eight tenths of a second from Will Stevens, who's uh, thrown his hat in the ring, a British racer coming to race in the States this year. He's driving the Konica Minolta Acura, just eight tenths of a second between them. And last time around, the gap reduced. So Stevens is having a go. Can it be yet another win for Wayne Taylor Racing? Okay. Nine and a half hours to go. Let's not count our chickens, but you've got to be in the mix, haven't you? And that's the real story. And just half a second further back, Lloyd Duval. So our top three cars covered by 1.3 seconds. This is wonderful stuff with Lloyd Duval in third place for JDC Miller Motorsports. And only 10 seconds further back, Simon Pagano for the uh, Acura entered by Maya Shank Racing. So all to play for. And what's he got on his tail? He's got the 0-2 card. 1.1 1 1 .1 seconds down in fifth place. That's Kevin Magnussen, the driver who in the last hour or so has been the, the greatest attacker. He's getting back up to pace now. Just served a pit stop. Yeah, and I'm looking for other cars up and down the order that had uh, very long lap times uh, last time through. I noticed Kenny Habul in the 75 Mercedes uh, which is the Sun Energy One car, three minutes, 19 seconds for its last lap. So what's that indicative of an issue? Uh, I'm trying to work out whether Kenny was on an out lap, because remember that the on an out lap, the lap time often includes the pit stop. Oh, it's been out for now now. OK, why is it still shown as running on my timing screen then? That car is a retirement, so that's the reason why that was such a long lap. Apologies, coming on duty at two o'clock in the morning has rather gone against me there. Why was there a car that was looking very, very slow on the inside of turns three and four? And which one was it? Still trying to work that out as we get a new fastest lap time in LMP3. Felipe Fraga, new to that class, surely, but uh, lending his Brazilian stock car experience and GTE offerings with uh, Ben Keating in recent years. He's leading the LMP3 class, and that is the new fastest lap of, the, of that division. Yeah, it, it's, it's great when you look at drivers who, who, who race very different machinery, not in sequence, but in parallel. That's been the story all along with his sports car career, racing GTs very successfully. He's been racing in the Brazilian stock car scene, which, uh, if you haven't found that on... on um, on the moving screen, do go and find it because it's it's fantastic stuff. And you find very many famous Brazilian drivers who, if you weren't paying attention, you thought might have retired from their top-line racing careers. They're still competing down there in these uh, space, frame, space frame cars. So Felipe does that, but you know, <laughs> he drives cars very, very fast indeed. And you can fully understand why Riley Motorsports wanted him on board and um, doing a great job. His advantage over Nick Johnson. It's great to have Nick 
gosh, again, that's a racing career that's gone on forever and ever. He's not racing with Tracy Crowe this time, but he's second in P3. And of course, all those decades of experience that Nick's had here in the States, uh, serving the Swede very well indeed. Let's get to, to Joe Bradley in the pits. Our crew chief at T3 Motorsport. We were just speculating why you guys have lost time in the pits. What's the report? Yeah, so we were doing good I mean, for the first half of the race, and we had a few issues, but T3 guys did a great job with getting the car back on track, but unfortunately we ran out of fuel about halfway through that last spin, so they did a great job pushing the car back, getting her back on track, but I guess it's just a makeup game from here on out. So I suppose the good news is it's not too serious. New tank, a full tank of fuel and back out. Yeah, I mean, the car's still running, and uh, it's our first ever endurance race, so I mean, that's all you can ask for, but uh, we came here to finish the race, and that's still our plan. And are you enjoying your first endurance race? I am, but unfortunately I'm freezing and tired, but other than that, this has been an amazing experience. Yeah, crazy, isn't it? Here we are in the middle of the night, we're freezing cold, but loving it. Yeah, I mean, I'm from Florida, and I mean, this is not the Florida I know, so this is a little new to me. Hang in there, mate. It's all about, this is what endurance racing, oops, fell off the ladder. It's all about getting to the end, no matter what. Thanks very, thanks very much, Joe. That was a T3 Motorsport. And if you go for the, find a team with a similar name, look for TR3 Racing, because that was the one I was seeking news of, the 63 ah. Lamborghini. So sort of while you're there, but uh, good to hear from, uh, and again, great to have teams like T3 Motorsport uh, stepping up, uh, an Amer a German team that wants to come playing big time in the States. I'm still trying to piece together what I had seen or thought I'd seen between turns three and four, and there is un an unexplained lap time for Kevin Magnussen. You reckoned he was on an out lap, but he wasn't. He did a two minute 23 he lap. He did. Oh, okay. And there was a two minute 23 lap in the middle of that, uh, which has ramped up his average uh, lap time for a nine lap stint to 141 when those around him, yeah, and there, there's drama. I think this is more recent issue for the one, for the zero two, quite possibly. Or, yeah. Are we going back to now the moment that I thought I'd seen? Yeah, I reckon this was a few laps ago when the car went beneath the double yellow line and rejoined. Thought it was a GT car, I have to admit, but it was Kevin Magnussen, the former race leader, having a hiccup on lap number 446. Since then, it's been fine. A 135.6, a 134.8, a 134.6. There was something wasn't quite right a few laps ago, and I'm pleased now I've got to the bottom of that. Okay, well, it, could it have been an overtaking manoeuvre that went wrong, ended up on the grass, and then you've got quite a lot of infield there to, to be going across and rejoin? That could have lost him. What is he down off the lead now? He's 14 seconds down. And his lap time was about 50 seconds. That pretty much corresponds with all the time he's lost. So he's running fourth in class. He's closing in on Lloyd Duval, who's third in class. You know, I'm never averse to someone having a little problem if they're in the fastest car. They've got to do it all over again and get back to the front. Sorry, yeah. Kevin, but it does make a more <laughs> exciting race. Well, he's got the car underneath him, just assuming that uh, that problem doesn't creep up again. But the fact that the pace is definitely there and uh, the average lap time is almost sub 140 uh, once again. His best lap time on this particular stint, 10 laps of it, was a 134.6, uh, 134.635, which isn't been, hasn't been quite as quick as Pippa Durrani, who was electric out of the traps. Uh, but average speed looking fine again now. So I think you're probably right that it was either an error or getting caught up with some traffic coming out of the Le Mans chicane. And he needs to put that out of his mind as quickly as possible and try and reel in Loic Duval as quick as he can now. Sometimes you can have too much information, sometimes not enough. So you have to try and find the happy medium. But uh, what's great is uh, we're trying to see what's happening on the track. And uh, our amazing army of friends and family uh, can keep looking. And Martin Pearson's just uh, tweeted in saying, just had a skim read of updates. Oh, we have proof. So a moment of, yeah, yeah, I mean, well, they were well talking done. five minutes ago, but there was oh, definitely a car um, the wrong side of the apron, and it was Kevin Magnussen. Well, OK, so well, well spotted. And for the TV crews, you know, it's not an easy job in daytime hours, but to pick up a car with headlights and taillights in the dark in banking in a cluster of cars. But just back to Martin Pearson's point, just had a skim read of updates from Daytona 24. It seems to be lots of alternator issues. Do you reckon that's caused by the first race of the season or by cold weather? I reckon by both, but it is a point because 
these teams, these cars, they're not used to operating in these temperatures. They're not made to operate in these temperatures. And uh, you think in, in lots of circumstances where you actually, um, in the cold of night at places like Le Mans, not that it's that cold, you know, they're having to blank off the radiators, they don't want too much cold, you know, etc., etc. But here, it, you come here, you expect what you expect. Expect, and we just heard from T3 Motorsport, the Floridian, Floridian team chief. He, he's not used to this weather, these weather conditions, but it is going to be the talking point of this race, apart from the race itself, which has been really tipped off. Top three cars covered by, oh, six seconds. And the preparation was far from ideal coming into race weekend itself with a lot of the free practice sessions affected by rain and low temperatures. But to Phil Hansen, uh, I remember being interviewed I think by Joe, uh, to say that, that really these sessions were pointless as far as ac accumulating data were concerned because they couldn't use any of it. They knew that the race was going to be dry, but really cold. Um, and it was a question of staying out of trouble as much as possible. Yes, putting some mileage in as Kevin Magnussen is delayed again into the Le Mans chicane, uh, not through any fault of the GT driver. That was an Aston Martin, I think. I think it's the Magnus Racing Class challenging yeah, it's car. Mercedes, yeah. Or is it? No, it is an Aston. I think it's the, the Magnus Racing Car. So yeah. that's obviously, as we mentioned earlier, Monty Python, the secret driver, <laughs> the driver who never was doing the night stints out there on the circuit and uh, getting lots of flashing from behind the Ritzy Competizione Ferrari uh, keen to be at the sharp end of the field again in class but actually at this point in GTD Pro is down in fifth place the class being led by Jules Gugnon the 97 WeatherTech Racing Mercedes uh, just uh, seven and a bit it's a good stint from Gugnon seven seconds clear of Mathieu Jaminet the the number nine Faf, Faf Motorsport Porsche third place in cars Ben Barnico so that's been a change of positions quite recently uh, he's in the Vassar Sullivan Lexus that's kind of a 14 third in class managed to uh, grab the number now it's actually the heart of racing team Aston Martin so car number 27 with Tom Gamble at the wheel and just uh, looking like it's struggling a little bit for traction coming out of the international horseshoe but also needing to make way for the faster prototypes that wanted to get through as well. Tom Gamble in class is quite a way down from the GT Daytona leader who is still Michael Grenier for the 57 car we reported on the Windward Mercedes taking the lead from the right motorsport uh, Porsche. He's about 10th in class I think. Okay yeah well he can still do plenty from there He's got a couple of pro cars actually just ahead of him that aren't ahead of the GT Daytona lead because Augusta Farfus in the 25 BMW and Nicky Katzberg in the number three Chevrolet Corvette are working their way back from difficulties earlier on in the race. There will be a driver change in the Ally 48 uh, DPI as we get this news from... Let's get this news from Joe Bradley. Yeah, Bruce, what was the mission at TR3? You want to do, uh, know what the problem was that cost this car some time? Yeah, yeah, basically because they lost a lot of time. They were third in class and suddenly they weren't. Had a long time in the pit garage. Right, OK, I'm, uh, I'm about to ask the chief engineer then. He's just, he's actually on the telephone. And not an all-style telephone, an iPhone, I think. But he's on the telephone to somebody. So, um... When I, uh, when I get a chance, when he's off, when he's finished his call, I'll ask him the question. What was the number of the car? It's a Lamborghini, isn't it? 63. Yeah, that's the one. I'll uh, just wait for each call. I'll give you a shout. It's their green car, not the, not the red car. The red car is in the GTD class. That's uh, the number 19. It's the 63 that was at the sharp end with Andrea Cordarelli in GTD Pro. And uh, the red... Uh, background to race numbers, remember, tells you that the car is in the GT Pro, GT Daytona Pro class. Green race numbers and in green, indeed green panel on the rear wing end plate, green door, green door mirrors. Whilst I str struggle to speak, uh, let's get to a man that's much better at it. Here's Joe Bradley. Just wanted an idea of what caused the 63 so much time in the pits. It's an initial incident I had with the Aston Martin and the Mercedes that it was squeezed against the wall coming out of turn six. Unfortunately, it uh, bent the front tie rod as well and uh, gave up. So uh, we're seeing if we can get it fixed, but it's uh, we're a, bit, a few laps down now. And so. and, uh, it's, it, I take it it's a big job. It's going to cost you a few laps. It's all about getting to the finish. 
Yeah, correct. You know, we're already quite a bit laps down, so, you know, racing's racing, and uh, they're trying to do their best, but, you know, the race is almost over for us at this point. Thank you. Cheers for that. Let him get back to his call. He broke off in his call there to give us that update. But it's uh, that was very good of him. It's it's very Daytona, isn't it? It's um it's a very frantic race. It's a 24-hour sprint, and there's no get, there's nothing gained on and lots to be lost in situations like that. Yeah, there really is, and I, and I think it also comes with experience for the Romanelli uh, brothers of TR3 Racing. You know, it is still a new experience, and and. I think what makes it hard is the disappointment because they, they weren't just doing averagely well. They were right in the hunt for GTD Pro class honours there. So it's almost worse when you've got something not in your grasp, but certainly within your capabilities. And uh, with the driver lineup they had in that green Lamborghini, Marco Mapelli, Andrea Cordarelli, Mirko Bortolotti, absolute megastars. Rolf and Eichen has raced with them for years as well. Very quick too. That was a car that could and potentially should. And it would have been one of the major stories if TR3 Racing could have won the top GTD class here on, on their class debut but mm. uh, yeah that, that body language and shoulders down could you just feel it as uh, Joe was being spoken to and he didn't even get to mention character building in that one so no uh, well uh, it was uh, they'd already covered that ground I think by the tone of the interview uh, realizing that uh, this race is one to be forgotten for TR3 but they will be very grateful for uh, the experience gained an awful lot of staff I'm sure coming across from Grasser to be part of uh, that crew as well not least the drivers so uh, they they will have some experience in their ranks but wanting to get a good result for the first time for TR3 and um, while in the commentary box, the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre, you can point out that the temperatures are quite comfortable. We know for the track workers, for the pit crews, it's cold out there, but I've just heard it's not freezing. It's minus one now. It's minus one in centigrade, so we're down to 30 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm not making it up. This is unbelievably cold for Florida and for the Daytona 24 hours. It's another factor, but as we've seen, Johnny, on quite a few occasions, if a driver forgets how cold it is when they get into a warm cockpit, and they think their tyres might have some grip when they leave the pits, they do not. They have to warm them up over several laps, cautiously trying to find that point at which you could possibly start changing direction in the car. Pippa Durrani leading the motor race to the high side of at least one GT car. There's going to have to be two lapped in this one movement. But Durrani with no need to look in the door mirrors quite yet. A 3.3 second lead over Will Stevens, who was 0.7 of a second slower than the Brazilian that time around. 36.5 uh, was Will Stevens' effort. So. Uh, no, near enough level pegging actually. 3.3 seconds becomes 3.2. But Loic Duval applying the pressure now to the rear of Will Stevens' Acura for Konica Minolta and the ARX05. So that is the next part of this battle that is going to develop is uh, Brit Will Stevens trying to hold back the very quickly advancing Loic Duval. Yeah, Loic Duval going out of turn three, very happy to get on the power a bit earlier than Will Stevens. That gave him an advantage. He's now on the right-hand side of the track as they approach turn six. Of course, it's a double left-hander, but he ducks down the inside and seems as they go onto the banking two of... Hasn't got the job done yet. His nose is in front, but the higher line should be the slightly faster line out of the corner. Will Stevens hanging on. He's up near the concrete wall at the top of the track and down near the yellow lines on the inside with the GTD, the FAF Motorsport Porsche. They passed either side and uh, no one's lifted off the throttle, but certainly for who's in the FAF car. I'll check that in a second. It's Matteo Jaminet. He must have thought, please, guys, behave. <laughs> I'm driving as fast as I can. Kept out of their way somehow, but going into and out of the Le Mans chicane, it's still Will Stevens in second place. Just three seconds down on race leader Pipo Dirani but Lloyd Duval is having fun, but he wants that place, and I think he's going to get it at this rate. That was very entertaining indeed to see two expert sports car racers with Loic Duval, a decision to make. Do I keep the throttle in or do I just blend out of it so I can get safely round the number nine uh, FAF car? 
and down into turn one out in the dusty conditions almost certainly the marbles there at turn one for Loic Duval he still found good speed off the corner though in the Cadillac and it was fascinating to me that to, to observe the drag race through speedways turns one and two the Acura looked like it had the edge and now the Cadillac is coming back into its own on the infield but only the outside line shown for Loic Duval through the kink so good driving and good positioning of the car from Will Stevens not allowing the five car the crucial inside line Line through that uh, sequence of tight and twisty corners on the infield. Again, Will Stevens edging the five to the outside line. So Loic Duval is going to have to do it the hard way if he's going to get through. Although the outside inside trick should work this time with the Frenchman and he's passed. It just seemed to my eye that, uh, particularly on the infield, that uh, Loic Duval had a bit more grip in the number five JDC Miller Motorsports Cadillac. He's made it stick, but again, taking the high line is slightly faster for Will Stevens, so he's half a car length behind. He's now quarter of a car length. His nose in front, they go past the GTD car, but what comes next? The Le Mans chicane, you've got to go left and right, so Will Stevens has to back out of it. Second place now, firmly in the hands <coughs> of Loic Duval, but again, just at the wrong moment, they find another GTD class car, and that allows a slight lift uh, for Lloyd Duval and Will Stevens has got a bit more pace coming out of the chicane and accelerating around the banking. Of course, Johnny, here you accelerate for a very, very long time. They're side by side as they're going to take the left hand kink onto the start finish straight. Straight line speed is all with the Acura here because at times when it looks uh, dead and buried in third position, it comes back again on the high line to Lloyd Duval. Now that the Cadillac, though, will lead this time onto the infield, I can see that the Cadillac will start to stretch its legs because it is really good out of the slower speed horseshoes the Western horseshoe first of all just has to compromise its exit very slightly because of the WeatherTech Mercedes or is that the 57 car I'm struggling to tell the difference between those two in the darkness I think it's the it's WeatherTech car with the two yes yes it is, it is you're right um, and that car then sensibly staying to the outside line being driven by Patrick Assenheimer in the number 15 car uh, a number of times taking NLS victories in the last few years. Patrick Asenheimer, a real expert around the Nürburgring Nordschleife, but I think has run here at least once before too on a very different racetrack. Yeah, just to explain, NLS stands for Nürburgring Langstrecken Series, and just to point out what that might mean, it's uh, long distance races. They have eight of them each year, and traditionally they've been three hours, occasionally with a four hour and a six hour, but this year they're going to have double up, and there's going to be 12 hours of racing in one of those. And mm. uh, again, bucket list, people are supposed to have them in life, why not have them? Go and race on the Nürburgring Nordschleife. You don't have to be in the top GT3 level car, you can race pretty much anything. Take a look at the rules, go and look on their website, it's uh, certainly a great deal of fun. But this is fun here too at Daytona, much, much higher level overall, of course, with the prototypes at the front of the field. But uh, that little battle, it's Will Stevens in second place, got back ahead of Loic Duval by 16 thousandths of a second on, the, on as they crossed the start finish line. But they're nearly five seconds down on Pipo Durani. They're matching his pace, but of course, they're slightly slowing themselves down as they tussle. But uh, for Will Stevens, he, he weathered that storm. That little NLS explainer uh, provided me the opportunity to look at Patrick Assenheimer, who's actually making his Daytona debut, so my mistake, he hasn't been here before. The 32 car is now off the road and into the grass at the Western Horseshoe, but does manage to recover at uh, a much slower speed, so that is the uh, Gilbert Kortoff Motorsports Mercedes, which is being driven by James Davison, was third, now running in fourth position as a result of that mistake and uh, will take a few corners of course to clean the tires on the infield but 32 back in the race as we head to the pits and joe jules going on just stepped out of the 97 weathertech mercedes jules uh, you're in contention but um are you happy you don't look very happy what's you don't look very happy what's money yeah we just had a problem at the pit stop. One mechanic forgot to change the wheel, so let's hope we can do a double stint with the tire now. Um, to be honest, the, the car is feeling good. We are saving fuel because it's our only way to fight against Ferrari. They are really quick, and it's uh, well. They found it a good setup between the roar and doing 47, and now doing 45-1. So it's good for them. But uh, yeah, nine hours to go. We normally we. We never give up, so we're going to try our best with our package and see what we can do with. Is the tyre a major concern? You know, how worn was it? How, how much was it given up on you? 
Yeah, it's really, really difficult to, to bring them to temperature and, uh, you know, you need to really be careful on the first out lap. And after even 10 laps, they are still not so warm. So it's uh, 4 a.m. also, that's why it's quite difficult. And hopefully uh, by the beginning of the morning when the sun comes, it will become a bit easier for us. Thank you, Joe. So 10 laps, guys, and the tyres on. Up the pressure, it's the pressure that yeah. counts, you know. Uh, uh, the temperature increases the pressure of the tyre, and every a race tyre has an optimum pressure to run at. And if you never get there, then the car is is not balanced. And that's what Gilles was trying to say there. Even after 10 laps, minus one temperatures here. Um, and it, it, it's a problem, but it, you know what? It's a problem for everyone. And it's accumulative, or rather reverse accumulative, if you like, so that if you start to descend, you know, rather than climb that pressure chart, you're actually just tumbling down it and you go off the edge of a cliff eventually because it never gets to that point. And really fascinating to know that it's some cases, 10, 11 laps into the stint, you're not quite there. Will you ever get there? Because a, a stint length time of a, a GT car is 26 laps. So if you're spending over a third of that chasing tyre performance, very, very difficult to do. You know, I'm really surprised, John, we haven't seen more cars going off. And I, we just saw James Davison off very briefly in uh, the Gil Gilbert Kortoff Motorsport Mercedes. I'm sure that was absolutely encapsulating uh, that element, just still not quite getting heat in the tyres. But it's always good to hear from Jules Gunion because he says it like it is. He has a huge amount of emotion. I, you know, I was around in the days when his father, Jean-Marc, was racing and got, got to Formula 1, but in Formula 3000, he was one of my go-to interviews because he just would get out of the car bubbling with enthusiasm, fantastic English. But, you know, that has been passed down to Jules. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he's got quite a record. He's, he's won the Bathurst 12, he's won the Spa 24 Hours, he's won the ADAC GT Championship, but he's always a contender. Here he's still a contender, but imagine being the mechanic who just failed in one little item of the, on their job list, which was to change a, change a tyre. That must, you know, in normal weather conditions, but these are freak conditions, it would be bad enough, but in these freak conditions, that must have just made a difficult, difficult job all the more unbelievably hard in the darkness. Most of this race, 13 hours of the 12 hours of the 24-hour race in the dark here at Daytona. 21 laps done for Will Stevens, who comes into the pits, Joe Bradley, in the number 10 car. You watched that stop. Yes, it was a very, very efficient stop, as you would imagine, with the Conagher Minolta Acura team. Uh, fuel and tyres. And the great thing is that the IMSA regulations allow the cars, allow the drivers to wheel spin off the apron, which is not only spectacular, but very, very beneficial in these cold temperatures. They get a little bit of heat into the rears by spinning them up. And the drivers have been really, really exaggerating the way they run off, the, the, the way they pull away. And, uh, and next door is the number 14, Vassa Sullivan Lexus. That's just coming to a halt, listen to this. And now I can't see for tyre smoke. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Right, Joe, thanks very much. You've always got a nose for a story, and also it's a thermometer in many ways, I guess. But um, all thought it's below freezing at Daytona, but what happens before dawn? You've got under three hours until uh, till dawn. We'll forget frost. Might be interesting to find. Uh, I'm not joking here, but that's the time the frost will fall. Yeah. But, you know, did Michelin think about that when they were assembling their tyres to, to get them over here? If there's any chance we could get word from a, a, a tyre specialist, have they brought any studded tyres? Should it snow? But no, I mean, it, I'm not being flippant here. The thought of frost on a racing circuit is, is really quite an issue. And uh, it's bad enough if you get on the grass anyhow. But if it's got a frosted layer on top, well, it's great fun at home in your paddock, but not when you're out here. Monte Carlo Rally last weekend, some of the stages high in the mountains were probably two tenths affected by snow. The rest was completely slick and dry and a big question mark as to which tyres you used for those stages. If you went with the slicks, you just had to live with the lack of grip and the low temperatures. Uh, then, I mean, you can't use wet weather tyres around here because it's, it's, it's um, completely dry, but the tyre window for temperature and pressures, as we've been saying, you can throw that out of the window, literally. So um, the 
difficulty here for the various teams, not only on the outlap, and we're used to that, uh, extended now to as many as 10 laps. There was a change of position there, I noticed, for Pippa Durrani getting up the inside of Alex Lynn, who was rejoining in the 0-2. Alex, yeah, rejoining, having just taken over from Kevin Magnussen. So, but again, you see, that, that was interesting, because that pits, that lap time was 2 minutes 25. Remember, we had that one of 2 minutes 23, so that could have been considered uh, when Kevin Magnussen had his moment when he was off the track. Of course, that equals a, a pit stop, so it wasn't a, an unusual thing. So, Joe, just uh, what's happening down in the pits? Just hearing a quick buzz from you. We've got the number 60, Mayor Shankar, in again. Same as the number 10, got it in the car. Tyres and fuel only. We're about to drop it off the jacks. And I can see a wheel nut, a big, huge wheel nut, right in front of the left rear tyre, so I'm going to start her out of here. Ah, gets fired into the pit wall, so we're all right. That was like a bullet coming from beneath that tyre. I saw that happen, and I thought, no, nah, need to get out of the way, Bradley. Uh, that car's back in the race. Good stuff. I'm glad you're OK as well. Dodging uh, various implements uh, in the uh, pit lane because it's a working area, remember? Um, not only for all of our mechanics, but for Joe Bradley and the rest of our pit reporting crew as well. But it's all about being or knowing uh, where the best place to stand is to get a good view, but also not to infer interfere with each of these pit stops. Bruce? I, I'm just being told, in fact, uh, to answer a question put to us by Dave Alcock, one of our, our regular tweet correspondents was... We had a comment from Michelin who was saying actually they don't think out on the track frost could become a problem because of course unless you go off the track the racing part is being used the whole time this should be that should be cleared it'd be in the pit lane so let's hope Joe's got the right sort of traction because we're going to make him up work up and down the pit lane to the paddock behind to find any cars that have fallen that is the likely area according to Michelin where any it seems bizarre to be discussing this there could be could be frost in the pit lane at Daytona another little tweet that I just found quite interesting it's just come in from uh, Laurent Mercier saying um, right this year Jules Guignol He's already competed the 12 hours of Abu Dhabi. Last weekend, uh, recently, was the 24 hours of Dubai. This weekend, the 24 hours of Daytona. Then he's doing the nine hours of Kailami next weekend. I'll be commentating on that. And then the four Asian Le Mans races. So 85 hours of racing in the course of two months. Thank you, Laurent. Merci. That is quite a statistic, isn't it? Um, yeah, and just shows you how much you can go racing out of season these days as well with so many... Uh, races to kick off the year. I'm also picturing Joe Bradley the next time we throw to him with a couple of tennis rackets strapped to his feet uh, to deal with this frost, this incoming frost. And we've gone caution, I notice. Caution is out for another time. This will be caution number 20, uh, number, number 13 rather, and we've had 70 laps under yellow flag conditions. Well, big incident. Is there a car on fire behind the scoring tower? There's an awful lot of black smoke, a plume of it, coming from an unidentified car to this point, and the response crews are very quickly arriving. Ray Wenzel Jr., who is looking after things, as he always does so well, Rooftop Ray, says, yes, a fire has broken out in a car. So we're talking about how cold it is. It is red hot at Turn 1. Joe, did I hear your voice from the pit lane looking to looking to, to cut in there? Uh, no, guys, I can just see the smoke coming across the uh, the pit perches as much as you can. And uh, I just saw Rooftop Ray giving us the, literally the nod with his camera to say, yeah, we've got a car on fire. So um, safety crews already on site, very efficient here at the uh, Daytona Speedway. So I'm pretty sure that that's going to be rectified pretty quickly. Thanks, Joe. We'll try and work out who that is. And something for you to do a little bit later, if you could find out what exactly it was that delayed Kevin Magnussen when he lost the 40-odd seconds in the 0-2 Cadillac racing. Well, Cadillac, obviously. Um, a short while ago in that last stint, Alex Lynn has just taken that over. That's running in fourth, but that, that's one of these little mysteries we uh, would like to clear up. I don't think I ever mentioned uh, Rooftop Ray's tweet from earlier on who, when he said he's having a great time on the roof, obviously, at Daytona, but uh, admittedly, it is a bit chilly. Many layers of good winter gear. Oh, yeah, and hand and toe warmers are in action. Well, 
uh, maybe getting a bit of heat from uh, said fire. And we're not focusing on that just yet, just to make sure that everyone is OK down at turn one. And uh, the car awkwardly placed from our vantage point right behind the scoring tower. So very tricky to work out exactly which car is involved. And uh, it might be more than one, not uh, suggesting more than one is on fire, but uh, there could have been a, a, a collision into turn one affecting somebody else as well. So caution is out. We're 44 seconds away from another race hour being completed. This will take us to 15 hours done, therefore. Nine still to go. And uh, hearing that it is the number, possibly one of the LMP3 cars uh, that uh, has become stricken down at turn number one. A few tweets coming in about that. You're tuned to RS2. IMSA Radio, part of the Radio Show Limited network of channels. This is the 2022 edition of the Rolex 24, live from Daytona International Speedway. Another pause in proceedings for the 13th time. The caution is out, but we had a good chunk of green there. Uh, possibly the longest of the race so far. Yes, that is confirmed. Uh, an hour and 47, nearly 48 minutes of green flag running. We've come close to that with an hour and 44 as the second spell of green, way back in the second or third hour of the race. And after a couple of cautions, then we had a good hour and 40 running, which is a, a number that's easy to remember because an hour and 40 is the length of time that the qualifying race ran and a regular length of race in the more traditional IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship rounds. But an hour and 47 bringing out before we get to caution number 13. And obviously the clock is running now on that as well. 71 laps run under yellow. That leaves 393 laps that we've had at full race pace. We're on lap 465. Piper Durrani leading from Loic Duval. Will Stevens, Alex Lynn and Simon Pagino. So it's uh, Wheel and Engineering from the Mustang Sampling sponsored JDT Miller Motorsports car. And those longtime sister cars run out of the same outfit, of course, but now very much separate entities running first and second. And the best of the Acuras is in third in the hands of British driver Will Stevens. Let's get to Joe Bradley, who's found Mike Shank from Mike Shank Racing. Mike, your number 60 car came in there just uh, before that caution period. Will that, will that be an advantage to you? No, no, no. It just the way the cycle worked out, and then there happened to be a uh, yellow right after that. So. All right, so it's not going to matter. OK. I was getting all excited for nothing. That was a good question, boys. wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Worth asking, nevertheless. Uh, Maya Shank racing with Kerb Agajanian, straight to the point. But uh, always good to have a, an economical answer like that because we will very shortly have pit stops to talk about and plenty of them. The repositioning of cars is being done, first of all. And I noticed that the, the line through turn one is fairly traditional so they're not having to take avoiding action around this what we think is a stricken LMP3 car no the, it seems sufficiently far off the track and the big question was that was that something that just went straight on or was it something that came out of the pits we're still trying to guess which it is we don't want to guess we're trying to work it out but uh, one of the likely candidates appears in the P3 class to be the number 747 Motorsports Duquesne and the driver at the wheel of that is Anton Ducroix. I'm just waiting to see if if he doesn't clock up another lap then it's more than likely it's his because it's out on the circuit but it's currently listed as 425 laps on the board. Class leader Felipe Fraga has got 444 so clearly it's had its problems so far but uh, that as I do my rudimentary detective work could be the car that uh, uh, caught fire down at turn one but we will wait to see for sure. Dave Alcock drawing my attention to uh, a tweet from our very own um, Gearbox girl, Shay Adam, who indicates that Ducat is out of the car and safe. So that's the best possible news we could have had from that situation. Um, fire extinguishers presumably still in action, though, to temper this fire and made an awful lot easier now that they can really attack the fire itself, knowing that uh, the driver is OK. Let's hope he hasn't gulped in any uh, nasty... Uh, black smoke, but there was certainly plenty of it pouring from the stricken car. 
And good morning to Jake Parrott, listening from Virginia, saying, uh, literally writing a tweet to ask for a countdown timer check. And uh, I reminded everybody, or rather uh, uh, told everybody, that there was nine hours still to go. So pleased to be of service there, Jake. Hopefully you're on board now for the duration. Good morning to Jamie Peters Ennis as well, who I think has done an overnight stint. So um, back in the UK at quarter to 10 in the morning there. We're approaching quarter to five in the morning here in Florida. Minus one degree Celsius, feels like minus four, and frostbite may be about to attack as well. But uh, it is an interesting point that a few of you raised that so because we've got so many cars still pounding round, very, un, uh, very unlikely to get any frost settling on the racetrack. But if uh, we have a few, a few uh, squirmy moments where cars end up on the grass, it could be very, very tricky indeed to rejoin or indeed arrest the speed into either of the two horseshoes. Two cars pitting together, Joe Bradley. Who have you got? Got the 02 Cadillac Racing car that came in and the 60 Mayer Shank car that had already been in. I just spoke to Mike there, no, no advantage off pitting and getting the full tank of fuel. They bet they would they squeeze the last, last bit of fuel they could possibly squeeze into that 60 there. It's gone back out. The 02 just left the pit box now after a little bit of a fix on the left hand door. Don't know quite sure what that was, bit of tape applied. Fuel hose detached from the 48 as well, so that will head back into the race. But uh, a couple of DPIs, we've had as many as five LMP2s all in together. So Colton Herter, James Allen in the 81 and the 69 first and second place cars. Uh, 81 being the Dragon Speed car and the 29 is the racing team Nederland Orica also in the that's 69 car, so car 69, the G-Drive racing by APR machine. So that's the James Allen machine from second. Also Rui Andrade for the Tower Motorsport crew, bringing his third placed LMP2 in as well. And there's an LMP3 on in the lane. That's the 33 machine, which is the Sean Creech Motorsport car being driven by Malta Jakobsen and in from fifth position. Felipe Fraga staying out for the time being, still hanging on to that fastest lap of the class, which he set probably an hour or so ago. And there are still four or five intervention vehicles parked around the LMP3 car that Antoine Ducat was driving until it spectacularly expired. I'd be very surprised if that car... No, it, that car is out of the race. I was about to say, I'd be very surprised if it returned. But a sorry state it takes with the engine cover off and now at now a very peculiar angle, but covered in fire extinguishment. Not sure what happened there. I don't know whether I've ever seen an LMP3 car go up quite as quickly as it did, uh, Bruce. Well, I don't know. I mean, the good news, it's moving. The bad news, it's on the back of a flatbed being yeah. brought back in. But I uh, didn't see the incident. All we saw was the, the dark smoke in the dark night. And for Anton Duquat, not the way the 17-year-old Frenchman wanted... 17, I still find that a struggle to be competing here. And he's, he's quite old in comparison to Josh Pearson, who I understand is still 15 before he starts his... Uh, full World Endurance Championship campaign. But yeah, unfortunately for the number seven crew, their PC race come to an end for 47 motorsports. Big disappointment, but uh, you can be sure they'll be back because uh, once bitten, this is a race that uh, particularly with a race as it is at this point in its time, in this really high point in Daytona history, look at the quality up and down in the field. If you're involved, you're going to want to come back and do it all over again. Just do it better. Antoine's been racing with Josh Skelton in the uh, Michelin Le Mans Cup last year, which supports the European Le Mans series uh, to six locations in Europe. And actually, they took a race win at the mighty Spa-Francorchamps in the penultimate round of that season. They don't go to all of the ELMS races because of the two Road to Le Mans events that support the great 24 hours of Le Mans, one midweek and one on Saturday morning of the big race. So it's a great support package to be on. And, uh, yeah, they, uh, they did well, generally. I think they had more speed than their results uh, displayed at times, but they did at least get that to one race win at Spa last year. 99 Porsche is now on pit road as well. So this is uh, one of the first of a number of GT pit stops for both the Daytona 
and the Daytona Pro class. Stefan Wilson bringing the 99 Porsche in from the Daytona class for Team Hardpoint. Yeah, the car looks in remarkably good shape. Just touching back on the, the Michelin and the Mall Cup, but particularly the road to Le Mans, it's been a phenomenal success in the last handful of years because um, hands up who doesn't want to compete on the uh, full Lasarth circuit. Yeah, no one in that queue. Hmm. Um, and it's just actually for a lot of, lot of young racing drivers, it's given them a chance to race alongside someone who's a little older in years, but has got, has got the money to go racing. And who knows what that springboard is, is going to go. And for some of the people that go to compete in it, they, they've always wanted to drive at Le Mans, would love to race in the 24 hours but that could be the moment that either proves they've got to try and do it or really they're bitten off more than they can chew but it's always intriguing gets slightly lost sometimes we're all focused on the 24 hours in june but uh, for a lot of people it's been quite pivotal in their racing careers whether going up or going down but uh, it's always intriguing and um you can be sure for the likes of anton duquay it's it a stepping stone and he will step on to bigger things Back on the move is the number 15 WeatherTech liveried uh, Mercedes. So that's the car from the Daytona Pro class for Proton USA. Patrick Assenheimer had bought that car in. Need to work out whether there was a driver change there for the 15 car. That will be revealed very shortly. Mathieu Jaminet still leading the GT Daytona Pro class from Kyle Kirkwood's Lexus. So Jaminet in the plaid Faf Porsche, number nine. Then Kirkwood's Dayglow yellow Lexus from Vassa Sullivan. David A. Regon running third for Risi Competizione in their Ferrari. Uh, and again, this great mix of manufacturers. So tricky to call who's going to be in the best position in eight hours time and running into that final stint for the GT cars. Yes, of course, uh, the race doesn't end at the top of the hour. It ends at quarter two. Don't get caught out by that, thinking I've got another 15 minutes. To, uh, I've got another half hour to go, and you nip off to get a little snack before the end of the race, and then they wave the chequered flag. Right, so it's a quarter two. Just remember that. that uh, quarter to one local time in Florida. Still a few course vehicles working their way around. Oh, yeah, we have a car being towed in. Just trying to take a look. No, they're cleaning up the track. They're mm. cleaning the track just on the edge of the chicane, one of the few places. In fact, you made a good point, Johnny. Most circuits, you've got gravel all over the place from people coming out of gravel tracks and rejoining and very kindly leaving gravel for other people to get to. But here at Daytona, you know, you don't have it. You have grass on the runoff areas and quite a lot of tarmac, actually. But... Uh, that's just being cleaned up while they can do it, while uh, still this full course yellow, this uh, we've got eight and three quarter hours and a few minutes small change still to go in this race. Cars in the pits, the 0-1 car, but of course they're on the prototype class car. At least Cadillac Racing arrived with two cars. The 0-2 is running with those five cars in the lead group. The 0-1 spent so long uh, in the garage, but uh, down on the deck now it goes. So at least they have affected some form of fix. They had this wiring loom problem still going, but uh, you have to look an awfully long way down the timing screens to find where it is. 61 cars started this race, listed as 42nd at the moment, and Sebastian Bourdais at the wheel. 79 Porsche just parking in behind the 01. Matteo Cairoli bringing in his GT Daytona Pro car, another of the WeatherTech. Uh, liveried machines but uh, unfortunately for Matteo and those connected with the 79 car they are not where they wanted to be which is in that leading group of six cars that are out front so Porsche Lexus Ferrari Porsche Mercedes Mercedes running nose to tail under this caution our 13th of the race and before we go back to green let's get an opportunity to head to joe bradley once more well i'm talking to matty jacobson who's just got out of the number 33 sean creech motorsport henry you were expecting to stay in the car but tell me what there's an issue with driver times for your teammate yeah lance was in the car and he was missing seven minutes so this full course yellow was a good option to do driver change and then get him in for his seven minutes and then we will swap back hopefully before it goes green again. So that's seven minutes under the yellow flag and then he's going to come in hopefully still under yellow and you won't have lost much time at all. Yes, exactly. And then we could avoid having him in the car for an hour instead of... Yeah. Thanks, man. I'll leave you to get back in the zone, as they say. Thanks, James. James Edmonds there, just point me in that direction. I'll catch you later, mate. Cheers for that. Yeah, good uh, thinking on the fly there, which uh, you have to do because it's very easy indeed to uh, 
just cut a, a driver stint a little too short, miss out by a matter of sometimes minutes, sometimes only seconds, but they all count. Uh, and a great time actually to be able to do that because drive time is still included during a, a caution period. We've had so much of it, it really must be. Yeah, and just to reiterate there, the driver being spoken about Lance was Lance Wilsey, of course, the 60-year-old uh, American racer for the Sean Creech Motorsport number 33 Ligier, running in that P3 class that uh, you know has given a lot of people huge fun. Not just because they sound brilliant, but it gives them a chance to race a prototype and. Um, you know, the last handful of years, it really picked up stateside as well, which is great to see. It's a prototype challenge. Absolutely packed field of cars, and uh, Lance Wilsey obviously really enjoying that too. So that was Sean Creech Motorsport that made such a splash last year, and, uh, you know, good to have them back here again at Daytona, waiting for the green flag to be waved, to go back to green flag racing, but all the sorting out of order seems to have uh, taken place and uh, looking to see who's going to pull away at the front of the field. It's Pipo Durrani, the 31 Cadillac, entered by Whelan Engineering uh, at the top of the list, but right behind Lloyd Duval, the number five uh, JDC Miller Motorsports, also entry, that's also a Cadillac. And Will Stevens, the number 10 Acura, entered by Konica Minolta Racing, run by Wayne Taylor. So they're all there. And right in behind in fourth place, Maher Shank Racing, another Acura, that's Simon Pagano. And in behind him, Alex Lynn, the 02 car that's been in the lead of this race, that's Cadillac Racing. So five cars in the DPI class. And as soon as we go racing all over again, it's who's going to get the heat and the tyres the quickest? Is going to be nose to tail? And last time we had a restart, the first two laps were absolutely fantastic, Johnny. Moment or two ago, the gap between David A. Regan and Dennis Olsen was some, as much as 17 seconds behind the, or under the caution, but that's now been rectified with the wave by and with the pit stops for the GT Daytona Pro and non-pro car. So uh, we're back to a position where they are nose to tail within the classes as well, and all involved with the officials as far as uh, IMSA are concerned, and the corner workers have done a really good job again in making sure that the order is correct for a restart. This race, as is always the case, is manually uh, scored, lap scored, as well as, of course, with all the computer gadgetry, but has to have been done by hand as well, just in case those computers fail, and then they need to revert back to the pen and paper. So that's always there in reserve. Tire temperature again, so important at this restart. I think we're probably going to go for a restart at the end of this lap. And that's the reason why all of the DPIs are sweeping from left to right at Speedway turns one and two. OK, just before we go green, just want to cut in. Lovely tweet from Connor Daly. I've known Wayne Taylor since I was a child, and without a doubt, he's one of the coolest dudes in motorsport, not to mention successful. I definitely want to drive for him someday. What a great sentiment. But he goes on to say, but also wouldn't mind having a cocktail with him as well. So that just shows you the calibre of Wayne Taylor. Mm. Famous up and down the pit lane, but lovely tweet there, Connor. Thank you very much. Here come the DPIs down the back straight and on the approach to the Le Mans chicane. Headlights still piercing through the darkness but the pace is starting to quicken now through the left the right and then the right and the left to return the cars to speedway turn three the safety car has disappeared up the road and towards pit lane entry so pace now being decided by pipo dirani heading through speedway turn four now and when will the 31 wheel and engineering car get going they're under the restart orders a car very high up the road there as well which may well be the 48 we're now running once again after our 13th caution period back to green Pipa Durrani will lead the pack of five DPIs through the trioval and down into the braking area this crucial braking area particularly where everything is back to pretty much being stone cold and caught on the high side there is the, the 60 car to into third position so Will Stevens Acura hasn't quite got up to speed to the magnitude of Pagano who, and Stevens again is almost causing a rolling roadblock here to the 0-2 of Alex Lynn, looking for the inside line as they head for the kink on the infield section, also ganging up on that little duo Kamui Kobayashi in the 48 Ally machine. So three together, one trying to get laps back, the other two battling for fourth and fifth positions. 
And just in behind them, of course, they've got Scott Dixon in the 0-1 car. And uh, that is uh, about 40-something laps in arrears. But, of course, that was a real front-runner in the P1, DP1, DPI class. And uh, has had its mishaps, but wants to still play the game. And then come the P2 class runners as well. But they are quickly being dropped by the DPIs as they pull clear. We've got to, have we got a change for the lead at the front? Just waiting for them to come flashing down into the chicane and the first two cars have pulled clear and they're kicking up the dust face full of dust for those behind i think it was pipo durani kicking up the dust uh, into the chicane so it's under cover of darkness you can't see there's dust from going across the grass and uh, for those in third fourth and fifth positions in class that would have been a real moment oh thank you so much but it's good news for the car in the lead not only held the lead going to the chicane but has now pulled about a second and a half maybe two seconds clear as they go high on the banking to sweep round in front of those giant grandstands and we actually have pretty much the biggest lead that anyone has had in class all race we've got eight hours and 40 minutes remaining you can do the maths working backwards but let's call it 15 and a half hours among friends already under our belts dirani then running second position behind loic duval and the acura of simon pagino who got such a good getaway ahead of will stevens uh, running now in third position let's see how good the Acuras are uh, in this segment uh, when they've really been battling the Cadillacs and not quite had the speed but to me the Acuras are better when they get to the really fast stuff on the speedway and it was a, a, a very good battle to uh, keep our eye on between the number 10 Konica Minolta car when uh, Will Stevens was at the wheel and the number five car of Loic Duval in the previous stint. Duval eventually forcing his way by and opened up the gap mainly on the infield after that. So these uh, Cadillacs possibly with the advantage. It's two that lead the race, but the Acura DPIs with good straight line speed and through the air, clearly they are set up to try and be good maybe towards the end of each lap, which will be crucial if we've got several of them battling on the final lap of the race much later on this afternoon. Eight hours and 40 minutes still to go. It is now two minutes past five local time. This is RS2 IMSA Radio, part of the Radio Show Limited network of channels. It is Bruce Jones and Johnny Palmer in the Haggerty Broadcast Centre with uh, Joe Bradley looking after matters in the pit lane. Although I think we're getting to a point now where Joe may be handing over to Shay in the uh, pit lane. So we'll say good morning to Shay Adam very shortly as well. But a uh, stonking job from Joe Bradley in uh, bitterly cold conditions. I wonder how the, uh, the Floridian is getting on uh, with these conditions and how many heat pads have had to be installed uh, for this segment. I'm hearing three in my ears. Well, this is your home state um, and uh, more like English weather being uh, experienced currently. So really busy down in towards turn six for the leading DPIs. 2.6 seconds is the margin for Loic Duval over Pipa Dirani. Simon Pagino just half a second back. Will Stevens and Alex Lynn in that mixture as well. Dylan Murray leads LMP2 in the 29 Racing Team Nederland. Orica from Colton Herter for Dragon Speed USA. They have been, well, it's mainly been Dragon Speed leading with uh, Racing Team Nederland to a certain extent waiting in the wings where they are enjoying a spell now truly out front in the class with James Allen in the number 69 car in third and Rui Andrade in fourth in the number eight car. Still no hint of uh, lightness in the sky. We're a few hours away from that. But uh, there's plenty of artificial light flooding the pit area, of course, and the trioval. But one of the interesting things is the light between the race leader, Lloyd Duval and Pipo Durani. Why is it extended to three, nearly three and a half seconds? Because he just banged in the fastest lap of the race. One minute, 33.834 seconds for Lloyd Duval. Got the hammer down for JDC Miller Motorsports. He's trying to build that thing that is so precious in the data drink for us. It's an advantage. And it's been so tight at the front in the DPI class that uh, any second you can gain just gives you a little bit of breathing space. He's at this rate going to be nearly five seconds clear at this end of the second lap after the restart so he got that pass done on Durrani he's really making it work beautifully for JDC Miller Motorsports for the number five Cadillac absolutely flying in the cold and the average lap times will not be too shabby either for this 
13 laps in so far. Uh, actually, of course, you can't read too much into those because of the caution period that we had. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven laps under yellow. But speed prior to that was good. And Dirani also 13 laps in to his current stint. The one that's pitted more recently, Simon Pagino, only seven laps ago. And Alex Lynn, who took over from Kevin Magnussen during the previous stop, but Lynn did four laps. Then the caution came out, did a pit stop. And now his current stint, second one of this little group, is seven laps old. So the five DPI cars are running a very close quarters but they're now on a different cycle uh, from one another. The, if we stay like this, the first cars to be expected in will be the top two of Duval and Dirani. OK, a car that could or should have been at the front was at the front with Kevin. OK, we've got a pro Shannon, could you just uh, flash up some news from the pit lane there? What, what have you just spotted? Uh, just coming through the triangle. Good morning, guys. Uh, the 69 G-Drive car, severe damage to the right rear. It looked like a tire was down, and there was a lot of sparks as it crossed the start-finish line. Meanwhile, its sister car is serving that drive-through penalty for the pass under yellow. Thanks very much, Shay. And um, Joe, Joe Brandy didn't get to complete this task. Any chance you could get up to Cadillac Racing and the O2 car and find out why exactly Kevin Magnussen lost the lead and lost about 40 seconds. It was about an hour ago now, but he, we found him off at the inside of the circuit on the exit of, well, after the, uh, done, uh, the Le Mans chicane, and we've never really got to, the, uh, to an answer to what went wrong down there. So if you could see your way free to work up there, that would be great. Yeah, it was uh, something like lap hunt, what, uh, 446, I seem to remember, which was over a two-minute lap, and he got caught uh, well beneath the double yellow line between turns three and four on the oval. But since then, the car's generally been fine, so we think it was an incident he was trying to avoid or he was caught up in on the exit of the Le Mans chicane. And since then, there's been a driver change, of course, with Alex Lynn taking over a total of 12 laps ago. Duval and Dirani, 2.2 seconds difference between them. Felipe Fraga is up to his old tricks and setting an absolute best lap time in LMP3 and still leading that class by, well, well over a minute. It's uh, a, a number of laps he has in hand, I reckon, for the 74 crew in LMP3, being the Riley Motorsports car, sharing with Gar Robertson, Robinson, um, Kai Van Berlo and Michael Cooper. But Fraga is the gold, so this is where they should be making hay as the Brazilian continues to stretch his legs. Nearly eight and a half minutes still to go, Bruce. Eight and a half hours? Yeah, so eight and a half hours is much Th a better thing is, to that's say. That's one of those important things uh, that, yeah, just to check, we're both still firing. That's but, good. But eight, well, actually, it might flash by in uh, eight and a half minutes. But uh, not. looking at the pace, though, we took, commented on the one minute 33.8 second lap from uh, race leader Lloyd Duval. Uh, and then suddenly the car in second place, Pipo Durani, one minute 34.1. But the car that Shea reported as a sparky off the circuit, the 69 G-Drive Racing Orica, limping in, actually driving off the circuit to keep out of the way. So really frustrating for the Aussie on board, James Allen, because that was running third in class. It's now fourth and falling back. Nicolo Lapierre should be going past in the number 52 P2 entry from PR1 Matheson. And uh, yeah, that bodywork does appear to be uh, dragging on the race circuit, on the surface, kicking up the dust, but he's below the double yellow lines. So well driven from uh, James Allen, bringing it back. Oh, how painful for them. They've just had one car in to serve a penalty in the pits, and now they've got the other one in, or coming in for repairs. So that'll be coming into the world of Shea very shortly indeed. James made a standard stop during the caution period uh, after only eight laps and he's got as far again in this stint but uh, well north now of his usual average let's hope it's only a tire that has let go and uh, that it's not done too much damage to the inside of that wheel arch that the skin is maybe it, oh, well we wouldn't have a skin because uh, of course the hole in the top for the prototypes but there's still quite a bit of uh, crucial bodywork around the wheel arch and also the rear deck as well. Let's hope none of that needs changing. That's about the right speed, I would say, for the Australian. 
quick enough so you're not losing bags of time but uh, not too fast that you're taking chunks out of the bodywork. New tyre has been identified. They are going to take some of the bodywork off, poss quite possibly the rear deck, and uh, replace that to avoid any drama further down the line. Another minute or so to go before another half hour of the race is completed. And in a further 30 minutes, we will be at two thirds distance which is a, a mini milestone. I think uh, the bigger milestone will be daybreak and then onward until 1.40 this afternoon for the end of the race. Nose to tail between the 5 and the 31. These two cars a few seasons ago were run out of the same stable. Mustang Sampling and Whelan Engineering. The sponsors remain the same, but the teams behind them have changed. Well, certainly for the number five car, that is the case. And a neat bit of driving there from Loic Duval, who went to the left-hand side. Initially, he went right of a big clutch of GT traffic, and then the next clump he went left off. And Pippa Dirani, with all his experience, couldn't react fast enough through no fault of the GT drivers uh, of their own around him, just couldn't find the required track space. No, I mean, there were five GT class cars and suddenly the, there was two cars between the race leader, Lloyd Duval and Pipo Durrani. They'd been, what, half a second apart on the start-finish line and now as they sweep around the back and get it going towards that Le Mans chicane, you're looking at the best part of two seconds. So. We know sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, but Lloyd Duval got it just right, and frustration for Durrani, but they have to stay calm, wait, and now they've actually got clear track, no cars between them. I don't think too much up in front either. It's not long since that restart. As I say that, of course, they come on the tail of a GT-class car, but that's fine. They go high around the outside at turn 13, which is effectively turn four on the, on the oval, but turn 13, the, the final corner before they come round through the kinked left-hander, the long, long left-hander that takes them to the end of a lap, but very much advantage to Loic Duval. For JDC Miller Motorsports, what's the gap and between the pair, between him and uh, Pipo Durrani, just waiting for the timing screen to, to flick up and change over and see what the advantage has uh, turned into. 1.6 seconds is the gap. So it worked the traffic very well for Loic Duval. Didn't work for Pipo Durrani, but his chance may come. First and second, they are, but it's six and a half seconds clear of Simon Pagano for Maya Shank Racing with the leading Acura. But uh, it's busy out there, Johnny, super busy. Yeah, that's Daytona for you. It's always the case year in, year out, and especially when you get a 60-plus entry field uh, yesterday afternoon. Not all are surviving now, sadly but an awful lot are and it's very busy particularly on this lap on the infield just had a quick message off air there from shay uh, news well the 69 came in didn't it but did you have news on another car as well uh, the 69 uh, carl pertaining to that uh, g drive entry it is going behind the wall the right rear suspension yeah. was actually a bit loose and the tire after it had completely delaminated and fallen apart wrapped itself around the suspension components beneath that engine cover. That's why they pulled that off to look at it and then decided, ooh, we're going to need the big wire cutters to try and get this off. Oh, dear. So it's uh, all spiralled a little uh, away from their control for James Allen and their crew at G-Drive Racing by APR. It's uh, Stuart Cox's team, Algar Pro Racing, looking after the two G-Drive Racing cars as they have done in the ELMS last season as well. So they uh, will know how to make quick repairs and uh, those that they hadn't necessarily planned for. The difference for them is the fact that they have to do it remotely, effectively here at Daytona and uh, in their garage, which is behind the wall and some distance away from pit road. It is a considerable logistical consideration, isn't it, to make sure you've got two sets of kits for, you know, it's an unusual element to have a, a tyre carcass having delaminated and wrapped around your suspension. Which tool have we got for that? And is it by the pit wall or is it by the pit garage? But uh, Stuart will be um, working it out as he goes along, but uh, really annoying. It's bad enough having one problem, but when it's manifest a second one or even possibly a third one you've got the puncture you've got the bodywork damage and suspension damage and then you've got the tire carcass wrapped around the bits you want to remove are oh, so tricky but at this point their hands are cold it'd be bad enough if they just stayed as day turned to night but they've got a long way through the 13 hours of darkness their hands will be cold their feet will be cold their core temperature will be cold and uh, again that's where it's just so hard and you can never blow the trumpet enough for, for crews that work in any role they have 
uh, with a racing team in a 24-hour race? Because it's not as though you just do the 24 hours, Johnny. You wake up in the morning, mm. you've got hours before the race. It's on the back of lots of track time and highs and lows, tribulations, etc. in the lead up to the race. And let's face it, the last few days haven't been easy with so much wet track running. That also affects the psyche of everyone involved. It leads to incidents and therefore more time repairing things. So uh, really, my respect is absolutely massive for all those involved in cruising 24 hour racing the one bit of solace they can think about is the fact that uh, this year's race started two hours before last year's so you don't have to go quite as deep into sunday as uh, was the case in 2021 which was a 340 start two hours ahead of time for the 2022 60th running of the Daytona 24 hours. Live on RS2, IMSA Radio, part of the Radio Show Limited network of channels. Bruce Jones and Johnny Palmer for this segment. John Hindoff returning in about 45 minutes' time with Jeremy Shaw. Shay Adam will stay in the pits during that, uh, that uh, session as well. Obviously, with temperatures hovering around the freezing point, you know, for a man from the northeast of England, John will be wearing, just deciding what, what singlet to wear with his shorts. <laughs> Whereas Jeremy, who's done 30 plus years state size, is probably wearing a few more layers of clothing, I would think. Maybe so. Rooftop Ray, though, having uh, to use finger and toe warmers, we were hearing earlier on, doing a sterling job, yeah, getting the nod there from, the, uh, from Rooftop Ray's camera as well. That's the international symbol for a positive, and uh, we get, sometimes get the shake of the camera as well to say negative. It's like the start of the race again, with GT cars pouring their way out of Turn 6 and up onto the speedway, with the Lexus and the Ferrari very close to one another. So that's Kyle Kirkwood and David A. Regon. Regon reeling in the front-engined Lexus, almost a touring car-shaped GT machine. But the Lexus has been part and parcel of GT Daytona class for many years now in the WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. And uh, it's the Risi Competizione Ferrari with the red LED roof line and uh, headlights splayed at a very wide angle across the racetrack as they are both going to be lapped by an LMP2 car, which gets between them briefly, but then can complete the job around the outside of the trioval and hopefully get to the inside racing line, yes, just in time for turn number one. It's a thing of beauty, I think, having multi-class racing, particularly in night, and just seeing how they work it out. Shay, what's happening down in the pit lane? I uh, finally found someone down at the zero two to give me an answer, and it was none other than Brad Goldberg. He was uh, hiding behind the back of the pit perch. He said it was a fuel pressure issue that caused the car to slow down on track significantly, all solved by uh, adding a bit more. Okay. Well, uh, there is a question mark remaining then as to when that car starts to get very light on fuel, whether the pressure will dip again. But... Um, there's been at least one more pit stop since then. We're talking an hour ago, so let's hope that that uh, has rectified the problem. But one thing that stands out when you look at the timing screens that uh, you can find here, there and everywhere is the fact that that 0-2 car has got 33 pit stops under its belt, but the race-leading cars in DPI have got, only had 24. So they're doing things differently, but that was the pattern before they had the fuel pressure uh, problem. But thanks very much, Shay, for clearing that up, because a lot of people have been asking. It was one of those things that wasn't visually obvious to us. Certainly not. And these things uh, will... You'll, they'll know all about them during uh, their particular stint and uh, conversations will be had afterwards with uh, Kevin Magnuson, I'm sure. But, um, yeah, to us, it was, uh, we were a little bit in the dark for a while. So good to have that cleared up. I'm still trying to work out exactly which uh, stint it was when he had that slower lap. With the 143.4 as the average. So it was somewhere between lap 400 and lap 420 where his average speed went way out, but he had two further stints after that, where lap times, even on the average, were very respectable. So let's keep our fingers crossed that that, that issue has been solved. Alex Lynn since taking over the car, and the Ferrari of Risi has got by the Lexus, so that's a place change for Davide Rigon. 
moving ahead of Kyle Kirkwood and into third position in GT Daytona Pro. Mathieu Jaminet leads for Faf in the number nine. Then it's Dennis Olsen for KCMG, Porsche number two. And then this uh, duo of Ferrari and Lexus, the prancing horses ahead and just starting to gallop away. Yeah, and then suddenly Carl Kirkwood, having lost that little scrap, has now got Danny Junkadea right on his tail. That 97 WeatherTech Racing Mercedes is taking a look at the yellow tail end of the Lexus and actually turns through the corner a little bit better, but that's because very good use of the mirrors there. Danny Junkadea spotted a prototype coming up his inside, so he rose high. And we've got the 44 Magnus Racing Aston Martin off the edge of the track. The lights are on and it's going again, so little mishap rejoining at the, well, partway between the second and third of the four parts of the Le Mans chicane, the newly renamed Le Mans chicane, and for 44, that's a little scramble for Spencer Pompelli, but uh, he's got it going again. You always worry when you see a car suddenly where it shouldn't be, is he going to keep going? But there was no clear damage. I think a simple spin might have felt less simple than you could imagine for Spencer, but uh, he's got it going. Good news. Let's just describe that to you again where it was a really crowded house into the Le Mans chicane. It's done some damage to the rear. Amazingly, the rear wing stayed intact, but that will have been knocked out of shape. It was contact with a prototype, which needed to run slightly offline as a result of that as well. But it flexed the rear screen out of the 44 car, I reckon. And uh, that will need to be checked. Although, has Spencer Papelli continued around? Yes, he has. So they're happy to continue for the time being, as now on pit road, Pipa Durrani arrives from second position, and this brings to a close another stint of about the right sort of time, yeah, 23 laps, Shay, because remember, we had six or seven laps under the caution. This is fuel only for Pipo Durrani, no tires, no uh, hint of putting new tires on the car at this temperature, but we are going to be seeing new tires going on the DPI uh, Cadillac here in a couple moments time because Tristan Vautier is up on the wall for JDC Miller Motorsport to take over from Lake Duval. Uh, just waiting on the fuel, there goes Pipo as the fuel nozzle is detached and 32 seconds stationary, so wow, that was actually a, a long, long stop for fuel. Um, that's Tristan Nunez behind the wheel. Uh, now, I'm not sure, was it Pipo who brought it in, or was I just dreaming that he was in the car? No, Pipo was in, Pipo was in, the, in the car uh, when it came in. Uh, well done for being in the right place at the right time uh, there, Shay. But uh, tricky, tricky, tricky as it is down the pit lane, and in fact, a little blow of the trumpet to the, in the tag wrestle. We'll say it now because he's probably having a little sleep having come out of the pit lane, but uh, Barnaby Scarfs tweeted in to say there's always a silver lining to a safety car period when Bradders 30708, that's a catchy uh, tag, is on call. The greatest pit lane reporter. Don't tell him anyone, OK? So much knowledge and such a generous interview technique. And in fact, if he can get involved in a lovely little technical conversation, you could just sense Joe always wants to roll his sleeves up and sort out the problem, doesn't he? He, he wants always to be can't involved. help himself. Well, when that alternator belt went on the zero, uh, 01, yeah, he wanted to roll his sleeves up and uh, get cracking on with the crew. Um, and he was mightily disappointed that that car lost so much time in a, an unexpected pit stop. We expected it to come in to have to have a, a brake change, but nowhere near as substantial work that in the end needed to be done. Uh, the five car is in, as predicted by Shea Adam, Loic Duval from the race lead show. And there was a bit of confusion as to whether or not they were actually going to change the tires. The tire changers jumped off the wall. They did not put their guns on the wheels, though, as they were getting communication from the man in charge before being told, yep, we are going to do the Michelins. But the good news is the car just dropped off the air deck. Fuel nozzle came out and no time was lost. It is now Tristan Vautier, the Frenchman, taking over from the Frenchman Loic Duval. No longer full season co-drivers for this upcoming season, though, because Richard Westbrook, the Englishman, is back in that car for the remainder of the IMSA season. Two 24-lap stints there. I, I almost expected them to go to be able to go a bit further than that because we had six or seven laps of caution within it, but they've only been able to eke out two more laps from a usual 21, sometimes even only 20 lap stint. So when you compare 20 to 24, that's more like it. Peter Durrani sweeps across the line. Now he's dropped, to, or rather Tristan Nunes sweeps across the line, having replaced Peter Durrani. And he is down to fifth position. But uh, it's a question of who wins 
the, the fight on pit road between the two Tristans, and it should probably stay the same order when all of this unfolds in a few laps' time. But we'll need pit stops for Simon Pagino, Will Stevens, and Alex Lynn before that is decided. And Will Stevens will be in next time around, I reckon. He's in now, yeah, because this also brings to a close, Shay, another 24 lap stint. Yes, it does. Will Stevens staying aboard the Conica Delta Acura. He is getting new Michelins, though. Interesting that all these teams, except for Will and Engineering, choosing to put the new Michelins on because the conditions are so cold. It will be difficult to try and get heat in the tires, particularly for someone who has never raced at Daytona in the night in these kinds of conditions prior to, well, what, an hour ago. Will Stevens is set for In the pit lane comes the 22 United Autosport. That is Will Stevens at this car. Oh! Stevens was turning into his box, uh, sorry, going back into the fast lane from the transition lane, as Will Owen was turning into his box. They missed each other by about a foot. Wow. Where there's a will, there's a way. Where the two wills, there's just about a way. But that's uh, the P2 class. United Autosports car. The, the race hasn't really come to them this year, but uh, they're, they're still there or thereabouts. But unfortunately, they are 10 laps down, 11 laps down on Colton Herter who's leading the class of Dragon Speed, who pretty much any time in the last few hours, Johnny, we've looked at the top of the time charts for the P2 class. It's either been first or second for Dragon Speed. So, um, Elton Julian, come on, Elton, a little bit of a smile. Well done. But uh, going well for them. Haven't really talked about the GTD class, not GTD Pro, but the regular GT Daytona class. It's been a great little battle between the right most sport Porsche, number 16, and uh, the 57 Winwood Racing Mercedes, and uh, not so long ago it was the Mercedes in front, and now it's the Porsche, Jan Halen's turn. He's had a good couple of years, hasn't he? Great successes last year. It's been a long career for the Belgian, and he's really made a huge success stateside. He's only three seconds clear of Lucas Auer, though, the Austrian driver, giving chase, in fact, gaining slightly last time around. But as, as much as we see the prototypes coming through and having to sort of slightly abate their pace to uh, make sure a GT class car or a P3 car isn't in their way too much, so the GT cars can lose position trying to keep out of the way of the DPIs and um, keep an eye on that. But it looks at the moment, though, Lucas Auer in the Windward Racing Mercedes has got the advantage. He certainly, mm, let's do the maths, 20 seconds clear of Ollie Milroy, uh, who's third in class in the, the McLaren that's still going, the Inception Racing McLaren, because the Crucial Motorsport car went well early on, but that uh, was out of the race quite a while ago. But uh, the 70 McLaren, Ollie Milroy at the wheel, his regular teammate, uh, Brendan Neri, American racer, shares that with him, Frederick Schandorf and the South American racer Jordan Pepper. But it's Oli, Oli Milroy at the moment and he's lapping well so he's in the mix. That could be a huge result because Inception Racing really want to make a splash on Uribe's home ground in the States in 2022. Yeah, been uh, steadily moving towards ACO rules racing and uh, yeah, a fascinating first step into IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship action as well. Brendan E. Reeb, who is a McLaren specialist, although when they ran at Le Mans, was that now two years ago, or was it only last year? They couldn't run a McLaren because they didn't have a GTE car, of course, so had to go with a Ferrari instead. It was only last year, OK, but Shea confirms that. It feels like 18 months ago. But there we are. That's uh, the uh, world we live in currently. Um, 22 laps on the clock for Pagano and Lynn. So expecting them in in another three or four laps time as i say they were the ones that did a double pit stop effectively during the the uh, during the caution pagino's stops were only three laps apart and it was a short four lap stint for alex lynn before returning on lap 466 so expecting him to go at least a couple more before he needs a bit more fuel okay while you're crunching the numbers on that johnny i just want to put into perspective uh, different approaches to cooler temperatures obviously for floridians it's a little uncomfortable and not something they're used to but i commented on the um our commentary box so uh, will be approached very shortly by uh, two two brits which will, of course, be John Heindhoff, who will be wearing shorts, and Jeremy Shaw, who wouldn't. But I love a comment from E. Hewitt saying, um, this is a British comment, seems a bit nippy, better have a cuppa. Yeah. <laughs> Different ways of doing That'll things. That'll take the edge off it, definitely. Um, the, the, with the little bit of a breeze uh, making it feel three, two or three degrees lower than it is, and uh, there's going to be 
no let up for at least another hour or so in the temperature. Uh, into the pits, the LMP2 race leader is Colton Herter for Dragon Speed in the number 81 two-tone orange and yellow car. And uh, that already down onto its new Michelin rubber and back into the race. Rui Andrade also pitting on that lap, as did Nicolas Lapierre in the 52 PR1 Matheson Motorsport Orica. So Andrade running with Tower Motorsport this year. He fits from second, and that will briefly uh, promote Dylan Murray to third position. Dylan had a, a spell of time out front as well for racing team Nederland. So we've got certainly three cars that can lead this class on the pit stop cycle. I'm not sure Lapierre is quite close enough in the 52, though. Now, we talked about trying to get heat into your tyres and how it's not the work of just your outlap but as much as 10, but just something you almost never see. Nicola Lapierre just leaving the pit lane in the 52 PR1. Matheson, Orica, and he wasn't just being cautious. He was weaving like mad, just trying to force some heat into, into any part of those tyres before he starts getting it up to speed. Of course, on the track, he won't be winding the wheels around like that, but um, again, any little trick you can do to find even one more degree of temperature uh, could just buy, if it means you can get up to full speed, one lap earlier, you've got to do yeah. it, and that's Nicola using his experience. I mean, it almost se would seem weird to have a race with, that, with, a, with a P2 class car without Nicola Lapierre in it. He's just been the gold standard for so long, and um, time after time, particularly at Le Mans, you know, things aren't going well for his team, they put Nicola Lapierre in and go, yeah, I'm leaving there for a bit, shall we? And <laughs> he just delivers astonishingly good lap pace, and also just that degree of knowledge you have that you build up in your memory bank over the years of, uh, sort of identifying problems as they're starting to appear yeah. in the car and just maybe giving the clue a clue to the team before you come in that I think this is the problem you know I could be maybe over explaining it but that experience but not just experience but experience at the very top level of that class is it's gold dust yeah uh, uh, pure, uh, also as an advice giver to uh, everybody else within the team not only team personnel but uh, fellow drivers too and, and that, that sheer physical exertion shows just how necessary hours in the gym are for before before you start a race like this we talk about it being endurance it is particularly for the car and the mechanics involved but a new driver having at half past five in the morning having to get his elbows out straight away and not even fighting for position just trying to fight to keep the car on the road it is a thought and you know again and again over 24 hour races you talk about you often get Joe and Shay asking, you're just going to have a lie down now you've done your stint. And people do things differently, but it's, it's not the amount of time you spend to sleep. It's the, amount of, it's the quality of that sleep that yep. you're getting. And also for a lot of them, particularly in the later part of a 24-hour race, as much as anything, it's having a massage just to keep them yeah. supple. Because getting in, and, you know, going too hard on cold muscles, you, know, you can cramp up. And there's not a lot of space for, for most people, but particularly taller drivers, to move their legs around if they get cramped in a racing car. But also after two or three stints, 20, 21, 22 laps, you can't then just get out of the car and turn off. You know, you've almost got to detone things, like you say, with a massage before you can then uh, relax to a point where it's useful time uh, whilst sleeping. Out of the Le Mans chicane, we'll go three GT cars completely together, one of which is the McLaren, I think, that was in question not too long ago. So that's Ollie Milroy, did you say? Ollie Milroy, the wheel, yeah. third in class. It's still the 16 right motorsport Porsche leading GTD with a 57 Winwood Racing Mercedes, number 57 Lucas Hour. Just again, yes. they're staying stable, just uh, three and a half seconds apart. Ollie Milroy, third in class. So, gosh, I mean, McLaren would love to win mm. something big in the States. And th there is no bigger event, of course, than the Daytona 24 hours. So they're in the hunt. We've got just over eight hours remaining. So nearly at the two thirds distance point in this race. It's been an incredibly interesting race, and there's not a driver in who's been out on the circuit who won't have more than a few scary, scare stories about how they simply didn't have any grip. Still seven different manufacturers in the top eight of GT Daytona. Porsche, Mercedes, McLaren, Aston Martin, Ferrari, Acura and Lamborghini. The only double up we've got there are the Mercedes sitting in second and fifth for 57 Winward and the 32 car, which is the entry from Gilbert Courtoff Motorsports. And uh, that car, the 32, is uh, being driven by James Davison. Not too long ago, it was off the road and on the grass on the infield, you may remember. That car 
has uh, long since rejoined and doing okay again, back in the rhythm. Now to the Western Horseshoe will go Tristan Nunez with the white number one positional light illuminated on the flanks of the 31 Wheeling Engineering car. And uh, almost 11 seconds now up the road. So uh, this is uh, a dominant stint for Tristan Nunez as we get a new fastest lap from further down in the classes. It's a GT Daytona fastest lap from a certain Jan Halen for Wright Motorsports in his class leading Porsche. And if you want to know how fast it was, it was uh, just a whisker off the very fastest lap in GTD Pro. 1 minute 45.154 for, for, for Halen. And the best in GTD Pro is the number 14. Um, Lexus that has the fastest lap, 45.120. You're dealing in hundreds of, three hundredths of a second. So that's a fantastic lap. At uh, this point in the, well, we're getting through the night. We've got uh, another almost an hour and a, just over an hour and a half, hour and 40 until official sunrise. And let's hope it's a kind day. It's clearly going to be cold, but let's hope there's some form of heat that will uh, come with, with sun, if indeed we see the sun, but uh, not guaranteed. But anything for these drivers, it's been, a, it's always a long night in the Daytona 24 hours, over 13 hours of darkness, but I think they need the sucker that will come with the day. With, with the day. Yeah, the uh, real tricky spot is uh, heading through these final hours of darkness where temperatures uh, are maybe just starting to improve a touch but you've got the dew and then the potential frost as well on the grass so um, they're by no means through the woods just yet as the 31 car will return to speedway turn one again eking out a little bit more time average speed for this lap, lap for this stint rather which has been eight laps so far 136.3 a best of a 135.5 for Tristan Nunez interesting to see how that compares to previous stints of his but all off the back of a triple that Pippa Durrani did Conway was probably at the wheel for a similar length of time as well. Was that a triple stint too? Yes, it was, although the middle one was shorter than we would have expected, probably affected by caution. But uh, Nunez, 135.2. He has previously posted as a best 134.4 in the daylight hours. And he's uh, already got down to a 135.5. So there's still about a second to find if they can, but um, the car will need to get a bit lighter before they are in a position to get to that sort of marker. It's not unknown at half past five in the morning to get a fastest lap of the race, which is never bettered. Well, at the moment, Tristan Vautier holds on to the 133.834, which in itself is only, was only set within the last couple of hours. There's still two Cadillacs driven by Tristans, first and second. Then the two Acuras of Simon Pagino and Will Stevens for uh, Maya Shank racing with Kerb Agajanian and the 10 car, which is the Konica Minolta ARX05. And the third of the Cadillacs sits in fifth position with Alex Lynn at the wheel of the 02 Cadillac racing car. Interesting, just looking at the pace, Harry Tinknell, you know, not where we expect to find him, but he's in 11th, 12th place overall. He's uh, way down in the P2 class car, but he's starting to make the number 11 PR1 Matheson Orica get up and uh, get a move on. That's the fastest car, fastest lap for that car. So uh, Harry, who's been at the very top end of sports car racing for he's getting on for a decade now, um, you know, doing what he's paid to do and doing it very well indeed. Does seem in the GT class, both in GTD Pro and GTD, both led by Porsches, the Pro class by Pfaff Motorsport number nine, uh, with Mathieu Jaminet at the wheel, and um, as I talk about, Jan Halen in the number 16, uh, right Motorsport car in GTD, he comes into the pits, but they, they also were just setting a comfortable pace at the head of their class that was quicker than anyone else. Mm. So who knows? I mean, things move around, it might just be coincidental, and clearly with Jan, Jan Halen, he was towards the end of his stint because the fuel load was down, but very quick laps indeed. Yeah, and uh, these are these are often tied into the fact that the car is getting uh, nice and light on its tyres. The tyre wear, uh, not as brutal as it can be in other venues around the world. 31 lap stint for Jaminet so far, and last time the GT Daytona Pro car, car 
Um, managed a 30 lap stint. I'm not sure how much caution there was, actually none. So uh, an all green stint is 30 laps, but when you add some yellow into it, and remember we had eight laps at the start of Chamonix's uh, current stint, could we get as far into this as 30? Eight laps, I wonder, therefore, or it won't be 38 laps, but maybe 34, 35 to extend it a little bit further. Dennis Olsen pitted later than Jaminet uh, and to the tune of about seven laps. Likewise, Regon and Junkadea all pitting on lap 440. At the Le Mans chicane on the previous lap, what happened with the number 19 Lamborghini? That was just maybe a little bit slow coming out uh, for TR3 racing, but the prototypes that were trying to get by managed to do so pretty well. The FAF racing uh, Porsche that leads the GT Daytona Pro Class getting suitably out of the way of the two battling LMP2s at the sharp end. That's Colton Herter and Ferdinand Habsburg first and second, as we can take this moment to hear from Jan Halen, now joining Shay. Jan, it's never a rare thing when you get out of a Porsche having set the fastest lap, but with conditions these cold, were you sad when Bobby came over the radio and you were getting out of the car? <laughs> yeah, it's always nice when it's running well, but now the car's running really good so far, and uh, finally had some clear track in front of me. I feel like I've been um, in an LFP3 battle up in the, up until that point, so yeah, it's uh, really fun right now. The car's good, still a long ways to go, so we're just trying to stay clean and uh, not take any risk. How hard is it to get heat into new Michelin tires? I saw they put some on for Zach as he took over the 16 right Porsche. Yeah, it's not easy. <laughs> no, it's, um, I, I think that's the uh, name of the game right now. You know, got to be real careful on the outlaps. And uh, once the tires are in, it's fine, but it does take uh, it does take a little while, and that first half of life is super tricky. Thanks, my friend. Good luck. Thank you. IMSA Radio, part of the Radio Show Limited network of channels. Uh, another race hour comes to an end. That is 16 hours now in the book for the 2022 Rolex 24 at Daytona. Round one of the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship once again on the RSL network throughout the year. Every twist and turn of the championship in five different classes will be covered live here on the station. And uh, the next round, of course, is a small matter of the Sebring 12 hours in March, which will be a super weekend with the FIA World Endurance Championship as part of that, uh, that entry as well. Friday night WEC uh, season opener, followed by the Sebring 12 hours on the Saturday. The number 70 Inception Racing Lamborghini squirming its way out of turns one and two cars rejoining from green flag pit stops as well Holly Milroy having to deal with that and does so very neatly I can't remember well on the stats whether Milroy's ever raced here before it will have been quite a learning process for him we can very easily look that up uh, but uh, we've had so many drivers in the last few years because of the influx of GT drivers, Bruce, you were mentioning this earlier, how young they're getting into it now. Yes, they want the single-seater career, but they realise the value for the long-term uh, picture to get into uh, sports car racing as early as possible. So you get this, these uh, guys and girls late in their teens, early 20s, experiencing sports cars for the first time and these world-class venues. Absolutely so, I and mean, for Ollie, it's definitely his first visit. He's posted lots of stuff about, I'm on the track, I'm walking around the track, I'm looking at the track, but, you know, such a good pairing with uh, Brendan Reid. They've had real success in Europe in the last uh, year or so, and uh, certainly last year was a good year for them. They've won the International GT Open Pro-Am class. They got a lot of racing time. Uh, did the Age of the Mall series as well, but right now he's doing what he's here to do, and he's leading the class, car number 70, that... Uh, McLaren from Inception Racing, leading by a minute and a little bit from uh, Zach Robicon, but of course Zach has only just left the pits in that right motorsport uh, Porsche that had been leading the way. Lucas Auer has also just had a pit stop, and he and 
he, he's in the Winwood Racing Mercedes at car number 57. So he's still battle joined with the 16 Wright Motorsport uh, Porsche. They're, they're nip and tuck, they're a quarter of a second apart. But for now, until he comes into the pits, uh, Ollie Milroy leading the way in GTD. As I say that, the Inception Racing uh, red and black McLaren into the pit lane, flashing its lights. And the Wright Motorsport Porsche is being lapped by Tristan Nunez, who is low down through speedway turn two. So rather than having to go to the high side, the GT cars were in such a position whether they could be overtaken to their left-hand side. Normally, the protocol is if you're in the quicker car within class, you go to the high side. That's the reason why we've seen so many times uh, DPI is getting so close to the safer barrier, sometimes three abreast with an LMP3 car sitting in the middle and a GT car way down low. And in the driver's briefing, that is emphasised. If you are a faster car wanting to get by, high line is where we want you. But there are some rare, rarer occasions where the inside line will do just as well. And uh, Nunez lost less time than normally. We're only two laps away from... Uh, the 500 lap marker, uh, which again is a milestone to reach probably before, well, certainly before 6 a.m. And uh, that suggests if we keep going at this sort of pace, we could crack 750 as a total. Last year, I should have looked this up really, but uh, I can probably find the answer to that very swiftly indeed. Last year we got to 807 laps. So it's by no means a record distance because of all the cautions that we've had to this point. Um, and uh, some of that has been to do with this year's conditions. Some of it's to do with the fact that we've got, we had 61 cars enter this year's race. The record breaking year, 2020 with 833 laps completed. I don't think 2019 was more than that. No, it wasn't. No, no, 833 no. was, the, was uh, the year I remember yeah in 2020. 2019, we had quite a lot of time when the cars were off the track, sitting in the pit lane, waiting for the track to dry out. Of course. Yeah. I never did dry out, actually, but uh, I enjoyed every second of it. I just want to point that out, but uh, yes. A, a fantastic battle, really enjoying the battle in GTD uh, between uh, Zach Robicon and uh, Lucas Auer, but there are a few laps into their stints, but their tyres will still be cold, but it's that moment where you can't race in a regular way, much as it's just a, a small fraction of a second between you, you've just got to be waiting a few more laps before you start to attack if you're Lucas Hauer. He's behind that 16 right motorsport. Porsche in the Winwood Racing Mercedes, but a little bit of caution is just required. Frustrating as it must be for all parties out there. Do round through the gears for the FAF Porsche number nine and uh, alas the G-Drive one of the two G-Drive LMP2 cars to get by as well. That was either the 69 or the 68, but it did so so quickly, I was unable to tell the difference. They are very similarly liveried, those cars, as well from Stuart Cox's APR crew that run G-Drive racing these days. Seven seconds, the advantage for Tristan Nunez over Tristan Vautier. So that's come down for the last few laps, I notice. Uh, the average lap time for the chaser is better in the uh, lion share. Now, Tristan Vautier has done fewer laps at 14. Nunez running at 15 laps so far on the stint. But there's about seven tenths of a second favouring Vautier on the average. So that five car just starting to chip away a little bit on the race leader. We're going to go caution, though, for yet another time. And that will surely mean that uh, the pit lane will be flooded with cars in a moment or two. The exact reason why we're heading into uh, caution number 14 is not immediately obvious. But again, what the hell? Under green, not quite managed the hour. Remember, the previous green flag was the best we've had so far, i.e. the longest, an hour and 47, nearly 48 minutes. Uh, but this hasn't quite made 50 minutes under green before we go caution again. And quite how many laps this is going to be remains to be seen. Oh, it is a big crash for an LMP3 car. It's the Andretti car at turn 
Now, one voice in my head said turn three, the other voice in my head said turn six. It's the International Horseshoe. Ah, 36 was what Shay was saying, beg your pardon. So 36 is the Andretti car, and it is the International Horseshoe. So uh, turn three, the right-hand horseshoe, which is where this car has gone off and in quite a big way, Bruce Jones. Yeah, it's Rasmus Lind at the wheel, but um, again, just seeing where the cars ended up and then trying to gauge from where the bodywork is was the contact. Rasmus is out of the car, that's good news, but uh, it's going to take a little while to clear this one up. So that was running fourth in class, maybe actually third at the time, but uh, still leading that P3 class. Felipe Fraga, he's been out front for a long time for Riley Motorsports. John Bennett, second. Uh, in number 54 for Core Autosport, but sadly for Andretti out of that car. Now, we're hearing, actually, it's not the 36 car, it's the blue and white of Mulner Motorsports. Mulner Motorsports America. So car number six, which is off the road, again, so this is the second incident I'm now hearing for the Moon car uh, of the race so far. And car number six, yes, is a long way down the order after previous difficulties. And Joel Miller is at the wheel of the Duquesne D08, which has pranged the barrier. And uh, I'm just wondering whether it's sort of spun on its way into the... Um, into the International Horseshoe, and that's the reason why its, its wake is strewn by light pods and all those sort of things. I mean, I'm used to the rather large um, front fenders of a Duquesne, and they are designed to snap off as well, for, you know, to, to, to displace the energy where possible. It's Joel Miller, as mentioned. And, and so we should actually just balance that. It wasn't Andretti or Sport, fortunately. So they are still running in fourth place. Yes, in class. 36. So they're in the mix in uh, 36. So for Andretti or Sport, they'd love a big one here. Uh, still going. So just to reiterate, it's 74 leading the class. Riley Motorsports, and uh, that's been a gold standard performance, as you'd expect from Felipe Fraga. Core Autosport right in the mix. But there's a good lap. In, in fact, Fraga's job just looks better and better. He's sitting on an unusually large cushion. But for the rest, it's a question of who's going to be able to stay on his coat. Tails. But for Rasmus Lind, the driver we thought was out of the car, no, he's in the car. That's the good news for Andretti Autosport. And it was the number six, Mulner Motorsport America, Duquesne, that is off. Joel Miller out of the car, walking around, but car going nowhere at the moment. Yeah, uh, now if that can recover back to the pit lane, uh, I would hope, although I can't, I haven't got a really good view of the front of that car, but I would hope that a lot of the panels that have come off it, as, as I've mentioned, are designed to snap off and therefore they can fix a new nose to that and it hasn't done uh, too much damage, but if you struggle to stop into the International Horseshoe, you are going at a real rate of knots through the twisty turny bit at turns two, the kink right and left, um, and you might think, well, out of one to three, that's not a great distance, but these prototypes accelerate like crazy, and if it's a full brake failure or maybe a stuck open throttle, that will have done substantial damage to the nose of that car. Let's keep our fingers crossed for the time being. It will be recovered and uh, might be able to head back to the pits um, under its own steam, but we will wait and see. The caution's still out. Pits are closed, so nobody has the option to come into the pit lane just yet. It will be prototypes first of all, and GT's next time. Shades reporting to me that there was one taker into the pit lane. So was that for uh, was that for emergency service, Shay, for car three? Yes, it was. And they will be coming back down to do a full pit stop. But Nick Katzberg needed to pit. And they were up on the wall before the caution came out. But the car was too far around the track to make it in before the yellows waved. And... If you're wondering why the Corvettes are further down the order than, than many would have expected, they hit dramas around about seven, eight hours in, with a number three car had an alt, uh, number four had an alternator problem. I'm not sure whether we ever got to the bottom of exactly what the issue was for the number three car, but um, those machines, of course, former GTLM cars and ran at Le Mans as GTEs are now GT3 machines as part of GT Daytona Pro, so effectively have been backwards engineered to be eligible for this class. 
and Corvette have had some wonderful years here, not least that time when the, the two front engine cars finished the GTLM battle side by side, virtually a dead heat after 24 hours. Uh, but this year, sadly, for the Detroit brand, uh, will be a year to forget. And it's uh, a, a tricky entry into GT3 running, but they will come back fighting from round two. Be assured of that. Out of Speedway turn two and down the back straight comes this collection of DPI cars then, headed by Tristan Nunez, lap 501, which is a uh, number favoured by many darts fans, I'm sure. Uh, but we missed the 500, apologies for that, but 501 working, 502. And uh, Tristan Nunez ahead of Tristan Vautier. Then it's Bronfist, Stevens and Alex Lynn in two Acuras and Alex Lynn in the third of the caddies. Uh, what do we get after a caution period? We get a restart and those restarts have been fantastic uh, during our four hour stint. We nearly come to the end of our four hour stint, Johnny, but uh, really don't, don't want to give up the microphone. It's been so much fun, but we're going to, I'm sure, get another restart in. So is it going to be which Tristan or would it be Tom? as we work out who's going to be first around uh, after one full racing lap, or will it be Will or Alex Lynn at the back? So Tristan Nunes uh, leads in the number 31 wheel in engineering racing Cadillac. Tristan Vautier, the number five JDC Miller Motorsports Cadillac in that second place. Tom Blomfist, Meyershank Mayer -Shank Racing, tucked in behind the best of the Acuras. And Will Stevens, number 10, the other Acura, that's uh, Wayne Taylor's team. And then the 0-2 car from Alex Lynn, Cadillac Racing all in the mix. Who's going to jump best or are they going to dive into the pits? Yeah, we've got to do a uh, full pit stop cycle now as well because it's been 50 minutes since the last caution period. And Shay Adam watching the DPIs pour down pit road. The first of our pit stops, actually the only one of the DPIs that's doing the driver change down on the pit in and is the Clinica Minolta Acura. Will Stevens out, Ricky Taylor taking over that car once again. Oh, the hard point uh, ports is down by lane as well. That'll be emergency service. Fuel and tires for Tristan Nunez. Fuel and tires for Tom Blancfist. And they're actually even cleaning Tom's ears. So giving him a bit of better. Goodbye, Ricky Taylor. I think that was an adequate way to get heat into the tires, but I'll have to ask him after the stint if that actually made a lick of difference. Well, it fired him up, and that's exactly what we want. Ricky Taylor, one of the great, great drivers in IMSA history, and uh, it's just, uh, it's really good when you get a second generation driver, or in their family case, two second generation drivers who aren't just second generation drivers, they're drivers in their own right, and they really live up to the, the family name, and uh, as well as being just something supremely entertaining as well. So a little bit of wheel spin, hey, doesn't hurt with uh, Shay's mic still being open. We love it. 17 laps in for Nunez, uh, including the caution leading into that stop. Only 12 laps necessary for Tom Blomqvist and Alex Lynn. Tristan Vautier, uh, the next longest stint after Nunez, so he did 16. And Will Stevens, 15 laps on his stint. Remember, these cars under green flag conditions can go as far as 22 laps. There's a bit of an extension at the, previous, at the end of the previous uh, stint as well because of uh, the caution that we had just under 50 minutes ago. LMP2s, uh, with Colton Herter leading that, but Ferdinand Habsburg has come in from second position after 12 laps. He must have pitted twice during a caution, just two laps apart previously, but as I say, he's just done 12. Lapierre's done 14 and uh, a quick change around last time as well in the number 29 car for racing team Nederland for Rinas VK who took over from Dylan Murray and uh, Rinas having done three caution laps so far he will be settling back once we get back to green for a good portion probably a double stint Will we get green before we get to the top of the hour? I think we may be just about to miss out on that, but uh, so that means we'll have uh, a new crew in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre who'll be in the starter's orders at the moment, ready to sort of tag wrestle, slap our hand and come in and take it over. But uh, they will get night turning into day. But uh, we will be back within a few hours, but it's been absolutely enthralling and uh, I just can't wait to see how the rest of this uh, classic race unfolds, Johnny. 
Well, it should be the GTs coming in next for their pit stops. And then once all that is done, we will be able to go back to green flag running. Let's get to Shay for the GT pit stops. Shay. KCMG Porsche hits its marks perfectly. Fuel and tires, and it is Larry time. Lawrence Vantor taking over for Dennis Olsen, the Norwegian driver who is more than adept at driving in freezing conditions, you would hope, as uh, Larry was looking less than happy to be putting on all of his stuff because he had to take off the puffy winter coat. But that's okay, he's happy now because he's in his natural environment. He is behind the wheel of Porsche, exactly where he belongs. Fueling is still going on, the tire change is done. Larry is fully installed, KCMG Porsche ready to roll. We've had nearly 17 hours of the 60th edition of the Rolex 24 here at Daytona International Speedway. It's been Bruce Jones and Johnny Palmer looking after things in the Haggerty broadcast booth. The final seven hours and 40 minutes start now. So right in the midst of the pit stops, RS2, IMSA Radio, live from trackside at the World Centre of Racing, Peter McKay and John Hindorf with Shea Adam down in the pits. Let's pick up some more news on those GT pit stops. What do you know, Shea? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I know that it is quite chilly down here, and there are more cars than I can remember in a long time coming in to do the emergency service stops uh, and then having to fill that uh, requirement. But I'm just going to dive back here with Dennis Olsen really quickly. Uh, Dennis, sorry to doorstep you like this right after you've gotten out of the car. That had to be a thrilling stint. It looked like a lot of fun from our side. What was it like behind the wheel? Ah, it was a lot of cars on that uh, last restart. Uh, we were more or less last in the queue. and. Uh, to be honest, I came through pretty quickly, surprisingly. Um, I thought it would be more difficult, but um, we had the advantage that we didn't have completely cold tires, which really helped me uh, and made my life a lot easier when we when we restarted. So uh, now the car is going good and the team is doing a good job. So we just got to keep, go keep going. How difficult is it going to be for Lawrence with new tires, the cold conditions and coming out from behind a safety car? Uh, it's extremely slippery now. It's uh, so cold outside and um, the rears you manage to get a little bit of temperature leaving the pits by uh, burning, doing a burnout. But uh, the front tires, you're trying to scrub them down pit lane, but it's not enough. And uh, when you approach turn three, it's not much going on from the front. So, um, you just got to be careful and try to optimize what you have. Thanks for talking to us straight out of the car. Good luck the rest of the way. Thank you. Shea, just a, a note, uh, Fair Use has tweeted in at IMSA Radio uh, asking if teams could use intermediate tyres if it gets cold or frosty. With the, uh, the Michelin customer tyre, the, the, I think there's only one option slick and one option wet, is there not? That is correct, there is the S9M and the S9M, so good, good choosing <laughs> out there. Uh, you have the freedom of choice so long as it's the S9M. And of course, with the with no GT, thank you, Shea, with no GT uh, Le Mans cars out there, they were the uh, they had the options uh, of different uh, slicks and uh, and uh, different operating temperatures of slicks. Usually had three options each round, but uh, not the case now. Tobias Brockman on his weather app around here says 50% uh, snow, chance of snow in the last next few hours. Well, that means 50%, 50% not snow, uh, even underneath here. It's very, very, uh, the official air temperature is just above freezing at the moment, but the track temperature has fallen down to four degrees Celsius, plus four, but it, it ha that hasn't fallen for a while. Uh, even in the undercroft uh, beneath our feet here in the Haggerty Global Broadcast booth, it is between three and four, and that's very, very sheltered under there, and zero wind, so the wind chill factor for that. I heard, Shea, that you have got a weather-related food story for us. <laughs> Well, Jennifer Klein and Mike Murphy were kind enough last night to bring me sushi for dinner during uh, race, but they brought it at a point in time where I was more excited about the possibility of a little bit of shut-eye. So I thought, you know what, keep it 
fresh by leaving it on the roof of the car as I take a little cat nap. Went to start eating it this morning and the cucumbers were completely frozen, so my sushi was icy. <laughs> excellent, excellent stuff. That's uh, what we put our pit reporters through here. It's like boot camp, I tell you, it really is. Uh, more pit stops with people uh, catching, coming through, uh, trying to catch a lap back there. Just going out. Uh, couple of prototypes uh, and did I see the Corvettes in and out as well uh, yes I did prototype class split ongoing at uh, 107.9 around the circuits XM Sirius XM 202 and around the world at imsradio.com Peter Mackay and John Hindorf well that was a busy evening stroke morning set or early morning session for Bruce and Johnny they arrived with all kinds of mayhem going on on the track and I think the best run of green they got was just over an hour uh, just getting on for two hours in fact wasn't it in that in that session but we are left with the situation that is uh, as far as the top of the charts are concerned, the timing charts, the Tristan Nunes in the number 31 Cadillac, which for pretty much the first half of the race had been the only one of the seven wheel and uh, the seven uh, DPIs, the wheel and engineering car, had not led. Uh, it's been uh, very much top of the pile since then, having now completed 505 laps, as has Tom Blomqvist for the second place DPI Marshank Racing with. Kerb Agajanian. Also on the lead lap, Tristan Fortier for JDC Miller Motorsports. That's the number five Mustang sampling sponsored car. Cadillac Racing, Earl Bamba, the 0 2. That's the black front, dark red rear. Earl on a similar stint program as Peter and me. As he was driving when we were last on. Also on the lead lap, the Konica Minolta, Acura, Minolta Acura, Ricky Taylor back behind the wheel of that car. Was two laps down, remember, that car. Now back on the lead lap. And it's the top five now. The seven have become five with wars for the other DPIs. Next best is the ally Cadillac of Jose Maria Lopez down in 14th position and 22 laps off the lead after all kinds of problems for that car. It does seem to be that if you have a problem, it turns into more problems and then the problems multiply even further. Colton Herter, Dragon Speed, leads in. LMP2, the number 81 car, that's the orange and bright yellow car. Sixth position overall for them. Ferdinand Habsburg, third, he's in the Tower Motorsport, number eight, second position. Uh, just eight, second, eight tenths off the lead behind the safety car, but still on the lead lap. Also, Rethink Team Netherland, Renus VK, back in behind the wheel of the number 29 Oringa, the Jumbo Supermarket sponsored machine. Scott Hofeke. The PR1 Matthias and Motorsports, the number 52, that's the Wins car. Uh, he's still on the lead lap. Then there's a bit of a gap. So six laps back to Ed Jones in the best of the Algarve Pro Racing run machines. And that is the number 68, 10th place overall. United Autosport not having the, their normal kind of run uh, down in sixth position for Will Owen. LMP3, Felipe Fraga for Riley Motorsports. And then it's GTD Pro, Daniel Huncadella leading for the 97 WeatherTech Mercedes. And Lucas R leads GTD for Winwood Racing. Take a deep breath with seven and a half hours to go. It's time to go back to Green Flag Racing on IMSA Radio. And the lead pair dive down towards turn one. 
Whelan and Mayor Shank racing side by side again. They've done this after every restart. The Acura, particularly with Castro Nevis aboard, has been very nimble off the start and gets round the outside. Buffalo Gals, brilliant stuff from Tom Blomqvist. Oh, the 31 Whelan car off gets a touch from, I think it was, the number five Mustang sampling machine. So Tristan Nunez off at the International Horseshoe gets a clip from behind, I'm fairly certain, for the number five of Tristan Vautier. Oh dear, John. Three wide oh. going to the kink of the court autosport car right in the middle somehow manages to survive that. Well, it was very, very close indeed. Not sure that we could convict on the evidence we've seen. Big dive down the inside. Now we can. If that was the second, uh, the second angle for the VAR, we're going to ask the ref to have a wander over and see that on the monitor again. It was ambitious with cold brakes. The front discs glowing brightly of uh, the number five Mustang sampling Tristan Vautier Cadillac. I think even on a restart lap, that might be deemed a little too ambitious. What the responsible adults would say many, as she said, coined this very many years ago, a low percentage lunge. An LPL for sure. LPL. <laughs> Some penalties coming through. Stop plus 10 for the number 99 for an improperly uh, improper emergency service. We've seen a few of that's those, a, haven't we? That's, that's Rod Furriel, the hard point car. Yeah. That was getting a lot of work early on. And also the number 11, Josh Pearson, is in the pits now for his drive through is that that was a pass under yellow all problems for the 21 uh, yeah, AF course, Corsa yeah. Ferrari and GTD uh, which at the moment is with Simon Mann driving that car is seventh at the moment but losing places hand over fist and whatever problem is uh, come a cropper for that car it's happened right at the wrong point just after the pit ends so it's had to go I will have to go all the way around I don't know what exactly the issue is, but the car going at about half speed, speed at the it? moment. No, no, well it's under speed. It slowed, as you say, Peter, just as he was going across the start-finish line. And for a moment, I just thought he was slowing down to go to turn one and possibly being a little circumspect, but he just didn't pick up any more speed after that. Very interesting. That's the, the red Ferrari with the uh, Argentinian uh, flag uh, stripped along the side of it. We've got two red Ferraris in the field. The 62 is the other one. That's the Rizzi Competizione GTD Pro Class car with the Pennzoil uh, sponsorship on it. There's uh, two Porsches side by side on the banking. The two KCMG and GTD Pro and the 16 Wright Motorsport in GTD. Uh, driving the number two at the moment. Lawrence KCMG Vantor. is Lawrence Vantor, yes, not indeed. A, not a pass for position, as no. Zach Robichon is third in his car class in right motorsport, about four seconds behind Oli Milroy for the McLaren from in Inception Racing, the number 70. And Lawrence Vantor, coincidentally, in the KCMG car, is about eight tenths of a second away from second place, Davide Rigon in that racing competition, the Pennzoil sponsored car and uh, Ferrari of Houston. So both the third place GTD Porsches there. Incident, uh, not a surprise, incident involving cars five, that's the Tristan Vote driven Mustang sampling Cadillac and car 31, wheel and engineering Cadillac of Tristan Nunez. Under review, the very hard working folks in race control having a look at that at the moment. Now, uh, the 21 Ferrari, which had an issue a moment ago, had the 97 WeatherTech Mercedes behind it, and oh my word, the number 11. Uh, LMP2 of Josh Pearson. Just out of the now, pits for uh, serving uh, his penalty. Uh, no, was coming into the pits and pulled ah. straight in front of the Ferrari and jammed the brakes on and, and, ah. and the Ferrari could do nothing. That's another penalty. It will be. Josh, well, no, Josh is coming back in front of the penalty. When he came in for his, his penalty, he was 10k over and he's had to come back in again. And, and he, he, he it, might it, have another one for pulling in front of the Ferrari. He got to commit earlier. Tristan oh. Forty is in the pit lane. Incident responsibility, as difficult as that is to take, I think Tristan will realise that uh, that was a, 
ambitious to say the least, and that is the least difficult decision, I think, that uh, race control has had to make. They've turned it around quickly. They've been really very, very efficient all the way through this evening and this morning. And, and the thing is, John, is that, that a drive-through penalty, there's no dubiety in that. You serve it and it's, and Get it's it out the way. black and white. It's not give the position back. It's nothing like that. I'm not a fan of that. Black uh, and white drive-through penalty. Thing. No, absolutely. Cut uh, and shot. It also sets... Uh, uh, it, it puts down a marker for yeah, everybody else. Yeah, yeah. The whole of the pit lane have seen the race control messages. Weather tech number 79. That is the AMG GT. No, it's a Porsche. Uh, sorry, that's the Porsche back out again. Yes, the 79. There's a bit of a story here. That car lost a, a lot huge of amount of time early on. It is still running in 45th position but well down, having only completed 437 laps. Julian Andlauer at the wheel of that. Check that, 440 laps. Uh, GT, best GTD, 480. But that is the car in which Cooper McNeil is doing the whole season. So that is his season he's weather tech sports car championship points all in that car but the number 97 weather tech mercedes his rolex watch winning car correct is exactly leading what we GTD said Pro. yes <laughs> so uh, that um well it just shows you having two cars in the game is really important looking at the dpi class obviously the zero one uh, uh, Chip Ganassi Cadillac uh, has hit problems and it's a long way down after an incident a few hours ago. However, having two cars in the game, uh, Earl Bamber in the 0-2 uh, Cadillac is in second position at the moment. Of course, uh, the Ganassi Cadillac, the 0-1, came so close to winning this race last year. They had a late race puncture and it just stripped it from their grasp. And that's when you've got strength in numbers. It's um, obviously there's more resource required to do it, but it's worth it. It's all oh, battle for the lead. Uh, sorry, battle for second position in GTD Pro between Davide Rigon in the Ferrari 62 and the two Porsche and Van Tor has got past Rigon as they head into the International Horseshoe and just two or three car lengths ahead is the leading GTD Pro 97 WeatherTech Mercedes of the Spaniard Daniel Juncadela. So we are into the early morning hours with breakfast approaching for many people. We remember in our Porsche keys to the race, we talked about breaking this up and, and we've got an 18 hour points position as well for the Michelin Endurance Cup at the sliver of a moon setting right over the airport so directly opposite from us and it's just starting to get a little tinge of red on it we've got about almost exactly an hour actually till official sunrise an extraordinary sight it is over the top of the forest whale on the infield yeah that moon is absolutely beautiful you just see the sort of almost like a c shape uh, at the moment whereas the uh, well we're going to have a real uh, a real picture postcard uh, sunrise in ah, about an hour. Photographers will be getting oh. themselves sorted out to get to their fav favourite spot. Yep. Great to see that Jamie Price was back on site here in the USA after his trials, tribulations and extended stay in Italy, wasn't it, at the back yeah. end of last year? Remember him tuning in to Motul Petit Le Mans remotely? I, mean, I actually interviewed Jamie when he was in uh, COVID jail, as he called it. Uh, but he'd been, the funny thing was, he'd been doing a job for Lamborghini when he tested positive for COVID. And he actually had to stay on, stay on and he was actually going to a job for Ferrari at Mugello. The only problem was he hadn't been home to get new clothes, so he had to turn up to his job Oops. for Ferrari <laughs> in his Lamborghini merchandise as well. But uh, uh, I'm sure that was uh, understandable in the, in, the, in the circumstances. Morning to Duncan Vincent. That looks cold. Out in the morning air in Scotland, where it is just after 11 in the morning. Out with Otto. With a John McGuinness beanie hat on. Yeah, of course he has. Uh, 
Let's go to share for an update on the number 21 AF course of Ferrari. I wanted to check in on this car because the crew was standing up on the wall for the last three laps waiting for the car to come in. But as it turns out, there was no damage sustained from the hit, the car spinning, and now it's just a recovery drive for, is it still Nicholas Nielsen in that car? No, it's Simon Mann in the 21 AF course Ferrari. Yeah, yeah and, correct. And still within with a, a couple more yellow flags, and we'll be right back in, uh, right back in the hunt of things. Um, so it's not definitely not done for fans of Ferrari in both GTD and GTD Pro. Of course, the Rizzi Competizione car has been really, really strong on race day, and he's back up to pace. He was right oh, yeah. back on the pace yeah, yeah, after yeah. that slow lap that we saw, or slow half a lap felt sure that he was going to come in the pit lane and from what she was move, saying there move said the, the same in, thing move the lead in gtd pro lawrence vantor goes straight up the inside of daniel yunkadela can he get it pulled down in time at turn one he has lawrence vantor's up for this one this morning fresh driver makes such a difference in these situations so it's kcmg porsche to the front at gtd pro two tenths as he crossed the line but the aerodynamic effect let it dive down the inside Fair play to Junkadella. He realized, I think, that that was a lost cause. That wasn't the battle he was going to fight right now. Uh, well, I think, John, we're about to have golden hour in more ways than one because not only did Lawrence Vantor set the fastest lap of the race in GTD Pro, a 145.0, I'll say that again, 145.0. Junkadella nearly matched him, 145.3, his that, personal that was, best. Yeah, that car's best of the race, so correct. they're flying at the front of GTD Pro. That has just been a dogfight all day long. It's been a GTLM throwback. Uh, in that class, and that's exactly what it's designed to be. Fantastic. Yeah, and coming up, as I say, to another milestone in about uh, an hour or so, as we, just over an hour, as we award more points for the Michelin in June's Cup, and we talked about our Porsche keys to the race, breaking up the race midnight, get the dawn, get the noon, 13 hours and 14 minutes from sunset to sunrise. 7.14. So just under an hour away before we can officially say that the night is over. Three minutes shorter than the longest darkness period that we will cover in a 24-hour race this year. That was at Dubai. So, unsurprisingly, uh, incident at pit entry involving cars yeah. 11. That's the LMP2 uh, machine uh, of... Uh, no, 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 click through my... That was Josh the Pearson, he was Madison. coming back in to... Yeah. And, uh, in the 21 AF Corsa Ferrari. So, no surprise that that's under review, and we'll get a, a, Remember a, a that verdict was, in a moment. That wasn't contact, that was Josh. He'd just been in for a penalty for... Overtaking under yellow, sp had a speeding penalty, and then had to come back in again, which he did the following lap, but he committed very, very late indeed, and chopped right the clock. Incident responsibility, entering the pits, stop plus 60. Stop plus 60 when he went right across the AF Corsa. Well, that is going to take that car way out of contention at this stage of the game. And that'll drop them another lap away. There are laps between the LMP2s from sort of uh, second and third, uh, fifth and sixth rather, on down. The top four are still on the lead lap in plus. Spin on the infield, caught all the sport, down at the new Le Mans chicane, newly named. And the caught all the sport number 54. Flexbox machine, distinctive with the tangerine front end. Now, he was in a gaggle of cars when he came in past us the lap before, but I think he's just looped that himself. Oh, lucky not to get collected, but I think it was the windward Mercedes just, just uh, following along behind. Third place in LMP3, George Kurtz was holding his own there. Sean Quich, Motorsport in second, the 33 car with Martha Jacobson. Behind the wheel and Felipe Fraga leads that LMP3 class for Riley in the 74, the right 74 car. Now getting some more pit callers. Oh, no, this is, uh, this is Josh Pearson coming. Well, 
I uh, hope he can leave the engine running because he'll get very cold very quickly. He was up on the high banks with the 21 AF Corsa with the Tricolore ahead of him on that Ferrari. Decides to... Oh, there was contact. I hadn't realised there was contact there, Peter. Yeah. So that's what slowed the 21 across the start-finish line. That's correct, It yeah. wasn't a mechanical issue. It was the fact that Simon Mann was doing his best not to spin at full speed as he was forced down onto the grass on the infield. Somehow he gathered it back together. There's a little damage on the left rear of the prototype where he chopped across the nose and the right front of that Ferrari. I, I had not realised that that had been the yeah. as significant a contact as that. That could have been huge. No wonder. No wonder that is a stop plus... 60, 60 seconds. Uh, that, I think that's a super call from race control because, like you say, if that had gone wrong at that point of the circuit in an open pit lane like we have, uh, it, it could have been could have been really quite messy as well. So I think that it's a it's it's a stern penalty, but I think that required uh, that, especially after that car had been serving uh, a, a penalty already. So it was kind of a flurry of penalties all at once. So I think they they do kind of. Uh, have a kind of cumulative effect, but this, of course, is a bit of an all star lineup with Josh Pearson, Stephen Thomas, Harry Tinknell, and Jonathan Bomarito. Um, so, no, I mean, really, all star lineup, one of the strongest in uh, in the class. Of course, Josh Pearson, 15 year old from Portland, Oregon, I believe, will be the youngest entrant in Rolex 24 history, but this is. Uh, uh, a Youngest pretty person uh, to start the race. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, a pretty oh problem for the number 97 for GTD Pro WeatherTech Mercedes. Leader. This Daniel is the leader. Cadella was the leader uh, after Vantor went by. It could oh, be sorry, a puncture. Yes, yeah, second now. Um, could be a puncture. Uh, there's smoke pouring out of the back of that Mercedes. Left it, rear, Peter, is it? Ah, uh, it's, it's one of the rears. Uh, oh, the, oh no, actually no. I think it might be the front, front left. Front left. Oh. It's, it's that aerodynamic thing again, isn't it, where the the smoke comes out from underneath. I'm looking at all the Michelin tyres. I think they've got air in them. That may be engine-related. She will be able to smell it before we can work it out. Came down into turn one, looked fine there. Now maybe just went a little bit wide through the kink to turn through, clip the kerb on the right-hand side. No, there's oil smoke or some kind of steam coming out well of the vents. Shea Adam is watching that car into the pit lane, Shay. No, John, it's not here yet, but the 0-2 Cadillac just went behind the oh, wall, back drama. to the garage. Oh. Drama for one of the favourite cars. Earl Bamba had been r running very well indeed, and that car behind the wall means I'm the WeatherTech 97, which up until recently had been leading, had been passed on the track for the lead in GTD Pro. This is Cooper McNeil's chance of a Rolex, Andy. Another problem down at the International Horseshoe. If you've been spectating down there, you've had your money's worth already this weekend. It's the... Car number 69 for G-Drive yeah. racing. Uh, Algar Pro racing. Algar Pro, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Now, that is, that's dead stick down there. And again, when he last went by us, he was in a gaggle oh. of cars. Did he get to... Well, right, so the core autosport machine... No, excuse the me, the Wins 52... Uh, with the... It's the... That has what spun the around in front. The Wins PR1 Matheson 52 has gone round, and then it seemed to me that in avoiding that, the Algar Pro Racing... G drive car stalled and couldn't restart. Full course yellow, another full course yellow. So the 97. And she's now got the 97 in the pit lane, ship. That took a long time for Daniel Yucadella to make it all the way around. Let me see. They go to the right front tire first. Uh, nope, that one still has air in it. Right rear still has air in it. There's a lot of white smoke pouring out from this car. The hood comes up. Oh, boy. Yeah, a lot of white smoke from the engine bay. Although the last time it came in, I have to say, I did see a lot of white smoke coming out then, too. This is quite a bit more, though, as... Let's see. The other two Michelin tires coming off the car 
are still inflated, they are still good. There is still a brand new left front that has not gone on this car yet, as there is a mechanic looking with a flashlight or a torch uh, in the engine compartment. No plane involved, don't worry, Americans. Uh, and not really signaling that he's seeing anything in particular wrong with this car. All right, all four tires have been changed this time, which did not happen on one of the previous pit stops as reported by Jules Gunion. And now all three of the mechanics are in the engine bay. I think this thing is down on water, if I would have to guess. Hang on, let me pull my mask down and take a sniff. There's no discernible smell as to what is wrong with this car, John. Have to say, but Daniel Yucanella just popping up in the door as if he's to indicate, yep, I'm going to be here for a little while. Um, I'm going to run back to the garage and see if I can find out what's wrong with the Cadillac. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Good idea. We'll keep an eye on what's going on via our colleagues at NASCAR Productions in the pit lane and the binoculars. Uh, I, I think that's an oil union, perhaps, that's come off. And I wonder also, then, if that was laying a bit of fluid down when it was coming through the infield. Three mechanics, now four mechanics working. One in his best snooker pose, trying to keep one toe on the ground before he falls into the V8 engine compartment. They are shining the torches down, and, yeah, they've... Turmeric smell is what I'm hearing from Shear. Well, that could be overheating. I know exactly what she means by that. Yeah, that's it. That's interesting. I mean, I think there is definitely something to do with uh, the fl the fluid that may well have leaked from that number 97 Mercedes, which caused the two prototypes, the uh, 52 uh, Wins um, LMP2 machine and the uh, which one was it? it was the 69 G Drive Algar Pro Racing car. So, oh, that's a real pity. The number 97 being passed around, uh, but pushed behind the wall. Sorry, she. That's a disaster for that team. Yeah, it is down here in the garage. Uh, I'm going to see if I can step in with Earl Bamber really quickly. He's standing next to the car. Earl, hate to do this. What's going on? Uh, we have a continued fuel issue from when Kevin had, so now both of them are gone, so we have to stop and repair. So, yeah. bit of a shame, but anyway, that's racing. So, it's the fuel pump acting up again? Yeah, the fuel pump. So, yeah, we went to reserve and then the reserves failed as well. So, yeah, bit of a shame. I think we had a, a really good car and, you know, pace to, to run at the front. So, yeah, now we'll be too far back to, to fight at the end, but uh, we'll get back out there and, and score some points. Yeah, you've proven that you're going to be a formidable duo with Alex for this season. So uh, good luck at Sebring. Thank you. All about a bit of damage limitation in terms of points if they can get back out. You don't have to dash back to a report on the WeatherTech AMG that uh, was second in class when it came in, had been leading for a wee while, They're rather thoughtfully pushing it back towards you. And it's still steaming. Oh, they're so considerate to bring it to me. Yeah, I'll follow it down. It's a couple of uh, garages further down, but yeah, that's a lot of white smoke pouring out of it. Uh, is, is there, there any fluid pump? coming out from underneath it, Shea, can you see? Uh, yes. Um, well, wait a minute. Let me walk over. No, that's a crack in the asphalt. <laughs> that, that actually did right. fool me. <laughs> that's fine. We've all done that. Yeah. Thank you, Shea. Get an update in a moment. Just over seven hours still to go. We're under full course yellow. And the first vestiges of light just beginning to be visible, looking down towards the beach. Being very, very clear. There's a little bit of a marine layer just beyond the coast, but the setting moon illuminated at the moment, looking absolutely fantastic with the inky black sky fading down through lighter into blue and then uh, an almost an ochre red in the distance as we await the sun to make its appearance in around about 45 minutes time clear up down at the that's the international horseshoe it, it, yeah. is it the international horseshoe or is that the western horseshoe where all that action happened peter i think oh you be. are correct sorry yeah. i do apologize yes yeah uh, no, i think i give you the uh, the bump steer earlier. You are absolutely correct. It is the Western Horseshoe where the 69G drive car. Now that's very strange because it didn't look like there was any contact. I wonder if it's maybe been a, I don't know, 
some sort of mechanical failure. There's no that, lights right? on that car or anything. It was yeah, jab was on the angles to, to miss the spinning uh, 52 wins PR1 Matheson car. And then it just didn't move. No, it maybe was just it, I think fire it up again. I don't know. I think what's happened is the pickups come out of the slot. You know, when you, if you just maybe got a little bit around there, pickups, and somebody just needs to put their pickup back in the slot and squeeze and will go. Well, it's Tom Blomquist that's at the top of the shop at the moment for the number 60 Meyershank Racing Acura. And well, now, although it was a. When we started off this race, it was five Cadillacs versus two Acuras. That is equaled out now. It's now effectively three Cadillacs versus two Acuras uh, in the battle for DPI, which has just been stunning to, to watch at the moment. It is the two Acuras that are at the top, but there is all of those leading protagonists, the 60 Meyershank Acura, the 10 Wayne Taylor Racing Acura, the 31 Whelan Cadillac, the, and the five uh, Mustang sampling Cadillac of Tristan Vote on the lead lap. So in fact, actually, I do apologise. That is, it is two Cadillacs versus two Acuras at the moment on the lead lap. So this dogfight is going to continue for the next seven hours or so. But that is devastating for the Zero Two crew uh, of uh, Ganassi Cadillac. And uh, you could just tell John there in the. Uh, Errol, of course, is gracious as always, but you can just hear the disappointment coming through him. But the pits are about to get busy, Shay. Yeah, I think she's still behind the ah, of wall at the moment, so we'll get the binos out and keep an eye into the pit lane. Auto Nation Series XM number 60. Meshack Racing comes in for a new set of Michelin tyres, and it's Elio Castro Nevers was getting himself ready. I haven't seen him get into that car, though. A bit of a wiped down as well also a little bit further back down the pit lane. in fact all of the top nine have come in ed jones in the 68 apr car the sister car to the g drive machine that's uh, part of the cause of this yellow flag ed jones stayed out paul luke shannon for era stayed out as well they're trying to get laps back in the lmp2 battle Car that was facing in the wrong direction in LMP2. The number 52 wins P1 Matheson car. Well, that's in the pit with Scott Huffinger, as is the third place Tower Motorsport car. They're on the lead lap, as well as Renus VK, the racing team in the Netherlands, number 29 in second, and Colton Herder for Dragon Speed, also in the pit lane. Earl Bamba, we know, is behind the wall and losing laps now, so it's down to four. The seven became six, then five, and now four. Just a quartet of potential winners for the 60th running of the Rolex 24 Daytona. Tom Blomqvist out first for the number 60. Mayor Shank racing with Kerb Agajanian. Pink and white, Acura. Then it's Ricky Taylor. Acura 1-2 now. Tristan Nunes, little longer stop. And Tristan Vautier in fourth position. That's how they left the pit lane in LMP2. Dragon Speed held on to the lead as they went out, I believe. Devon Di Francesco, uh, Devlin jumping into that car and now has the unenviable task of trying to get some heat in the tyres whilst behind the safety car. Racing Team Netherlands has held on to Reynus VK, stayed in that car. Tower Motorsport, Ferdinand Habsburg stayed in that car and Scott Huffaker stayed in the PR1 car. There's oil dry going down on the circuit from the safety team. So I think now, well, it, I mean, we say oil dry, it's just to take the fluid up. It could have been water. It very seldom is water in racing engines nowadays. Water looks coolant is very, very popular, but you're not allowed in IMSA racing uh, anything that would make the surface slippery. So we have a, an official coolant of IMSA, and that's VP Steer Frosty which is uh, very, very efficient indeed. And it doesn't have any of the nasty bits that lays like a slick on the top of the surface. 
Pits open for GT. Have you made it back, Shay? Are you still investigating WeatherTech? Nope, I came back out. They said it would be a while before they would have a resolution to the issue. They were putting it up on the hijacks and trying to figure out what exactly was causing all that white smoke. Uh, it's a lot of pit callers coming in at this end of pit lane. I've got the two KCMG Porsche. That is Lawrence Vantor staying aboard, and it looks like fuel and tires for Larry. Fuel and tires with the 14 Lexus as well, as that is Jack Foxworth's bright green livery helmet. Uh, so that will be a driver change going on there too. We've got ooh, a crunch of GTD pit stops at the other end of the pit lane, and John, one more note about the DPI stop. Yeah, it was correct. Elio Castroneves is still sitting on the box for Fire Tank Racing. He looks like he's freezing though. He's wearing his helmet. I don't think he wants to take it off because it's extra warmth for his head. It's not the worst idea, actually. I noticed Nick Tandy earlier on was uh, prowling around the garage area with his balaclava on. Um, not because he thought he was getting in the car any time, but it was keeping his ears warm, Very Peter, clever. to be honest. That, yeah. that, that's uh, a driver who's had the uh, peril of standing on the pit wall at a British short oval in uh, uh, so. in an evening, a cold evening. Very, very wise indeed, uh, Mr. Tandy. Driver change as well in the 62 Rizzi Ferrari in that set of pit stops as well. So Davide Rigon getting uh, out. Let's see who, once he comes over the timing beam, who uh, has jumped aboard that 62 Rizzi Ferrari as the burning ember out to the east continues to rise up as well and John Hindoff alongside me in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre can't help but take a, a very Instagram worthy photo uh, of that rising Florida sunrise if you're out around the uh, watching around the circuit, braving the cold weather. If you're just coming out of maybe a little bit of a, a light slumber, yeah, it's worth it waking up now to see this beautiful sunrise here over the World Centre of Racing, Daytona International Speedway. Confirming it's Daniel Serra, who's got on board the uh, 62 Rizzi Ferrari, taking over from Davide Rigon. So, Difficult day for the number 79 WeatherTech Porsche. Uh, such a promising lineup with Julian Anlauer, Alessio Piccarello, Matteo Cairoli, and Cooper McNeil. But they plow on despite a lot of delays. They've kept going and in the true spirit of endurance. Julian Anlauer uh, is at the wheel of that car at the moment. And he had such an impressive run in his opening stint. And continues to to rise up. He's from uh, actually from Lyon, so there must be something in the water in that French Leon town. Lyon C is that? See again, sorry. Lyon C. Le Not Leon C. The same one. I don't. It's something more glamorous than that. Lyon, of course, that's where Kevin Estre is from. So there must be something in the water there. And Julian Andler, he is a bit of a Kevin Estre 2.0. Uh, certainly an incredibly quick driver. So. A couple more takers coming in to pit lane now to get their service. Still a little bit of track cleanup going on on the run from the Western Horseshoe, which I think may well be completed now as the Whalen number 31 uh, Cadillac back into the pits. Huh, that's it. Shea, down to you in pit lane. Shame. There's a new nose going on this car, and uh, that's a bit interesting because I don't think they've had any frontal contact with anyone, uh, not as far as I can remember. But yes, that is the only work going on in the car now. They did top it off with a bit more fuel. I was expecting Corvette Racing to come down the pit lane. I've seen Antonio Garcia helmeted and ready for his stint, so I was going to try and grab Nick Katzberg. But uh, there goes the Whalen Cadillac. Good news is the light at the pit exit should be off, i.e. green, by the time he gets there because safety car is still nowhere near to be seen.
friends to come to see you. Shit. We've got both of the Corvettes into the pits as expected. It is not a driver change for the four, that is fuel and tires for the gray Cadillac, but for the yellow one for the number three Corvette, excuse me, I don't know where Cadillac came from. Uh, it is a driver change as expected. Antonio Garcia will also be getting new tires. These are sticker tires. It's going to be difficult to get some heat into them. Going back out of the pits first is the 79 WeatherTech Racing Porsche, then the 27 Heart of Racing Aston Martin. Now we've got Closely followed out by the three. And then both of the BMWs are in for service as well, but there is a car immediately in the pit box ahead of the 25, so the 24 is pulled back first. And now just waiting for service to finish for the 25. It's a bit more chaotic when they do this final opportunity for pit stops, and then cars from both classes can come in because the staggered stops, well, they don't quite work when you've got a prototype right in front of you who elects to take the emergency service like you. Elio Castroneves, thank you, Shay. Elio Castroneves in the Meyershank Racing Pits, the Indy 500 champion, four times sitting wrapped up cosy. He's got his helmet on, he wants to get going, but uh, didn't manage to get on board, didn't manage to wrestle Tom Blomquist out of the cockpit of the number 60 Meyershank Racing Acura. And uh, we'll have to wait another stint, and he's uh, jiggling around trying to keep himself warm with. Look uh, what looks like multiple pit jackets. Now I see a WeatherTech Mercedes coming back onto the pit lane. Fantastic work from the Proton Mechanics to get that number 97 AMG back out and moving again. So we'll have lost a few laps. Uh, we'll try and confirm how many, but that's uh, really fast work from the number 97 uh, WeatherTech Mercedes crew. Now it's the GTD Pro entry. So the 48 Cadillac onto pit road for a top up of fuel and a change of tires as well, yes. Well, this car laps down, of course, which is why it didn't come in straight away. Jose Maria Lopez getting the call to stay out. Now will be, I think, just a couple of laps back if he can get out without having to stop. Oh, the red lights are on at the end of the pit lane as he rolls along. Now, let's see, they've gone green. Just as he's coming up to them, they've gone green. So the purple and white ally Cadillac will go out, had a new nose and a new tail early on after some raucous behavior in the mid-pack. Shit, Adam, where are you now? With Nick Katzberg fresh out of the number three Corvette, that's the bright yellow one. It hasn't been the best race for Corvette racing, but so much valuable learning. How much better is it when you guys can test and be out on track with other cars as opposed to on a track all by yourself? No, this is, this is definitely nice to, to be able to kind of understand the tire better and to see where we are compared to the competition. Obviously, we are kind of out of the race, but Corvette will never, never give up anyway, so this is a good learning for us and it's very valuable time now to understand the tire better and the way we have to kind of set up the car around the tire. Do you feel like going into Sebring you're going to be much better off than coming into Daytona? I think I think so, yes. I mean, we're learning and learning more, so this is valuable time and uh, hopefully we can kind of have a better car to start with in uh, Sebring. How difficult is it to get heat into the tires? Because you guys have the best burnouts on the pit lane. That's got to do something, right? Yeah, the burnouts are awesome. But that's only the rear tires. Unfortunately, the fronts are still taking a very long time. And it's very, very tricky out there. It's super cold, so you have to be really careful. But so far, no accidents, so all good. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. Very good. To hear from Nicky Katzberg there. And the, uh, just a quick run through before we go back to green in GTD. There's a number of cars on the lead lap at the moment. Zachary Robichon leads for the number 16 Wright Motorsport Porsche with Phil Ellis in the windward number 57 Mercedes. The 32 uh, Gilbert Shortoff Mercedes of Scott Andrews is third with the Aston Martin, the Magnus Aston Martin of Johnny Adam from Kirkcaldy in Scotland. He's in fourth, uh, Jordan Pepper. Uh, for the number 70 Inception McLaren, and also Tony Vlander in the AF Corsa Ferrari. So despite that big scare for that 21 AF Corsa Ferrari, they are on the lead lap in GTD. In GTD Pro, we have 
five cars on the lead lap at the moment. Lawrence Vantor leads for the KCMG Porsche team with Austin Sindrick, uh, who's driven superbly at the wheel of the 15 uh, Proton Mercedes. In third is Felipe Nazar on his debut for the Porsche factory in the uh, Plaid uh, FAF machine. And Jack Hawksworth for Lexus, Vassar Sullivan Lexus, number 14. Uh, GTD Pro entry after a, a couple of penalties earlier on, a couple of incidents earlier on, they're back in the game as well. And Daniel Serra also in the very quick number 62, Rizzi Competizione uh, Ferrari as well. So in the GT categories, it is so close, but unfortunately, bad news for fans of the WeatherTech Mercedes is back into the pit lane and has gone straight behind the wall. So whatever issue we thought was repaired. Unfortunately, something is still underlying underneath that big, uh, that big front engine machine, the big brute, and the WeatherTech mechanics signaling for the car to come back. Did that into drive the back? Yes, it did. That it did, did drive in. Yeah. Oh, that's such a shame for that crew. They have not Gilles had Grignon. any kind of look, have they? No. In this race. No. No, no, the WeatherTech operation, I mean, obviously, you, 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 you have to take your hat off to, to, to WeatherTech Racing to bring so many cars here um, for, for Cooper McNeil doing double duty in two different cars. Not easy to adapt back and forth and uh, big effort is just, just not been their day. But that is that is why the Rolex 24 Hours in Daytona is such a prestigious race to win because, well, it's so difficult to win because stuff like that can happen over a 24 hour race. You're putting man and machine through a lot of stress as uh, a pretty dejected El Bamber looks at the Ganassi mechanics going to work on the 0-2 Cadillac. They will be back. They will be a force in the IMSA WeatherTech Championship in 2022. Make no mistake about that. Alex Lind drove very, very well at the turn of midnight uh, when he was behind the wheel. Um, and they, they've got a fast car and very, very fast drivers indeed. So, fuel prompt problems, mm. even with a secondary problem. I thought it was interesting there, you know, you got an endurance car, you, you try and double up on everything. Uh, so a secondary pump still didn't kick it in. Now there's some, well, Bamber is just dejected there as he walked through, arms folded. You've done the, it's awful when things start to go wrong at this part of the race. You're about to go into the last third of the race. There's Michelin Endurance Cup points up for grabs in 50 minutes' time. And yet, you, you kind of feel you're broke in the back of the race with the sun about to come up, the smell of sausages and bacon cooking in the hospitality. You've, you've almost got to breakfast time. You've gone through that 13 hours plus of, of night time. Really, really cruel endurance racing. Looks good down on the beach, the Daytona beach down at A1A. And just starting to come to life. Many of you coming back to the track, I know. 107.9 FM, Sirius XM 202. And we've pleased, delighted, in fact, to say that Sirius XM have come on board again for 2022, which means every WeatherTech Sports Car Championship race will be live in its entirety with no interruptions. For those of you so equipped in the USA and Canada. So if you are moving around, I know we had a, a few Canadians earlier in the race tuned in who were moving around, the screenshots of their car dashboards. So that is always an option for you as the season progresses. Of course, if you haven't got that kind of equipment, you can always uh, just connect your smart device to your car and stream via imsaradio.com. Use the uh, internet. Always live coverage of qualifying and the race as a minimum, although we've done all the free practice sessions here as well for WSC, and he said World Sports Cars there, but it might as well be, really. Now, safety car lights are out. The BMW M4 in the 
fetching shades of Sao Paulo will accelerate away as it exits the new back sh straight chicane same chicane, new name Le Mans and the first chicane on the Lindo Antonadier the road down from Le Mans to towards Tours, the old main road now being bypassed by uh, Payage, a toll road, but still very popular, particularly with lorries, actually. HGVs. Uh, the first chicane, that's the one that goes to the right, first of all. Curving entry to that, just beyond the old 24-hour restaurant there. And that will now be known as the Virage Daytona. Coming back to green then, Acura, Tom Blomqvist leads from Ricky Taylor in second, Tristan Vaudier and Tristan Nunez, top four still on the lead lap as they head down towards turn one. The Acura with a decent jump away, just half a second at the line, a little lot ups behind in the LMP2 category, led by Tower Motorsport. So Ferdinand Habsburg in the lead now from Racing Team Netherlands. Renus VK and Del uh, Devlin Di Francesco for Dragon Speed. They're all on the same lap as is Scott Hofer. So top four in P P2 and top four in DPI still on the lead lap in their categories. Scott Dixon in the 01 uh, Cadillac, uh, Cadillac V Performance Academy machine. Uh, although a number of laps down showing absolutely no quit at all, trying to get his way to the front of the DPI pack and try to start getting some laps back. You just never know. Now, some penalties coming through. Um, car 97, that's the WeatherTech Mercedes that's hit issues working on car in a close fit. Stop plus oh. 60. I mean, that's just rubbing salt in the wind. It will be quite inconsequential there. Car 4, that's the one of the Corvettes. Pit lane speed violation again. Rubbing salt into a pretty open wind there for that crew as well. But the 62 Rizzi Ferrari making good progress already, uh, getting past the 15 uh, WeatherTech Mercedes of Austin Sindrick, so wanting to make quick progress to the front of the GTD Pro Pack, which is led by the number two, Lawrence Van Tor. As the number nine of Felipe Nazar getting a good draft from one of his colleagues, the 16 right Porsche of Zachary Robichon. With the 62 Rizzi Ferrari going up on the high side, going up over the around the outside of the number 15 of Austin Sindrick. They are absolutely door mirror to door mirror as they come down into turn one. Sarah's going to go the long way round, but Sindrick is too good on the brakes, and we've got two spinners at turn one. One of them rejoining. It's a prototype. I think 22. It might... It's the 22 oh, well, of the United Autosport and the Tower oh. Car. So that is right at the front. That was the leader in the LMP2 class, Ferdinand. No, Habsburg. no, no. No, it was the 11 of Josh Pearson. Uh, sorry, it was the 11 of Josh Pearson. My apologies. Oh, so yeah. the United car spun. It's the 22. I think it's, is it Guy Smith driving that car? Yes, yeah, uh, so Guy is, Smith. Yeah. Le Mans 2003 Bentley Boy Le Mans winner, Guy Smith, spins. So if it, there you go, someone of Guy's experience, it shows you how difficult it is on those cold tyres. Was tires. there a coming together or was that just synchronised spinning? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe give Guy the benefit of the doubt there. But... Uh, Lawrence Van Tor again making full advantage of this restart using the cars behind him to create a buffer in class as Felipe Nazar getting more and more comfortable with this Porsche 911 GT3R of course uh, outgoing champion in DPI last year and now racing for the Porsche factory and will be part of that LMD8 program starting in the GTP category next year in the EMSA WeatherTech Championship. A lot of work to do in development, alongside his new colleague, Dane Cameron. Of course, a driver very familiar, familiar to the Penske outfit. We have daylight, we have sunshine, almost, here at the World Centre of Racing. And we're back under green flag conditions where we like to be. And the, now the 62 Ferrari uh, the Rizzi Competizione Ferrari has got past, Daniel Serra has got past Austin Sindrick. 
in the 15 WeatherTech Mercedes. So Rigi Competizione Ferrari on the march again. And Jack Hawksworth now all over the back of Felipe Nazar for second position in GTD Pro. So the dogfight in GTD Pro continues and Guy Smith's had to come into pit lane in the 22 United Auto Sports machine. So maybe a flat spot on those tires, possibly after that spin. And the United Auto Sports mechanics go to work on putting on some new Michelin tires. And uh, folks at United uh, welcome Joe Bradley and I a couple of days ago. Uh, we had a nice cup of Yorkshire tea. As you would expect for the should expect outfit, nothing, of course, nothing yeah. different. It, no, it just a, a moment restorative. Or, moment or two ago, going onto the high banks at turn six, seven, oh, and 30. in the wall for the leader in that category. Tower Motorsport and Racing Team Netherlands fighting it out in yellow and black cars. Is there a little stripe down the side? A bit more orange for Ferdinand in that uh, tower car. Down through turn one, pulls to the inside. Everybody gets perilously close to my eyes to that tyre stack that is just about on the apex of the first part of turn one. And a couple of people shave it at the raw last weekend. Was that only last weekend? It feels like a lot. Yeah. Lifetime ago at IMSA Radio, if you want to get in touch with us, if you're here at the track, let's have your sunrise pictures. All of a sudden, it's got very light very quickly. Officially, the sun's not up for another 15 minutes or so. As we come to the seven o'clock hour in the morning with six hours and 40 minutes or thereabouts to go, it's gonna get very bright and very warm in our booth as the sun streams into it. That's when we go from feeling like uh, We've been in a cold room to feeling like we're in a greenhouse. But you know what? It's all part of the Daytona International experience. It really is. In this, uh, we talk, we've been talking about this all race week, the coexistence between the GTD class and GTD Pro. The, co the cars are the same. Uh, the cars are identical whether you enter the GTD Pro or the GTD class. The only difference is GTD Pro, as the name suggests, is filled with all pro drivers whereas GTD is a mix of pro and amateur driver. However, the driver at the wheel of the uh, number 70 Inception McLaren is a full pro, Jordan Pepper, and he is actually making a bit of a nuisance of himself for the GTD Pro uh, runners as well, much to the benefit of Daniel Serra in the 62 Breezy Ferrari, and much to the hindrance of Austin Sindrick. It's actually split, the two classes are splitting each other up, and. Got the, that coexistence is going to be a huge talking point all season, I think. Earlier on, the lap record went a couple of times, more than that, actually. 133.8 is where it stands at the moment at the G, JDC Miller Motorsport Cadillac DPI, number five in third position. Last time around, a 34 flat for Ricky Taylor tells you how hard he's trying to close the one second gap between himself and leader Tom Blomqvist our Porsche keys to the race those milestones sunshine sun up morning we're getting close to that and the tyres well the Michelin tyres have done really good work oh. during the cold night Michelin very confident that the chilly temperatures that they saw at the Petit Le Mans last November, remember, running very late that, would uh, stand them in good stead here. We haven't actually seen officially on the uh, the track and race temperature from Alcamel, we never actually got down to freezing or minus numbers. It stayed at one degree in the air, and the lowest I've seen is what we've got now, three degrees on the track. It was four for most of the overnight session now that's not to say that that isn't chilly and the, anywhere where there's a bit of wind blowing through that's going to feel a lot colder than that out onto the run down to the Le Mans chicane on the back straight drivers are going to start to get the sun in their eyes make sure you've got a visor with uh, either a strip on it or something that you can pull down in front of your eyes for the next portion of the race Tom Blomqvist. 
personal best sector one for Tom Block was last time around. He has to, uh, he's being chased 30, up. 30, well, they were both 34-0 last time, separated by four hundredths of a second. So the two Acuras at the front, Wayne Taylor Racing number 10 of Ricky Taylor and the, the Myershank Racing number 60 of Tom Blomquist, they are absolutely playing for keeps uh, at the moment. The number 10, Cunningham and Elder Acura with its toe hitch, almost like a gun sight from uh, World War One era playing ahead of Ricky Taylor and he's almost got a shot at the lead <laughs> at the moment. Wow, really close to the wall for the leader there as he turned in and dropped down to turn one. Wonder if Tristan Fortier at first, excuse me, Tom Blomqvist was just a, a little bit rattled. Maybe there was a missile lock there and he got the uh, Got the beep in his ear, but certainly he missed the apex of the first left-handed part of turn one. Well, the uh, Ricky Taylor going quicker again, another personal best, 133.902. We're getting close to the fastest lap of the race. He's going to lose time here, though, Peter, because yeah. he's got to go around the TGM Porsche, which itself was being time. passed uh, by the 42, the white Lamborghini. And in fact, that's letting him into the clutches of Tristan Vautier for JDC Miller, who was all of half a second back when they crossed the line. So Tom Blomqvist stretching out. It gets light so quickly, doesn't it? Oh, every time I look up and down for the timing screen, I'm like, oh, somebody's put the dimmer switch up a bit more. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Well, that shows you that traffic gives and takes, and Tom Blomquist has negotiated that traffic, just that, you know, just had the traffic fall at the right places, so Ricky Taylor's got the work all to do again. But those Acuras really boogie when they get that three and a half litre turbocharged V6 wound up on the high bankings, it really flies. The Cadillac's got the grunt out of the corner, yeah. but when they get up to speed, my word, Scott Dixon on the move in the 0-1, he's going to make a move, oh, not quite. I thought he was going to make a dive there into turn one on the number five Mustang sampling Cadillac. So despite being a number of laps down, the Ganassi uh, Cadillac, the performance accessories Cadillac of Scott Dixon showing absolutely no quit. And what else would you expect from the tenacious Kiwi? Six times an IndyCar champion, four times a winner here, three outright and one in class. What a driver he is. And yeah, he's got one, one mode, has Scott. Steve, delighted to see that those top four DPIs after another yellow are still within five seconds or so of each other. And traffic is going to be one of the deciding factors. That was our top point in our Porsche keys to the race. That was the big key, to be honest. The guys have done really well, you know, they, we talked about setup and no dry running uh, this week. And I think most people have got the setup right. So clearly they didn't need nearly as much practice as they said they did, is what I'm going to say to that. <laughs> I'm only kidding. Well, I, I, I think uh, right now uh, when, when, well, tomorrow morning or whenever Michelin do their debrief, I've got to think they've all got to give it themselves a big pat on the back totally because this agree. was an unknown for them. And I wouldn't have wanted to be a Michelin engineer yesterday morning heading into the race. But it just shows how much of a window their tyre has and how much That's it's capable of and uh, what it can do. And then, um, well, yeah, big, big hats off to the folks at Michelin. Because if we've seen it in the past when certain you know races in the past if there's been uh, a, pr a problem with tires it, it can completely spoil a motor race so oh, yes. uh, michelin are carrying a, a seriously a seriously important uh, responsibility and yeah they they built, they built a great tire uh ferdy habsberg well clearly that skiff or brush with the wall heading onto the super speedway a couple of laps ago. He has got away with it just, so he's clearly pushing very hard at the wheel of the number eight Tower uh, Motorsports Orica in LMP2, leading the way by just half a second from Rinus VK, IndyCar star, the young Dutchman, who has been supported by, taken on the journey to IndyCar by Fritz van Ehr, the owner of the Jumbo Supermarket chain and racing team Netherlands. And, uh, as we mentioned on air last night, Fritz done so much for young Dutch drivers and for Dutch motorsport in general. And 
there continues to be a, a huge conveyor belt of fast drivers coming out of that wonderful country. Yeah, it reminds me of the sort of European version of New Zealand because yeah. they, in terms of their per head of population, they seem to massively punch above their weight, both of those country, uh, in terms of turning out international top quality international sports men and women now a uh, uh, message coming up on the timing screen incident involving cars five that's JDC. Tristan Bautier, yeah third overall and the 47 right. uh, uh, now the 47 is uh, in a GT that's the, oh that's the Chetelar racing Ferrari now that poor little blue Ferrari has been in a lot of rough and tumble throughout this race. Now, what was that? I didn't see that uh, one. No, I didn't see anything. But it's been a bit of a. It has been a bit of a magnet to uh, issues that car. Uh, yes, it, it has. Oh, I think that actually the Ferrari gets squeezed into the wall actually on the run out towards the super speedway, but will uh, look like maybe Vote did maybe just squeeze the Ferrari in, and uh, Giorgio Serangiotto had to, to back out of it. Um, so we'll see what race control think of that one. They've been just doing a super job. Uh, we've been obviously gone off for a, a bit of a, a kip, John, but uh, I see the same faces that we left when we left the box last oh, yeah. night. It's yeah. the same faces in race control. Looks um, like it looks they've like, not had a nap. Looks like the incident that's been reviewed was at turn six heading up onto the high banks just a warning just a warning it, it does still count as a penalty and it comes up on the timing screen as such so we've seen a couple of those it's a bit of a yellow card that for tristan fortier in third position top three separated by 5.6 seconds now with that burst of speed in the low 34s just having gone away from tom blonkfist and ricky taylor and they've settled into uh, a more reasonable 34-9 last time around for Tom, 35-6 for Ricky Taylor, and all of a sudden the gap's out to four seconds. Yeah, there's uh, Tom Blomquist. I mean, this has been an extraordinary Rolex 24 debut uh, for Tom, uh, really showing his class. And uh, Elio Castroneves is still with helmet on, hands device ready. About three pit jackets, he'll have to take them off at some point before he hops on board the Shank Racing Acura. Could it be two in a row for Elio Castro Neves? Um, he's, ah, no. Just he's on the move. See, he's, he's getting ready. Elio Castro Neves leaping up from the pit perch. 17 laps since the next, since the last oh, stop. It's so, any minute now. So about five or six laps now. So he's been sitting there suited and booted for quite some time so he'll be doing a few stretching exercises getting the blood going into the lower extremities stretching the hamstrings and getting the knees working doing a few bends and stretches and uh, we're hearing from Shea down in pit lane that mike conway is preparing to get on board the number 31 wheel and engineering cadillac uh, so, uh, oh, Conway versus Castro Neves, that's a, that's a fight I'd buy a ticket to. A Westbrook, Richard Westbrook, Renger, Van der Zander, all ready to go in, get the popcorn, well, at this time of the day, get the bacon sandwiches. Bacon and sausage sandwich, with a bit of omelette and egg on Cappuccino. there as well. Full, full breakfast bun, that's what you need. And a bit of coffee, maybe. Get back to... Uh, steaming hot chocolate actually which has uh, set me in a very good mood this sunday morning i thought you were chirpier than normal even careful. chirpier than normal careful <laughs> oh, that did, is, does that count as a save i'm not sure you were on the lock stops for a while there okay <laughs> better than the other morning anyway uh, uh, it's uh, 12 <laughs> minutes past seven officially sun up is two minutes away but to all intents and purposes the long, dark night of the 2022 60th Rolex 24 Daytona is over. Now, what will we see in this next hour or so? Because at Le Mans, quite often at this time of the day, a new driver jumps in. Richard Westbrook is ready to do his job. But quite often we see incidents here 
and a problem for the number 66 out on the circuit. Has that car got there? Oh, it's the gradient accurate. Yes, they've been running really well. Oh, Kevin Simpson, the Barbadian. Flat tyre oh. reported for the car that was in seventh place. It's just dropped off the lead lap in GT Daytona. Six and a half hours to get back on. That car limping back to the pit lane. It's continuing slowly. Kevin Simpson sporting his uh, Amologato watch that he won for the Formula Regional in this part of the world. Very nice sort of linen faced we watch both, for him. We both clocked it straight away, oh, didn't straight we? Away. Straight away. Yeah. <laughs> Now, uh, GTD Pro has progressed, well, I say more than progressed, Daniel Serra is surging at the wheel of that 62 Rizzi Competizione Ferrari. I'm sure Giuseppe Rizzi will be sitting with a quiet grin, I think, at the moment. His car is running very, very well and is off in hot pursuit of Lawrence Vantor. Serra's had to do a lot of work to get through that GTD Pro field after coming out uh, at the, uh, well, at the back of the bunch um, and has had to get past Hawksworth has had to get past Nasser and has had to get past the ah. Inception McLaren of Jordan Pepper as well um, and is now in, in hot pursuit of Lawrence Vantor. Seven and a half seconds is the gap. Now, news on the 66, gradient accurate. Shea Adam, that car has not come in. Kevin did not come in to see you. No, Kevin decided not to come down the pit lane but rather continue through the triangle at full speed. Did you see the tyre now? Because that car was not acting as if any of its missions. He had a couple of uh, slow sectors and race control reporting that from observers on the track. Flat tyre car continuing slowly was what we saw about uh, a couple of minutes ago, exactly a couple of minutes ago uh, on the race control feed. So that's an odd one. I wonder if that was what was reported by Giffen and they picked up on that. These tyres, these cars run tyre pressure monitor systems. Really important here, actually, with the high speeds on the banking. The devastating effects of a puncture of any description here really doesn't bear thinking about. At IMSA Radio, if you want to get in touch with us, Another half an hour gone, here's how it stands. We'll start off in that GT Daytona category. Zachary Robichon for right motorsports leads by two and a half seconds from Jordan Pepper charging as Peter Mackay mentioned a moment or two ago for Inception McLaren. Really good run for the McLaren here. In amongst all of the big guns as far as the German and Italian manufacturers are concerned, exactly what McLaren wanted with this GT3 car. Third place for Phil Ellis for Winwood Racing. They've been there or thereabouts all race, haven't they? Let's be honest with the 57 Mercedes. Then here, of course, a Tony Vlander in fourth position. It's just another second further back. Now that's the. Oh, this is a replay of the accident the that yes. uh, happened earlier on for the warning for Tristan Fortier. So he's got to keep his nose clean now. Again, a dive down the inside of a GT car. He was way over the curb, Fortier and did his best not to have impact but remember we had a very nasty looking three car incident uh, there early on and you just can't be making those kind of moves pit, pit work going on in the zero one uh, cadillac performance academy machine scott dixon out of that machine renger van de zander on board now as well let the uh, winner the uh, setter of the fastest lap the last two years and of course winner in 2020 in a Cadillac for Wintiller Racing. Let's continue with our rundown. Lawrence Fanta leads the GTD Pro category number two KCMG by seven seconds. Win the 20th overall there from Daniel Serra for Reese, who's one second ahead of Philippe Naza for Faf and Jack Hawksworth is in fourth for the 14 Vasa Sullivan car just two tenths further back and then five and a half seconds further back is Austin Sindrick those top five in GTD Pro have got a big gap on uh, everybody else in the category but they are running line astern and they are at the moment having a cracking battle this takes me back I heard you said GT Le Mans-esque takes me back to a memorable race 
at what is now WeatherTech Raceway, Laguna Seca, where for most of the race, we had four or five GT Le Mans cars looking like they were tied together with bungee cords. It was an extraordinary, David Brabham was in there, there were some really big drivers back in the ELMS days. It was the de facto World Championship. There was no FIA, WEC in those days, and there didn't need to be, because Don Pernos' ELMS was it, quite yeah. frankly. And I, I don't think we took a breath for the whole of that two hours and 45 minute race as there used to be in those days. If you haven't seen it, look on the uh, IMSA YouTube, official YouTube challenge channels. There are some fantastic videos from American television, the coverage that they ran back in the day. Finally, Elio Castroneves has been able to remove his two or three pit jackets and he is climbing off the pit perch and I'm sure we're gonna see the number 60, Meyer Shank Akia coming into pit lane as the sun breaks over Daytona Beach. Oh, you could hear the angels singing, wonderful. <laughs> Elio couldn't have got in earlier on because uh, he was, he actually started to uh, peel the clothing off about 45 minutes ago. It's just taken him to now to get down to just the race scenes <laughs> and everything else, I reckon. Brilliant. Be beautiful Brilliant. sunrise over the top of Daytona Beach. There's just a, a little marine layer of cloud out there. The sun climbs above it now. And Shea Adam has the... Connie Abinolta Acura with her in the pit lane, Shea. Ricky Taylor is the only driver I have seen so far for any of these cars refusing to get out. Right behind him, the 31 Whalen Engineering Cadillac is in. That will be Tristan Nunez extracting himself and Mike Conway plugging in. Ricky just doesn't want to give up the opportunity to battle against drivers like his former teammates, Elio Castroneves, and from way back when, his teammate Richard Westbrook, who will be getting into the five JDC Miller Motorsport Cadillac. worth of fuel and again a very close call for the Wayne Taylor racing run uh, actor for Konica Benolta it was a very close call for the LMP2 leader that came in uh, that tower was the leader right John or did I I made that up no tower was not the leader no tower no no, no. yes no, you're abso correct absolutely ah. was the leader uh, quite correct 30 Habsburg from PR1 and a Drevin Devin Delvlin Devlin Di Francesco. We're doing our uh, in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre beautiful view here from uh, basically on the, the pits at the start. Don't look at uh, the sun. At the start finish, uh, basically at the start finish line. But we're now doing our best Pikes Peak. We're doing our best uh, Pikes Peak Ari Vatanen impression right now to try and block it out because it's incredibly bright coming over the skyline. Do the old fighter pilot trick instead of putting the full hand there, you just put a finger over it so you still see everything around it. You know? <laughs> but then you've got the parallax effect and does that work with both eyes? Mm, not sure about that. At IMSA Radio, if you want to get in touch with us, coming back to this race, 107.9 FM around the circuit if you just uh, coming back in. Or if you feel the need to nip back to the car for a little warming brew of something, tuning it in round the track once again great work by mike and the team here and he is uh, mike trim and the guys have always looked after us so well lads and lasses working very hard on shift to get us on the pier it's quite eerie actually walking down to the bmw that uh, is uh, operating as a slumber box <laughs> for the uh, for the overnight hours and hearing Bruce and Johnny's voices echoing around this big Daytona building which was uh, pretty quiet at two o'clock in the morning one or two people finding couches to just grab a few Z's on uh, staff going about their work keeping everything spick and span of course and then in the under undercroft parking here the sound of the cars from the track just a few metres away at the start finish and Bruce and Johnny rattling over the PA in there as well. Now into the pit lane, this is Tom Blomqvist heading to Shea Adam and the team are ready. They look like a team of sprinters.
sprint is ready to go for the 4x100 meters record. <laughs> no sleepy eyes over there in Myers Racing. Not at the moment they have had the blankets on. I mean, you saw Elio with his 47,000 jackets. And now it is time for him to drive a race car. So we'll look at Warren in a very different sense here soon. Tom Blomquist already out of the car. Fueling is the last thing going on for new Michelin tires. And it is going to be slippery out there for Elio Castroneves. Just waiting on the fuel driver's side door is closed, engine is revved, and away goes Elio. Brilliant stuff, thanks, Shay. Elio Carstenevis was hopping about like he was about to step in the ring for a heavyweight boxing match. Well, he's maybe more of a flyweight as Elio Carstenevis, but he's certainly heavyweight behind the wheel, and that is effectively what he's going into here in this battle with the number 10, Wayne Taylor Racing, Acura. Peter, Peter, Go on. there's no, no Queensbury rules here. This is a bare knuckle fight. Oh, this, yes. this is straight fighting. <laughs> uh, that might not be a straight course, uh, and we're into Sunday morning, but... Uh, there's going to be no behaviour like choir boys now for those who are at the sharp end of the field. Almost puts the right-hand side Michelins into the dirt. The sun will be an issue for this next portion of the race. It's just climbed above the cloud layer out towards the coast. And that big yellow ball of fun will start to warm things up. The track temperature by lunchtime is going to be really, really, there's not a cloud in the sky where we are. Yes, over the sea where the uh, the temperature inversion and there's a little bit of a, a weather front looks to me maybe a couple or three miles offshore from here. Jordan Pepper is the man on the move at the moment in that number 70 inception racing McLaren. He's in second place at the moment in GTD, hunting down Zachary Robichon at the moment. The gap is now only half a second. And Jordan Pepper drove it driving very, very well in this early sunshine stage. And uh, I think she had him as Tristan. Yes, yeah. Tristan, what's it like to get the Whale and Engineering Cadillac after driving it through the sunrise and then sit on the pit box and get advice from Gary Nelson. Yeah, it was, uh, it's been a very colorful uh, first race with uh, the Whale and Cadillac. So, uh, you know, just taking it all in, trying to keep my nose clean. Uh, you know, competition is fierce out there, but uh, that's why we love the racing in uh, the IMSA Weather Tech Sports Car Championship. We've got Kyle Tilly off at turn five right now for ERA. That's the 18 uh, LMP2 car. You had a lot of time in LMP2 last year. Are you glad that you're in the top class this year? Yeah, it's nice to be back, I'll tell you that. Nice to be back in the uh, championship winning car. So, I mean, Pippo and Mike are doing an amazing job out there. Uh, we still got a lot of time to go, and uh, we'll see where we end up at the end. Are they gonna put you in for the end, Tristan? I think I'm going to do one more, um, and then we'll let uh, the veterans of this car take over the rest. But uh, definitely not a bad first day in the office. Good luck the rest of the way. Yeah, thank you. The local yellow that was uh, covering Kyle Tilly in the Aero Motorsport number 18 has been withdrawn because he has managed to limp away, or the car is limping away from that incident. I didn't see the start of it, but I just caught the yellow lights. Our position here in the Haggerty Global Broadcast booth is phenomenal, particularly looking down towards that west end because all of the signal lights are pointing towards us. And I, 